Let's set the background first. I grew up in a very rural area. My parents have a pretty big piece of land with a nice two-story farmhouse in the middle of it. To the south of the house is a peach orchard. The west is where the driveway is. It goes through an alley of cottonwood and pecan trees, but the land is pretty open and was used for cattle farming. The east and north is dense woodland and shrubs, which reaches all the way to our neighbors about two miles. Back then, I was working at a carpenter shop in town. I had just gotten my driver's license, and so I was able to get there on my own. It was about an hour and a half drive though. We started fairly late in the day at about 10 a.m. The owner of the company was sort of a night owl and loved to sleep in, but because of that, we had to stay until 9 p.m. That was no problem in the summer, but turned out to be a bit of a nuisance in the winter, as it got dark pretty early, and I hated driving in the dark because the lights on my car weren't the best anymore. I drove a 1987 Chevy pickup, which had obviously seen better days. I hadn't had much money back then, so this was all I could afford. So one day in late December, about 10 or 11 years ago, I left work much later than usual. I had made a pretty stupid mistake on a nightstand I was building for a customer and needed to fix it, as the customer was going to pick it up the next day. When I finally finished, it was about midnight. I cussed out my own stupidity closed the shop up tight and went to my car. There are two routes I can take to get home. One is on a highway, the other one is through the back country, and dirt roads surrounded by thick brush and trees. I usually took the highway, as it was much faster and safer, especially in the dark. But this day, there had been an accident, and the highway was blocked by emergency services. So I took the long way home. As soon as I left the main road and made my way up the dirt trails, I got this feeling, you know the one, as if something bad is about to happen, almost like impending doom. The longer I drove on the road, the stronger the feeling got, until it felt like all of my body and soul were aching desperately to turn around, drive back all the way to the roadblock and wait until it got opened again. I tried to suppress it as best I could and tried to convince myself that I had driven this route many times and I knew that it was safe, albeit a bit rough on the truck. When I was driving through an especially rugged piece of brush only about 10 miles from my parents' farm, all of a sudden, my left front tire popped. I did my best to keep the truck on the road and made it to a safe spot. I kept a spare tire in the toolbox and had changed tires quite a lot on my own and I knew it would be just a minor inconvenience and I would be rolling again in a matter of minutes. That's where I was wrong. I climbed up on the truck's bed only to find that my toolbox had been broken into and all of my tools and my spare tire had been stolen. So there I was, still miles away from the nearest settlement, in bear and wolf country, in the middle of the night with no cell phone, and no way to repair my truck. I always kept a sort of survival kit in my toolbox with a blanket, a small axe, a fire starter kit, and some MREs but it had been stolen too. Thank God I still had my trusty pucko, which my sister gave me when she moved to Finland. So I made the second but bigger mistake on the day. I decided to walk home. To this day, I still don't know why I made this decision. All I had to do was wait in my truck until sunrise and I knew a neighbor was driving this road every day at around 8 a.m. He could have taken me to town and called my parents to get the trunk, but some stupid fart in my brain said, nah, we're walking. 
so I went. I locked the car, took my rucksack with my belongings with me, and began walking. I couldn't have walked far when I got this eerie feeling, like something or somebody is watching me. I turned around, but nothing was there. I picked up my pace to make it out, when all of a sudden I heard some rustling in the bushes to my left. I called out, if there's someone there, but of course received no answer. The feeling of being watched got stronger and stronger, as the rustling became more frequent, when suddenly the brush stopped, and I came to a small clearing. That's when he spoke to me for the first time. Hey there, boy. He had a pretty weird pronunciation. The first part was spoken softly, almost gently, but the boy was like an explosion in my ears. He made a tiny pause in between, and then spewed out boy. He was big, six foot six, wearing a long trench coat and hat. Grey, short hair with lifeless eyes, almost like that of a perished fish. But what really scared me was his dog. He had a huge, black, shepherd-like dog, but it looked very wild, almost like a wolf. I immediately froze with fear. I always heard this term, but could never imagine it being like this. I couldn't move. I just couldn't. I tried, trust me, God, did I try. What you doing there, boy? He asked. Don't you want to talk to me, boy? I still couldn't move a finger, but my mouth slowly started to work again. I told him about the truck and how I was trying to walk home, but I don't think he was able to understand a word that I was saying as I was stuttering and slurring the words due to fear. He made few steps towards me. His dog fixated on me like prey. He came so close that I could smell him. A very odd smell. A bit like old cigarettes, but there was something else that I couldn't point out. I still stood there unable to move. He took a deep breath and closed his eyes almost like he wanted to remember the smell of fear radiating from me. He started to grin, not a genuine honest grin, but the one where the eyes aren't involved. They stayed as lifeless as they were. Be careful out here, boy. There's a lot of dangerous things out here, boy. He said and vanished into the brush as suddenly as he had appeared. I started to thaw up and was able to move my body again. All of a sudden, my knees felt weak and wouldn't bear the weight of my body anymore. I collapsed to the ground and my whole body began to shake uncontrollably and I began to sob with relief. As soon as I had regained control over my body again, I ran like I never did before and never have again. All the way home, which was quite a long way. I can't describe the feeling of relief coming over me when I saw the also familiar porch lights coming up in the distance, and I reached the edge of the woodlands on our property. Hey there, boy. My heart skipped a beat. I screamed from sheer terror and knew that this would be the end. So, I didn't stop running. I ran and ran and ran and never even bothered to look back. Only when I reached the warm yellow circles of light cast by our porch lamps did I dare look back. He stood there on the edge of the woods like he did on the clearing, his animal on a leash next to him. He grinned this creepy grin again. I fumbled out my keys as my parents locked the back door at eight. I unlocked the door and stumbled in. Only when I had locked the door, I started to feel remotely safe again. I went upstairs to my room and made sure that all the windows were locked on my way out. When I looked out the window, he was gone. 
I told my dad about this when we got into the truck the next day. He said this was likely Samuel, an old hermit who had a small cottage down there in the woods, who had been living there for at least 30 years, but that he had never seen him with his own eyes. So in retrospect, perhaps I was never in grave danger. Maybe. But nevertheless, to the strange creep in the woods, I'd rather not meet you again. I was born and raised in Charlotte, and still live on the east side. There was a local public park near my parents' house, called McAlpine Creek, which is mainly a large cross-country trail stretching miles across East Charlotte. The park is enveloped by hundreds of acres of dense forest and underdeveloped land that is discreetly amidst busy streets and highways. You almost don't realise how big the forest stretches because of the infrastructure around it. There is a myth, folklore tales about a devil church or Satan church deep within the park. There are a few videos on YouTube and other forum posts around the web of local attempts to approach it. A simple Google search and you'll surely find it. In my senior year of high school, scourging the internet about the supposed church, I had somehow found a somewhat vague description of the location from someone who had attempted to go down the roads deep within the park to find it. My girlfriend at the time and I, one Friday night, decided to try and find the road that leads to the church. We drove down the winding roads behind a carmax that borders the dense woods of the park where there is a small neighborhood of sorts. Cautiously driving down these quiet and dark roads, we had found a seemingly abandoned dirt track offshooting from the paved road. Keep in mind, there are almost no streetlights anywhere. While driving for about two to three minutes, there had been a pickup truck in front of us, maybe 50 feet or so away. On seeing the dirt track, our interests peaked. We stopped the car to discuss what we wanted to do. We began to slowly pull onto the dirt track. Simultaneously, the pickup truck ahead of us abruptly stopped and sat in place. We noticed this, having fully pulled into the dirt road at this point and immediately stopped and stood still frozen in panic. The driver of the truck quickly put his or her car in reverse and we could see the rear reverse lights on and began to immediately back up towards us. I threw my car in reverse in panic and attempted to turn back the way we had come. I was able to get turned around and back into the driveway fairly quickly. In reverse, the driver of the truck was accelerating very fast towards us and I floored the gas of my Nissan Altima and the truck driver followed us for a few seconds and then stopped. We never looked back. We never found the supposed church, but this happening scared the hell out of us, and I've never considered attempting to return. This story took place over the summer. My friend Jonathan had the house all to himself for the week, and he invites me to spend the weekend with him. Since we were both 15, having the house to ourselves was great. I arrived at his house on Friday night. Jonathan's two younger brothers, Saeed and Ivan, were also there, but we didn't really mind as they stayed out of our way. Around 9.30, Saeed and Ivan wanted to play hide and seek in the dark outside. Jonathan's house is located at the far end of his neighborhood, and behind his house are the woods. We agreed, grabbed flashlights, and headed to the woods. Saeed and I continued first while Jonathan and Ivan ran into the woods and hid. After about a minute, we went looking for them. For around five minutes, both of us walked around and shone our flashlights all over the place hoping to find them. We soon reached a small trail that led away from our path, which was odd because I couldn't recall ever seeing it before. We followed it and a minute later appeared on a small clearing and in front of us, maybe 30 yards away, was an odd-looking shack. It appeared abandoned, was rather small, and the wood was old and charred. The steps leading to the front door were well run down, 
and the windows had shattered glass. Both of us looked unsure as we stared at the shack. Something wasn't right. None of us had ever gone this deep into the woods, let alone at night. But we also thought that this was where Jonathan and Ivan had hidden. We both walked slowly to the shack. I hopped onto the porch and made a loud creaking noise. I heard movement coming from inside. Saeed stayed back and I nodded to him, indicating they must be inside. I went over to one of the broken windows, careful to avoid the glass. I peeked inside the shack, shining my light inside, and screamed in horror when I saw a figure hunched in the far corner. His eyes darted to where I was as the light shone on him. He had a scruffy beard, wide-eyed and wore a heavy brown coat. But what terrified me the most was when his mouth curled into a sinister smile the moment he saw me. I got off the porch and Saeed began to ask what was wrong, but I yelled at him to run. We ran and reached the end of the path and ran back in the direction of Jonathan's house. I saw two pairs of lights in front of us, and seconds later we saw Jonathan and Ivan. I frantically explained to them about the shack and what I saw. Both didn't believe me, but before I could explain any more, we heard branches being crushed behind us and heavy footsteps getting closer. We all sprinted away and immediately reached the house. Jonathan quickly unlocked the door and we all bolted in. We stayed silent for a moment before explaining what I had seen. We were all still a bit scared and felt uneasy, especially considering that the footsteps we heard were most likely that same man from the shack. We turned on a movie to try to calm ourselves down and forget what had happened. At 20 past midnight, the movie was ending. We saw one of the lights from the back porch turn on. We had a clear view of the back porch from where we were all sitting. The lights were the ones that turn on when movement is detected. Jonathan and I got up and slowly went towards the back porch screen door to see. We pulled the curtains and gasped when we saw a large figure hopping the fence. I was worried and scared as I thought it was the same man from the shack. We debated on what to do. But I decided that if it was indeed the same man, we had to call the cops, as he now knew where we lived. Two officers arrived at Jonathan's house, and we explained to them the whole situation about the shack and the man being in the backyard. A separate cop was called, and two of them went to search the woods while one cop stayed with us. After half hour, the two officers returned and told us they found the shack but no man. However, they did find meth, a sleeping bag, a candle, and a hunting knife. The cops said the man was probably some homeless meth addict who had used the shack as a place to stay. To this day, I still wonder what the man was doing when he entered the backyard, and what he would have done if we had all gone to sleep and didn't notice the porch light turn on. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by, and we were like two peas in a pod. We both were adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just being outside. She was born in Alaska, and her dad had lived there for quite a while. So they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. It was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing and did a lot of camping. This happened during the mid to late 90s, and we were about 11 years old. One camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow, and feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. We played in the meadow and stream all day while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't very big, and because it had a meadow wall around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me weird vibes. I can't explain it. I just felt really uneasy. The day faded away, 
into early evening, and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad packed up his fishing gear, and we all walked back to the truck on this long winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up this steep road that was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced that my friend's dad was going to break his truck. He had a four, maybe six cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even sure if the truck had four wheel drive being an Alaskan outdoorsman. With years of experience, I trusted him. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road we drove up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up. Then my friend and I decided to go explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in that direction, but did not see anything. Thinking it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we were walking, we heard it again and whispered to one another about what it could be, but carried on going. It stopped briefly. And when we were about 200 yards from our camp, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep wooded hill overlooking the dirt road from where we had come from. Suddenly, we heard another cracking branch from behind. Whatever it was seemed to be following us. Our imaginations were going wild. We came up with everything from serial killers stalking us in the woods to deer, to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that my dad had gotten out his pistol and would be sleeping with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent and he was in his own tent not too far from us. So we figured that everything will be okay. I awoke sometime in the middle of the night to hearing something or someone walking outside. As I laid still listening, I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs because it had a very distinctive rhythm in how it walked. Whatever it was sounded big as I could hear its weight as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet but deep, heavy breathing at times as I lay there listening. I could hear it wandering to the other parts of the campsite and then back to our tent, almost as if it were walking in a big repetitive loop. This went on for a long time. Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I lay there listening until eventually I fell back asleep. The next morning I told my friend and her dad about it, but I didn't know if they believed me or not. Interestingly, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. The ground was not very soft and in some places was covered in grass, so there were no footprints either. This is something that I have never been able to explain. And to this day, it lingers in the back of my mind when camping. I always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. I'd like to share some background information about myself. I was raised by my mother, who is 50% Cherokee and 50% French. Us kids have never met our biological grandpa and believes in paranormal things, but tries to pretend they aren't there. My father is Scottish, English, German, and Jewish by blood. He, on the other hand, is 100% atheist and is rather skeptical about things he can't explain and endeavors to be a logical and scientific person in all things. 
Due to major differences in personalities, beliefs and values, they divorced when I was eight. She soon married my stepfather, who was a devout Southern Baptist from Mississippi and basically gave up her identity as a native and became a God-fearing woman. Despite issues with my mother, my dad continued to let us visit with her mum and stepdad because he felt they were good people. They taught us many things about native culture, spirituality, legends and the people. My grandmother and I spent a lot of time together, so I was given an opportunity to learn Shiroki medicine. My grandma comes from a long line of medicine women and men, and is one herself. Now, so many years later, at the ripe old age of 23, I am myself one of them. You now have some insight. About two years ago, my father, brother and I moved into a new home, a little more in the country than our previous homes had been something we all thoroughly enjoyed because we grew up immersed in nature and loved the land. Shortly after moving there about three months in, I decided it was time to expand my family by getting myself a puppy. This would be the first dog that would actually be in my care. I've always had a strong connection to dogs as my guiding spirit is a wolf. And after a while of searching, I came across a beautiful five month old male German Shepherd slash Pitbull mix. I went to meet him and instantly fell in love. He was the greatest, very sweet, kind to the cats and protective of me and became my best friend. Everything you could want in a dog. Now anyone who has owned a puppy or young dog knows that potty training is a task. Even after being with us two months, he still would wake me up every two to four hours to go outside. Hard on the circadian rhythm, but it had to be done. On this occasion in particular, we got a late night visitor we weren't expecting. My dog woke me up in the night, this time around 2.45, and I wasn't ready but dragged myself out of bed, clicked on the leash, opened the back door, and greeted me with a cool breeze. I rolled my eyes and went out into the yard with my pooch. He did his usual dog thing, sniffed around, jumped in the freshly cut grass, completely forgetting what we'd come outside to do in the first place. I whistled at him, recaptured his attention, and he got back to his business. He squatted, and I turned my head to the sky, offering some privacy. The moon was exceptionally large that night, almost full, but not quite. During this observation, I began to realize there was no typical nighttime noise around me. As if this wasn't unusual enough, I had a shiver go down my spine and my arm hairs began to stand on end. That's when I heard my dog let out a low growl as he pinned himself against my legs. When I looked down at his tail, it was tucked and hackles were raised. When I tried to move, he pressed himself against me more. Another shiver came over me, and now I took the opportunity to follow where his eyes were looking. They were looking to what appeared to be a coyote. Not totally uncommon in the area. We'd heard of them on many nights living here. But this was different. It looked different and felt different. The most frightening thing, however, was that it was looking right back at me. I didn't move. I didn't take my eyes off it. That's how I was able to see its features so clearly in the moonlight. Its fur looked thin, even bald in some spots. Its eyes were yellow, not reflective yellow like you see on a dog in the dark, but yellow like the sun, very powerful and almost blinding. Then looking more closely, I noticed its back legs were longer than a normal coyote, longer than any canine creature should be actually starting at the hips and going down. They seemed to look almost bipedal in design. That's when it dawned on me just what I was seeing. I picked up my 60 pound dog, never taking my eyes off the creature. As I did, I said a Shiroki prayer in my head that I had learned from my grandma. As if it were physically upset, it backed up slightly and then I heard a voice that perfectly mimicked my grandma say, why would you do that, Mickers? No one aside from my grandparents ever called me that. It was their special name for me. 
With that, I darted for the door, dog still in my arms. I put him down and locked the door behind me. The noise must have awoken my brother, because when he came into the kitchen all bothered, he asked me what was going on and why the dog was all riled up. I held my finger to my mouth and shut off the light. We then made our way into the living room, shut that light off as well, and like something out of a horror movie, the outline of a tall, humanoid thing shone through the stained glass window on the door, thanks to the bright moonlight. We both froze, and he made a grab for the knob when it started to turn capturing it just in time to lock it. That's when it spoke to him, but this time in my grandpa's voice. Baba, why don't you let grandpa in? They live on the reservation in Cherokee, North Carolina. His face turned ghostly white and he turned to me. That's when I mouthed the word and he paled even more. It began to tap on the glass and we both went into my room and ignored the knocking. The next night around the same time, the tapping grew louder. We sat in the living room, praying to Ulenanuhi, the Cherokee sun goddess, also called the Great Spirit, that it would go away. The tapping turned into knocks which turned into pounding the more we prayed. This must have awoken my father because he came downstairs in a half. We told him about the night prior during the day and he didn't believe us and thought it was just one of my brother's friends being an ass. So when he saw the silhouette in the window, he grew even more angry, made a beeline for the door and we yelled at him not to open it. However, instead of harming him, it seemed to be afraid because it got down on four legs and disappeared down the road. My dad's face paled as he stumbled back a few steps. He locked the door behind him and we all went to bed. The next day, we spoke of the situation. I explained to him the natives call this creature a skinwalker. They aren't very common in Cherokee land. They're more of a Western native legend, but my grandparents still taught us about them. Dad being a skeptic, just summed it up to a weird thing he could explain later. Later that day, I went to our local craft store and bought juniper ash as my grandma instructed and sprinkled it around our house. It never returned, but my dog was never the same after that night. It's as though the entire experience changed him. He went from a loving animal to mean and unpredictable. He started lashing out to anyone who wasn't female. We tried correcting it over the course of a year and a half, but nothing helped. He finally harmed my brother, causing him to bleed and I was forced to find him a new home. Luckily, he is with a couple who are both female and he seems much happier. But even to this day, I guarantee he won't go out at night. I didn't mention the name of the creature many times because it's considered a bad omen in native culture to give these things energy. If anyone is nervous, let me know and I will happily walk you through a prayer ritual my grandma taught me. I hope you enjoyed and pleasant dreams. I live about a five minute walk away from a train station and I work one stop away, about a five minute walk from that train station. It makes economic and environmental sense for me to get the train to and from work rather than drive. So that's what I do. One morning at about 8.30 a.m., I was walking to work out of the station I arrive into, and a man walking in line with me about a meter away started waving at me. I had my AirPods in, so I didn't actually notice he was trying to get my attention for a while, but eventually I took them out, expecting him to tell me my lace was undone or that I had something in my hair. Instead, he simply said hello, and proceeded to try and initiate a conversation. He asked how my morning was going for my name and told me my name was beautiful and then asked if I had a boyfriend. I don't have a boyfriend, but in this instance, I told him I did to try and close the conversation, which didn't work. He proceeded to walk with me 
all the way to my place of work, then carried on walking straight up. This is not uncommon, as I work in a popular business district with lots of offices, so I assumed he just worked further up than me. It was the sort of situation where you tell your friends about the creepy guy on the way to work, but I quickly forgot about it and moved on. A week later, I'm walking back from work to the station, ready to get the train home, and annoyingly, all of the trains are cancelled that evening for some reason. This is an inconvenience, but because I only live a stop away, I can quite easily get a lift home. I call my mum and she agrees to pick me up once she finishes shopping in around an hour. No biggie. Because all the trains have been cancelled, the station is incredibly busy. There are at least a hundred people inside, standing and just sitting around waiting. Luckily, as soon as I walked in, I found a spare seat and sat down, but it was the sort of busy where every seat was taken. I put my AirPods in and just listened to music, wanting to get the ride in an hour. After around five minutes of being sat, the person next to me gets up and another person comes to sit down. I don't even look up from my phone because people are bustling around everywhere. After another two or three minutes, I feel a tap on my shoulder, and lo and behold, it's the guy from last week. He has chosen to sit right next to me. I fake an uneasy smile, and we chat bluntly for about a minute before I put my headphones back in and close him off. The whole time I'm looking down at my phone and he's shamelessly staring right at me, which makes me feel quite uneasy. After around 40 minutes, he taps me again and asks me how I'm getting home. I tell him my lift will be here any minute and stand up to go and wait outside for my mum as she had texted me that she was around the corner. The man stands up and says, oh, okay, good. I guess I'll go get in my taxi then. At this point, I'm like, what? Why is he waiting here all this time for a train then? Oh, you're not waiting around, I say to him. And he straight up turned to me and said, no, I'm getting a cab. I was just waiting to make sure you got home safe with the creepiest smile, as if he expected me to be grateful for it. I note my way out of there ASAP. And luckily my mum had just pulled me up to take me home. I'm telling her the whole story of this absolute weirdo. And as I'm telling her, I get a notification on my phone. I looked down and my blood ran cold. He had just sent me a friend request on Facebook. I had only told him my first name. And even then, my name on Facebook is one letter different to my name I gave him. My place of work isn't listed on my profile, so he couldn't have been able to find me from that. And even so, why would you add my personal Facebook account? I haven't actually seen him since then and I'm so glad that I haven't. I'm hyper aware on my morning commute now and constantly looking out for him. So that's my creepy train stalker story. And I really hope not to meet him again. This happened a few months ago. I was at my friend Will's birthday party. We met at a nice big park and spent the evening swimming and making mojitos. I spent most of the evening talking to a mutual acquaintance of Will and me, Oliver. Early on, we noticed that me and Oliver lived in the same part of town and decided we'd go home together later since it was quite a long way. I'm a small female, so the prospect of not having to ride the subway alone in the middle of the night was calming to say the least. As the evening progressed, Oliver became more and more flirty with me. I brushed it off and didn't engage on that since I have a boyfriend and Oliver knew that. Eventually the party started breaking up and I was still chatting with Oliver as the other party guests were packing up their stuff. That's when I felt his hand on my butt. I told him calmly to stop touching me and he obliged. As I tried to explain to him that touching me was not okay 
he suddenly became aggressive, called me desperate, amongst other things. At first, I got him to calm down and even apologize to him. And then Will approached us and told us his phone was missing. I left Oliver behind to look for it with another party guest, Tony. We separated from the group to search another corner of the park when Oliver appeared behind us and began screaming. He started to push Tony as he accused us of betraying Will and leaving Will behind and that we stole his phone. He turned to me, insulting me in the worst way while only inches from my face. Tony managed to get him away from me and he eventually ran off. I broke down crying since I fully expected him to hit me. Tony managed to get me to calm down and we rejoined the group. When we did, we found Oliver with them, cursing and running berserk. Will's girlfriend, Rachel, was crying. And as I pulled her away, she told me that Oliver struck her in the face. While Oliver ran through the park screaming and swearing at us, we gathered the group and left. As we did, Will, completely drunk at this point, insisting on returning to the park to find his phone. So he, Tony and me, went back in and used Rachel's phone to try and track his. I knew it was idiotic and dangerous, but Will wouldn't listen, and I didn't want to leave my friend alone. I always carry a small blade in my backpack, and this was the first time I took it out with me. I'd never been so scared. We followed Rachel's phone as it led us to the bench, and who did we find? Oliver, slumped over the bench asleep. After checking if he was okay, Will reached into his pocket and pulled out his phone. Oliver had it the whole time and had accused us of stealing it and scared us to death when he was the thief. After waking him up and telling him to go home, we left. I ended up crashing at Will's place. I have no idea what went into him that night. Everything points to a bad trip, but to my knowledge, there were no other drugs other than alcohol involved. I'm so nervous to see Oliver since we live in the same neighborhood, but I'd rather not meet him again. This happened a few months ago. I'm a 24 year old female and probably couldn't defend myself from a 10 year old. I went to the grocery store to pick up some things the other night. When I got to the register, there was a man helping me bag my groceries while the cashier was checking me out. I was buying some dog treats and he asked me what kind of dog I had. I said, a golden doodle. And he said, oh my gosh, me too. I didn't really get enough vibe from him, but he would stare and not break eye contact at all. I chalked it up to him missing social cues and trying to be friendly. After I paid, he started pushing the cart for me out the door. This isn't uncommon as they typically help you take your things to the car. I have social anxiety and feel very awkward and guilty for them having to do that for me. So I always tell them that I'm good and thank you. And every other time they've said, okay, have a good one. When I gave my usual reply to this guy, he said, nope, I got it, very bluntly, and stared at me the entire time. I instantly got a bad vibe from him. It was about eight at night and barely anyone was there. He said, well, my shift's over, so I'm walking to my car now anyway. Weird because he didn't clock out, but maybe he had before he did this last checkout. He was very talkative in the store, asking tons of questions about my dog and telling me about his. But when we got outside, he barely said anything. I started asking questions about his dog because I felt anxious with the silence, but I really regret that. He took it as an interest and immediately said, well, if you give me your number, you can meet him. And just stared yet again. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't give my number to strangers. I don't want to say no because I have a boyfriend because he seemed like he might get angry over that. When we loaded all the groceries in my trunk, I was thinking, thank goodness, I can get out of here now. But no, the cart was between me and him and he was positioned on the driver's side, so in order to get to my door, I would have to go past him. Well, I gotta get home. My dog's waiting for his treats. 
He just stared. I realised I was going to have to go past him if I wanted to leave. So I looked around to see if anyone else was in the parking lot in case something more happened. No one. I started to get extremely nervous. He could push the cart into me or just grab me himself. I've had this traumatic experience before and my problem is that I don't have a fight or flight. I just kind of freeze. Just like that, he starts walking away, pushing the car to where they are returned in the parking lot. I take the chance to get into the car and lock the doors immediately. I wish I left then, but I needed a moment to breathe and I saw in my side mirror him getting into his car. I quickly put the car in drive and drove out. The exit is a stoplight and just my luck it's red. I'm turning left. I see his car right behind mine not 30 seconds later. I panicked, but then I thought, he said he's going home. It's nothing. I only live two minutes from the grocery store. I made the turn and he was hanging back. I didn't put my blinkers on for the next turn. He made it too. The next turn was a stoplight and then the turn for my road. As I get to the light, it's red again. I thought maybe I should drive to a police station just in case. But as soon as that thought came in to my head, the light went green. My boyfriend and I only moved here two months ago, so I didn't think in my head how to get to the station as I'm terrible at using my phone while driving and I'm not even 30 seconds from the last turn onto our street. Our street is a dead end with only four houses on it. It's very long and we were at the end. No one goes down it unless they live there or are lost. I turn and he makes the turn. I literally just directed him to my house. Thankfully, I have Bluetooth and called my boyfriend. I said, a guy from the grocery store is following me. Turn on all the lights, open the gates and let Nike out. Nike is his German Shepherd and he was trained to be a German police dog and then got extra bite training. He can hold someone for up to six hours. So now knowing he was outside, I wasn't nervous. I was nervous that my boyfriend wouldn't have gotten the gate open in time and I would have to either sit in my car or get out fast and put the code in. As I pulled in, I saw the gate was open and my boyfriend was on the front porch with Nike on a leash and has his firearm in the air. I fly through and down the driveway and this guy follows. Does he not see the firearm and guard dog? Well, he did at that moment because my boyfriend let Nike go and he charges the guy's car. He jumped up at the driver's window, frothing at the mouth, showing all his teeth and the hair on the back standing up. He looked terrifying even to me and he was protecting me. I gave Nike his command to come back, hoping this guy got the hint that if he guts out of the car, he's going to perish. And hint he got. He reversed the car so damn fast out the driveway, he nearly hit the gate. I collapsed on the front porch and hugged my boyfriend. Nike got steak for dinner and I reported the man at the grocery store because I remembered his name on his name tag purposefully. They later contacted me that he had been served his termination papers. This takes place 12 years ago. I was 12 years old and my gifts were starting to happen. My uncle and cousin had stopped by to stay for the weekend. It was a Friday. The day was normal, nothing strange about it. My cousin and I just hang out for the day. My cousin and I had to share a room and her bed was against one wall and mine was located at the wall on the other end of the room. Hers was by the door and mine was against a wall at the other end of the room. That night, we both went to sleep as normal. As I was sleeping, I felt someone staring at me, so I woke up. I pulled the covers off me and sat up. Standing at the end of my bed was a little girl around seven or eight years old. Just a reminder, my cousin and I were 12 going on 13. She had blonde hair, blue eyes, and was wearing this bright, heavenly looking dress. She was looking at my cousin at first, who was still sleeping in her bed, snoring. Then she turned to me, smiled. 
It was a huge happy smile, beautiful white teeth with no stains. She reached out her hand, and at this point I stood up and ran out the room yelling for my grandmother. Nana, there's a strange little girl in my room. My Nana gets up and comes with me to the room. She was gone. My cousin was still snoring in her bed, so my Nana said to me, Matthew, you probably had a dream. I then explained, No, Nana, I was wide awake. She even reached out to me. She then said, Don't you think about it anymore, honey. Just go back to sleep and forget it ever happened. So I did. For years I lived, thinking it may have just been a dream. Fast forward five years. I was 17. I was told that the landlord who owned the house had lived there with his daughters. One daughter was a twin, and they had passed away when they were about seven years old in the house. The house is located next to a highway, and one day the twin was playing outside with a ball that bounced into the road. As she went after it, someone had decided to start speeding around the corner, and sadly, hit the twin as she went out to get the ball. I still didn't think much more of my experience as more than a dream until one day. I went to the landlord's house to walk his dog back there, like I had hundreds of times. But this time he let me into his house and look around his antiques, as I have this strange obsession with antiques. I was looking at his family photos when one caught my eye. The picture was of the twins, taken just months before the twin had been killed. It was the little girl I had seen five years prior. Blonde hair, blue eyes, same big smile. At that point, I connected the pieces and have come to terms with my sighting. I saw her. I saw the little girl. She appeared to me and I don't know why. Now, I need to add some minor details here. My cousin and I both have brown hair. I have hazel eyes, she has brown eyes. And one day, Soon after my visitation, I was going after something in the same road, and as I did, I heard a little girl yell my name, and I was the only one home. So I turned around and replied before stepping into the road, and as I did, a speeding car went by, and it would have hit me had I stepped out. The next experience I had was when I was 10. I moved into my grandmother's house. Some family problems were going on, and it was decided that I would go live with them. Nothing out of the ordinary my first year there, but that soon changed. My first experience with something strange happened when I was 11. It was a regular night, nothing out of the ordinary. I was sitting down at the table with my Nana, playing checkers and having a good chat. Suddenly, we heard someone running through the hallway. My Nana did not seem to react at all, so I decided to get up and investigate. She told me to leave it be, but I was a kid and full of curiosity. It was dark, no lights on, and I did not think to turn any on. As I approached the hallway, I heard the footsteps stop. Then they suddenly started to run towards me, not at an extremely quick pace, so fast I couldn't react. Just as they reached me, they stopped, and no one was there. I walked away scared and unsure of what I experienced. As I was walking away, I turned to look back, and that's when I saw a bright light flash, followed by a large orb appearing. It zoomed back into the hallway and vanished. I never told my Nana out of fear of not being believed. My next experience happened a few weeks later. I was playing outside alone, my back started to burn an itch, so I went inside and asked my Nana to look at my back. She suddenly asks me, What did you do to your back? I told her I hadn't done anything. I'd not laid on my back or put my back against anything. It just started burning. My back was covered in scratches, all over, about 13 in total, and they looked like nails had scratched me. The next experiences happened over a period of time. The first one is of multiple experiences that happened on a night like any other. It was just my Nana and I living in the house. It was about nine at night when we suddenly heard people working and talking in the basement. Loud bangs, the sounds of shovels digging up the floor, and the sounds of the floor being hit by something suddenly filled the house. 
I got scared and asked my nana about it, and she told me it was the ghosts working in the basement. I got the courage to look. I turned the light on and opened the door, fully expecting to see someone standing there. There was nothing. No one. The sound stopped completely, and I decided to go down and look. Nothing was touched. Nothing was moved, and no one was down there. As I went to shut the door, I heard someone yell to me, "Let us work in peace." I quickly shut the door and walked away. Then the sound started up again. Fast forward two years later, and in the middle of the day, it started again. Same thing. No one was there. Fast forward four years from there, my nana passed away, and my mum and I moved into the house. I had a friend over. And we were in the living room directly above the basement when suddenly the sound started up again. The floors started to shake, and the loud bangs and talking could be heard throughout the entire house. My mum comes in and asks what the sounds are, and without skipping a beat, I tell her to let the spirits work in peace and to leave them alone. This last one is my final experience. This next story takes place over a period of eight years. Some backstory: the first part of this house was constructed in the 1850s and was a farmhouse. The next part of the house was constructed in the 1980s when the landlord I knew who owned it decided to add it on for his wife who had fallen in love with the house. So because of this, the house had two attics. One required a rung ladder to climb into. And had no floor, just a series of boards about six feet apart from each other, and was mainly used as an insulation attic. The other was your usual attic with stairs that led into two big rooms. Well, the attic with stairs we'll call attic one, and the one without stairs and a floor we will call attic two. Whenever I was told I had to go into attic one, I always had a bad feeling, and dread overtook me every time I went. I found myself struggling to go into the attic because of these feelings. Well, every time I'd go in there, I'd hear someone breathing from whichever room would be opposite from me. Regardless of the day or time, it would always scare me. Goosebumps, cold chills, and the breathing would always happen every time I went into the attic, which made it rather difficult to have to go there from time to time. One day. I was asked by my nana to go up and look for something. She told me exactly where it would be. It was in room two, in a box, up on the furthest corner to the right. So essentially, the deepest you could get into the attic. I said okay, even though fear immediately struck me. I was not a scared child. Fear was not a part of me until I moved into this house. So I opened the attic door, and thought I heard someone take a step. At the top of the attic, like someone had just finished walking up the stairs, so I paused for a moment, took a deep breath, and proceeded to start up the stairs. As I was going up, I could hear whoever walking towards where I would be going, which terrified me. But I proceeded anyway. When I got to the top of the stairs, a shadow quickly went by the doorway I would be walking into. So I looked to my left, and lying on a pile of boxes was an old baseball bat. So I grabbed it, at least to help me relieve my slight fear. As I started creeping towards the doorway, I could hear breathing coming from the room I was in. As I stepped into the room, it stopped. No one and nothing was there, but I knew I had seen and heard someone up there. It's impossible to hide in this attic. Because it had no real corners or any place someone could successfully hide in, so I continued to the corner to grab the item, and after some digging, I found it. So I quickly walked back to the top of the stairs, and as I started down them, I decided to look back towards the room I was in, and saw a shadow standing there. I jumped down the rest of the stairs, shut and locked the door quickly, and gave my nana the item she had asked for. She asked me what happened, and all I could say was nothing. Now I'm going to make the rest of Attic One's experiences quick because all of them were like that. Every single time I would go into that attic over the next few years, I'd hear the heavy breathing, 
watching things move completely by themselves with no possible way for it to happen and occasionally see more shadows moving by themselves. We would occasionally hear someone walking up there but never chose to investigate it because we already knew what it was. Now on to Attic 2. This attic, there are no words to describe this attic. When I asked my Nana about this attic one day, she told me to never open the door. Upon asking why, all she said was, Matthew, there's something evil up there. Something so dark and angry it should never be released. So I said, okay, and never asked about it again, because I could see the terror in her eyes and nothing ever scared her. One morning as I awoke from a heavy sleep and started to get onto my PlayStation 2, I heard someone walking up there. Four extremely heavy footsteps, which would be impossible because there was no floor to walk on, and with the force of these steps, the boards would have not have been able to support it. So I decided to wake my Nana and tell her about it, that they had stopped by the time she awoke. So she went back to sleep. This took place when I was 12. A short time later, I was outside throwing a ball against the side of the house where the window to that attic was located. I threw too high and ended up breaking the window. So my grandfather had to get a new window and go up there to fix it. My Nana was furious because she never wanted that attic door to be opened. This is where the activity in the house started to ramp up. A few years later, I was 14 and started to act rebellious against the ghosts in the house and started to say and do whatever I could to get them going. Like an idiot, I'll admit it, but I did not know any better. My bedroom door was located almost just underneath the doorway to Attic 2 and one night I decided to do my best to get them going. So I said, if you were truly real, you wouldn't be scared to make yourselves known. Big mistake. A moment later, I saw a shadow standing outside my doorway, underneath the attic two door. And then I heard it say in a loud, old and stern voice, no, and it quickly disappeared. Now, listeners, there is still one more part to go in my time in Hell House but I'm gonna leave this one on a lighter note. As I grew up in the house, I would at random times smell the strong scent of either cinnamon or roses. I would always go tell my Nana when it happened and it would never be in the same part of the house. And it was never at a certain time. It was always and completely random. When I asked my Nana about it, she told me that our landlord's ex-wife who passed away in the house loved the smell of cinnamon and roses. She also told me that when I smelt one, that it was either her warning that either something good or bad was gonna happen. When we smelt cinnamon randomly without any sauce, something bad was gonna happen and vice versa. As an example, one day my cousin who I mentioned in the story about the little girl smelt cinnamon at the top of the stairs one day. She went outside to play that day like any other, but after a while she ran into the house screaming. At one point she had fallen and landed on a corn plant stump and part of it had gone up her nose. She was quickly taken to hospital. One time when I was 12, I'd smelt cinnamon strongly in the doll room and later on that night, I had fallen on a trash bag after getting scared by my mum's ex-husband and sliced my foot wide open from something sharp in the bag. Another time after my grandmother had passed, I smelt roses in one of the rooms and later on that day, I got a promotion and raise at work. That isn't all that she would do though. Before the doll room had become such, it was just another living room with a TV and was where my Nana would sit and watch TV and rest. But every so often out of the corner of her eye, she would see a full body silhouette that was pure white quickly dash from the beginning of the room into the hallway. And it scared my Nana so much that she turned that room into the doll room where she stored all her dolls and moved her living room stuff to another part of the house. One day, 
When I was sitting in the doll room looking and studying all the antiques and other collectibles, I too saw this white silhouette dash from the beginning of the room to the hallway. After that, I did everything I could to avoid going into that room again. I hope you enjoyed the stories. Every bit of them is true, and it made my life growing up hard, because I always felt like I was being watched in that house. My house is old. What is currently the kitchen, master bedroom, and dining room was the original portion of the house built in the late 1800s, around the time the community was being established. The house has grown significantly since then, and my parents bought the house in 1991. After a few years, my mother started having very bad night terrors. They eventually escalated to the point where my mother felt she could no longer stay in the home, and we moved in 1999. My parents kept the home as a rent house, and I bought it off them in 2007. I was pretty much constantly rearranging the master bedroom, now my room, and after about a year, my bed ended up in the same position as my parents had theirs during our last years when we all lived here. I started having night terrors, of a man in old-timey clothes sitting on the edge of the bed with a knife. They were so real that I started sleeping with the lights on. The light was the only difference between the dream and reality and helped me pull myself out of it. This went on for a few months until I moved the bed and they abruptly stopped. Later on that year, my night terrors came up in conversation with my mother. The look on her face was both recognition and pity. She described the man perfectly, then asked if my night terrors had developed into being buried alive. I said that they hadn't, and she said, yeah, I guess it took about a year and a half for it to get to that. Then I suddenly realized why my mother was so stressed out in those years, and why she hates to visit my home. After that, I began my best trying to research the area, the home, everything I could get my hands on. It wasn't until this last weekend, when at a music festival, an older gentleman asked me, wasn't there a civil war in that area? And gave me my first real lead. I learned that there was a battle in 1862, approximately three decades before the original portion of the house was built about 60 miles north of here, in fact, and the troops likely passed through here on their way to the Gettysburg of the West. Still researching, though, I have no concrete answers. Definitely do not miss the night terrors. This happened a long time ago, before cell phones were prevalent, and I was a mum in my early 30s who had just driven our kids to the paediatrician. The Macon, Georgia doctor's office, was an hour away from our home, and I was taking the two youngest of my three, then ages one and three, to our scheduled appointment. Because we lived so far away, their office always gave us the last two appointments of the day, and we were grateful. The doctor had just built a new building off a fresh spur of the highway, so the location was quite isolated in every direction, but a very nice facility compared to his old spot by the hospital there. His new building was also pretty far back on the new lot, and my car, a black Jeep we had owned for two years, was one of only four or five cars in the parking lot when we got there. I parked near the front door, removed the kids from their car seats, and for the next hour or so we waited, then saw the doctor, paid, and finally exited back outside. Mine was the only car left in the lot, as I loaded the children in their car seats for our trip home. But as the receptionist locked the front glass doors, my car somehow wouldn't start when I turned the key. There was just an odd clicking noise. Gathering the children once again, I knocked on the door until someone allowed us back in and asked to borrow their phone to call a nearby garage for service. 
I found one in the phone book, and the man said that he would come, but that it might take a little bit. So I told him my location. I left to go back out to the car, rolled down all the windows, and loaded the children back into their seats once more as we waited. As soon as we watched, all the lights were turned out in the building, and again everyone left. Their cars departing one by one from behind the building somewhere, leaving us now completely alone in the parking lot. As it was still light, I spent a lot of that time trying to tend to the children, digging through our car for snacks and a bottle, making sure that they weren't getting too hot. Although the service station attendant said that it was probably going to take quite a while. I was pleasantly surprised when a truck pulled into the empty parking lot, and a man got out of his pickup, smiled, nodded at me, and said that he was going to raise the hood. He was middle-aged and a bit scruffy, but quite frankly, many gas station attendants sometimes looked that way, especially at the end of the day. And I was grateful when he began doing something under the hood almost immediately. I sat down again in the driver's seat with the door open, waiting for him to tell me to try the engine. But he seemed to be taking a long time checking the connections, and I longed for him to just grab the jump starter cables. Yet he never did. Without getting out of the car, I asked him what he thought was wrong, and he said, "Oh, it's just a loose wire, not the battery," and continued whatever he was doing. I couldn't see his face at all from where I was sitting. But his hands were slightly visible through the long horizontal slits between the windshield and the raised hood. More than once, he said it was merely a loose wire, and if I would just come up here real quick, he could show me which one it was, so it would never happen again. I remember kind of smiling and shaking my head, saying that sadly there was no reason to show me anything, as I didn't know anything about cars, and just thanked him, and continued to stay in the driver's seat. Again, just waiting for the inevitable signal to try to start the ignition, that was most surely going to come at any moment. At one point, I remember thinking that he was definitely flirting as he spoke, but I was trying above all else to be polite and kind, as he was indeed helping us. We were hot, tired, and miserable, and truthfully, I was distracted with the two young kids. Oddly enough. He was starting to sound a little more frustrated with me, because I wouldn't come up to look at the engine. I remember thinking that I certainly didn't want to make him mad, when he left us there all alone, with the sun sinking so quickly. And then the strangest thing happened: another truck suddenly pulled into that desolate parking lot, and as it did, the nice guy working underneath my hood suddenly slammed it shut. Ran to his truck, started it, and drove away very quickly without even saying goodbye. I was both confused and a little anxious when he did this, because I didn't know who was now arriving. I even remember feeling a little frightened that he had suddenly left me alone with two little ones defenseless. Why wouldn't he at least stay and speak to whoever was parking next to me now? It certainly seemed. The sullen, gentlemanly thing to do. I looked around, and was very aware once again there were no visible cars on the road, nor homes or businesses nearby, and the sun was continuing to set quickly. As this new, unmarked pickup pulled up next to me, I got out of the car once again. This time, more apprehensive. Upon exiting, though, he immediately introduced himself. And his name and voice seemed to match who I had spoken to on the phone earlier. He then actually called me by name, apologized for being so late, and finally smiled and stared towards the road, pointing and asking who the man was that had just left so suddenly. Relieved and unfazed, I smiled back in surprise and told him, "Well, I don't know. I thought all this time he was you." And we both. Laughed slightly, and then he grabbed the jumper cables, walked in front of my car, raised the hood, and started to work. I immediately sat back in the driver's seat once more, 
suddenly grateful that, with luck, the air conditioner would be blowing full blast shortly, and once again checking the children. While listening for the familiar words, try it, I had my back completely turned towards the children, when he surprised me by suddenly coming to the driver's side door. In the strangest voice he said, Uh, ma'am, is this yours? And when I looked into his hand, he was holding a long, thin, dagger-like looking device that was about a foot and a half in length. It appeared to be very old and covered with reddish dust. Yet, on one end, it had tiny circular small finger holes. It was as if it was a mix of a long thing sword and scissors oddly combined. I remember being amazed, but not frightened and I asked where he had found them. Under the hood, he replied. I said, just matter-of-factly, that I'd never seen them before, but how weird it was that those things had somehow been stuck and undiscovered in my car for all those years, and shook my head in surprise. He continued to stand there and stare at them, unbelievingly, and he looked oddly pale too. Like he couldn't find the right words to speak for a bit and just continued to stare at the unusual object. Honestly, I didn't care about it one bit. All I could think about was getting the car going, letting me pay him the cost and leaving. He didn't say anything else, just quickly set them up on the curb, started his truck and then signaled me to start the Jeep. And when it immediately caught, my three-year-old cheered. Gratefully, I turned on the air conditioning in full blast, rolled up the windows, armed the air vents back towards the back seat, and reached for my purse to pay out. I stood up and took a few steps to meet him so that I could hear the amount I owed. With both of our vehicles running, he came back around to my driver's side, but instead of handing me the bill, irritated me a bit by walking right past me and picking up the weird object once more. Ma'am, he said slowly. I want you to look at these one more time, and held them out for closer inspection. This time I moved a bit closer and actually really looked. In his hands, the item still appeared to be incredibly large, possessing an almost bayonet-looking quality, except for the strangely small two loops on the end. I'd never seen anything like it, and I told him so. As he held it, he spoke quietly and slowly to me, as if trying desperately to make me understand something that was somehow still going over my head. These weren't hidden somewhere in the engine, man. They hadn't been there very long at all, because they were sitting right on top. They must have just been put there. I shook my head and said no, and half smiled as I said, they're obviously very old and rusty. To which he pointed more closely and replied, Yeah, but see how sharp they are? These look like they've just been sharpened. And when I looked down, he was right. The long, skinny, dagger-like shape was unusual, but by far the oddest quality was just how sharp it appeared to be. The edges at the tip were where the rust had been removed and were gleaming silver. As I paid him, his final words to me were, Ma'am, I don't know what was about to happen here, but I'm really glad I pulled up when I did. He quietly thanked me when taking the payment, told me that I probably needed to call the police when I got home, and then asked me where I wanted them. I didn't want to touch it. Didn't want to take it at all, but I released the back window so he could place it inside. We both then left the lot together, him turning one way and me turning the other, towards the small winding highway that would lead me home still an hour away. I did indeed contact the Macon police the moment that we arrived home, and I got the children safely inside. But although they listened politely, they declined when I offered to bring the scissor-like things to them later. The officer I spoke to said that they sounded as if they were specialized surgical shears from my description and measurements over the phone, which I found quite disturbing as you can imagine. 
I remember wondering how he could even know that, why he would even say that. I had tried so carefully not to touch any of the surfaces, hoping they may be able to lift prints or test for blood if they wanted, but the story seemed to bore him a bit, and he didn't seem interested. His attitude insinuated as there was no longer an emergency, it was of no importance now. At the very end of the call, as if to wind things up, he did say it sounded as if I was very lucky, and that I might want to keep the shears for a few days, just in case someone from his office got back with me later. But that was all. I wrapped them carefully in newspaper, placed them in the brick storage unit behind our house, and they remained there for several more years untouched, until we moved away, and I finally, not wanting to bring them across several states, reluctantly threw them in the trash. Around that time though, if you look through old news reports, women were going missing all over Georgia. Some bodies were eventually found, but others remain missing to this very day. I have often wondered what would have happened if the service station attendant hadn't arrived when he did, if my children would still have a mother, if I still would have had my son and daughter, if I would have missed all these years with them. I guess I'll never know, but I learned something very important about myself that day. I've always felt that I was pretty aware of my surroundings, pretty good at reading people, and staying safe. But because I was exhausted, and tired, and hot, and stranded in a different city, my common sense and intelligence simply left me for a bit, and wasn't working at that time. And many of my friends and family still think that our car trouble that day, and my lack of awareness, could have easily cost us our lives. To give the context of where this story is based, I live in a smallish college town near a small to medium sized city. The town itself doesn't have a lot of people and is mostly here to cater to the demand that comes from the college. Because of this, the stores around the college are mostly open 24 seven, so that the college kids will be able to impulse buy whatever they like. The other big sellers around here is gas. Of course, gas can be bought in the city, but being a town that is often gone through in order to get to the city, a lot of places will try to keep the price of gas slightly lower than any of the stations in the city. My story begins when I was working overnights in a gas station slash liquor store when I was doing part time classes in college, but mostly doing classes online. So they wouldn't ruin my availability for a full time job. The store that I worked at had only one person working overnights for a long time. Even though a lot of people, especially girls, would complain of the lack of cameras and the fact that you don't always get the best people going into a liquor store slash gas station in the middle of the night. The owner's hand was forced one night, because I started working there, that a woman who came in to buy milk, went outside to her car, only for a man to come up behind her and shove a gun to her back demanding her money. She complied with him and luckily he let her go. She ran into the store sobbing hysterically. And though police arrived shortly after he was never found. I personally prefer having two people on, even if there wasn't a safety issue. The night seemed to go by so much quicker when there was someone else there. And it was really nice that the person I normally closed with, and I got along with so well. Overall, there were four overnight shift workers. Josh, Nick, Dixie, and myself. Dixie had another job and really was only working there as a favor to one of the managers. So she would only work two nights a week with either Josh or I. Josh and I worked together three nights a week. And Nick worked with Josh and I 
two nights a week. Dixie was really nice and fun to be around, but she didn't really particularly like the job or want to be there. Josh would get annoyed with her a lot for just standing behind the register while he did all the work, but it was only one night a week, so he didn't complain too much. Nick, on the other hand, was a bit different. He worked there five days a week, just like Josh and I, but they never seemed to put him with one person for more than a week. No one seemed to really like him or enjoyed working with him. Nick was a little off from the start. He was one of those people who told you his entire life story as soon as you met him, giving a bunch of really personal details that no one really wants to know or feels comfortable hearing. One thing he always seemed to talk about was the strain on his marriage. Apparently, he had had a really bad drinking and drug problem for a very long time, and the drug part got better when he could switch over to weed. But he couldn't seem to get his drinking under control. He was hard to be around, but you kind of get used to some people in that kind of job being sketchy. I was there for almost three months, when Nick's stories seemed to escalate out of nowhere. He began telling people that when he was younger, he was diagnosed as a psychopath, and he had to take a bunch of pills for it every day so he wouldn't become violent. Not exactly what you want to hear from someone you're alone with in the middle of the night, but okay. We all have our problems, and some people get dealt a bad hand when it comes to mental illness. I myself always struggled to get my anxiety and depression under control, and without medicine, I wouldn't be killing people by any means. I'd probably be hospitalized in danger to self categories. So as creepy as that was, I assured him that a lot of people needed to take medication for some kind of illness. And as long as you stick to it and are honest with medical professionals, there's no reason you can't still do anything anyone else can do. He seemed pleased with this answer and soon after the subject was turned to other things. He was especially cheery and nice to me after that for the next week or so, letting me know daily that he was taking his medicine and felt like things were going well with him. I always answered enthusiastically, but I'm pretty sure everyone, especially Josh, was aware of how much I wish he would stop talking to me about it and would leave me alone. Josh had a wife and a daughter who was two at the time, so he couldn't help but see us younger girls through the eyes of what his daughter might potentially have to deal with when she was our age and seemed to go out of his way to end my conversations with Nick rather quickly, which I was grateful for and didn't really try to pretend that he liked Nick. It wasn't before long Nick started conversations with me going into details about why he was diagnosed, instead of how his medicine was working, which I won't get into here, because a lot of it is very violent. I told him repeatedly that I didn't want to know about that, to which he would act like he misunderstood and changed the subject only for him to circle back to it about an hour later. When I confided to Dixie about it, she told me that she would take care of it and told her friend which was the manager who asked her to come work there. The manager couldn't really do much since I seemed to be the only one that he would talk to about these things and told me to come to her again if he made me feel uncomfortable. It was starting to get increasingly tense for everyone working there. After he was talked to by the manager and soon after two other women who worked with him on the night shift reported comments he made to them to the manager. I was questioned, in which I agreed that all of the statements made by the women were similar to things that had been said to me. Nick was given a final warning and a write-up. The next few times I saw him, he would go on rants about how people there were only reporting him because they didn't like him. I assumed he didn't know that I had been questioned too, and neither Josh or I had any intention of telling him. He got so angry at one point that he practically was in tears, saying how lucky those twats were, that he was on his meds, and what he would do to them 
if he was not. Fortunately, it was about that point that his shift ended, and pretty much as soon as he clocked out, Josh told him that we had a lot of work to get done that night, so we didn't really have time to chat. He nodded and walked out the door without another word. Josh wasn't lying either. The truck had come extremely late that day, so there was still quite a bit of things that needed to be put on the shelf. One thing that the earlier shifts never seemed to do, unless they absolutely had to, was stocking the drink coolers. It is true that they're easier to do at night, but when there were a lot less customers, so it was annoying since we couldn't chat. But we went with it, and I can't remember the time that Josh went into the drink cooler, but it must have been pretty late since we had been there a while. At that point, I was still focused on stocking the shelves and making sure everything looked full if we didn't have it. When the bell chimed signaling someone had come in, I threw out a good evening and I'll be right there, since anyone that comes in that late usually only wanted a pack of cigarettes or to pay for gas in cash. I put down my box and went to the registers, slowing dramatically once I could see them. You guessed it. There was Nick, not looking at me, but leaning next to my register. I'd be lying if I said I had a reason to be afraid. It did turn out he was drunk, but I couldn't detect it right away from the smell of booze that always seemed to linger in the air around there. And Josh was right on the other side of the wall. Even so, I considered for about 30 seconds if I should actually go or if I should run into the cooler and get Josh. Nick wasn't a young, fit guy or anything. Years of drugs and drinking had aged him prematurely and ruined his body, but he was still intimidating to a 20-year-old girl. Unfortunately, Nick made the decision for me when, probably tired of waiting, turned towards me. And that's when I noticed immediately that there was something off about him. My voice was nothing more than a pathetic whisper when I asked him what he wanted. He just stared at me, nothing on his face to tell me what he was thinking. I was about to speak again when he spoke, barely intelligible because of his slurring. He leave you here alone? It took me a second to shake my head and tell him in a hopeful, steady voice that Josh was in the cooler and asked if he wanted me to get him. Again, staring at me in silence. At this point, I didn't even care what he said. I just wanted him to say something. The silent staring was creeping me out. I asked with more force in my voice, what do you want, Nick? As soon as I stopped speaking, he grinned at me in a disgusting, almost singing voice. You're lying. You're alone. He laughed and took a step towards me, but stumbled, allowing me to take several steps back. At this point, I should have run to Josh. I should have called for him. Anything. But I couldn't believe that I was reading the situation right. Nick was really weird but I had never felt an actual danger around him before. He had never come off as more than a little unstable. He continued to come forward in slow stumbling steps, telling me to come here and that he just wanted to talk. I kept out of his reach, telling him to back off and that I could hurt him if I had to. He thought that was particularly amusing and laughed loudly enough that Josh told me later that was what caused him to look through the spaces of the rags and see what was going on. Josh was out the door in a second and seemed to come out of nowhere, shoving himself in between Nick and I. They didn't even say anything, just stared at each other down before Josh said in a stern tone, I think you should leave now. Nick stared blankly for a moment and scoffed, telling us that we couldn't take a joke. I was trying not to cry at this point. The only thing more terrifying about the situation was knowing that if Josh hadn't been there, 
and he somehow had caught me, I would have stood no chance against him. Josh left me standing, with my back against the wall, Corallining Nick to the door. Completely unexpected on both our parts, Nick turned and took a swing at Josh. Luckily, either because Josh was drunk or really uncoordinated, he missed Josh's face, and Josh grabbed the back of his coat and brought him down as he smashed his knee into Nick's stomach and used the opportunity of his spluttering to drag him to the door and throw him out, locking it. Josh had just turned and told me to call the cops as we heard this sickening crack behind him. We both jumped up and looked at the door to find this big circle of glass. It's hard to explain, but if you've ever seen a movie or an actual car wreck, when something hits a windshield, but not hard enough to break through, and it just turns all white around the point of impact. That's what the door looked like. Josh didn't have to tell me what to do. I ran to the register, grabbed my phone, going to the corner furthest away from the front door, and huddled on the floor. I didn't even notice at the time, but Josh told me later that when he turned to see the glass, that was the first time he noticed that Nick had a hunting knife in his other hand. The fact that he had tried to punch Josh instead of stab him is a mystery and a miracle. I was sobbing when the operator picked up the phone. I don't even know how she understood me. I was crying so hard. But between my distress and the sounds of Josh and Nick yelling at each other in the background, with loud smashes of Nick hitting the door, she got the urgency of the situation. She asked me where I was, and luckily she knew the address, because just as I got up to look at the receipt to see what the address was, the glass smashed. I dropped back to the floor and she told me that officers were already on their way and to do whatever I could to get away or hide, even if I had to leave Josh. The hole wasn't big enough for him to get through, and he had made it by grabbing the ashtray from outside and throwing it at the part of the window he had been repeatedly punching, causing it to break through. He didn't make it to break through though. From that hole, he could only reach the lock on the door. According to Josh, he walked to the door and put his mouth against the hole that he had formed and said something that I'm sobbing right now, even thinking about it in that horrible sing-song voice that he used the first time I spoke to him that night. He said in such a happy tone, they're never going to find you two. Needless to say, as tough as he was acting, Josh was crapping bricks as much as I was. He was older than Nick in his mid thirties, but he was a beanpot and wasn't exactly known for his fighting skills. Even so, as soon as Nick unlocked and started to open the door, Josh slammed his body into it, knocking Nick backwards from the impact. Josh yelled for me to run, and even though my legs felt like they would give out at any moment, I ran right behind him to the receiving doors in the back of the store. Nick was cursing and yelling at us as the door jingle went off. Josh slammed into the back door, cursing in pain, as he realized it wouldn't open. We later found out that Nick had pushed the dumpster in front of the door, locking the wheels of it against us before he came in. We seemed to both realize at once that he actually planned this. Nick rounded the corner, still doing that awkward stumbling walk, though faster now. It at least gave me some time to slam the back room door shut and lock it. I was sitting in front of it, Josh bringing over anything he could find to barricade the door shut. When Nick reached it, he must have heard me crying because he kept calling out my name, telling me it wasn't me he wanted. He would make sure that I passed before I even felt the pain if I opened the door. 
He then started stabbing the door, screaming at me to open it. I screamed and moved when he stabbed it the first time, but Josh and I both moved immediately to hold it shut again. I remember Josh and I making eye contact. We were both crying by now, and I wanted so badly to say something to comfort him, but I couldn't think of anything to say. I had dropped my phone when I ran to hold the door shut, and neither of us could move to get to it. So we had no idea how long until the police got there, and the door was made of wood. So it wouldn't last long against his body slams and offered no protection if his knife went into one of our hands. All I could think about was that I was going to pass here, that my dog would never know why I never came home, that I would never get my degree, that I have enough money to actually start life, that all of the plans for my future, my girlfriend and I, would never happen. In the most anticlimactic and wonderful finish ever, it suddenly went silent. There were no police, car alarms, no yelling, nothing. It was as if Nick had just vanished. Josh and I looked at each other, not even daring to breathe, listening for any sign of life on the other side of the door. We both slammed to the ground when a gunshot went off at once, then twice, then a third time. There was more silence. Then a voice rang out, asking if anyone was here. We weren't sure if we should say something. Then the voice continued with his name, and that he was an off-duty EMT who had been listening to the scanner. Josh got up and pushed the things aside in front of the door, opening it just enough to put his head out. And then it seemed like the breath just left him. He opened the door and went out into the store, relief all over him. I ran and grabbed my phone, seeing that the call had disconnected or the dispatcher had hung up. When I went out into the store where Josh and our rescuer was, he was in the middle of explaining how the police over the scanner were sending a bunch of cars, but they were all pretty far away and he had a horrible feeling that they wouldn't get there in time when the dispatcher was telling them what they'd find when they got there. He didn't want either of us to go outside until the police got there, because though Nick had been shot in the shoulder, he still had the knife when he took off. The EMT said he would run after him, but with the state the store was in, he was scared that someone in there could be hurt or dying. The next 20 minutes were a blur, Josh and I were sitting on the floor hugging each other when the police got there. The EMT had called dispatch and told them of the new situation, and most of the cars that were coming to our location were diverted to look for Nick. It was soon after that that Josh got to use his phone to call his wife and she came right over, only bringing their daughter because he begged her to. He seemed to completely break down when he held his daughter and hugged his wife. I had an extremely similar reaction when I finally got home and came in to see my dog's body wiggling excitedly, proudly displaying his flamingo toy for me as a welcome gift. Nick was found two weeks later in an old RV in the woods that he had been using to do his drinking and drugs in so that his wife wouldn't catch him. Apparently the reason that he had come after us was because he thought that the reason that Josh wanted him to leave so quickly was so that he could call the owner again and this time the complaint would get him fired. Unknown to us, his wife had kicked him out four days before this happened and was in the process of getting a restraining order against him over threatening texts and phone calls she had been receiving. He stated that his job was all that he had left and Josh needed to be punished for trying to take that away from him. He said that I wasn't the target, and he didn't want to have to kill me, but he knew that he had a much better chance of ending Josh's life with me there than Dixie there, since Josh would be more likely to face him to protect me. Neither Josh or I called the owner or even a manager over his comments that night, though maybe we should have. In hindsight, 
It was disturbing what he was saying. But we were so used to him being a creep and saying really horrible things at that point that it didn't even register to us that he could seriously be thinking about trying to hurt someone. I had known him for three months, and Josh had known him for six, and he had never done anything violent towards anyone. Everyone just thought he was all talk. We also put faith in the fact that every employee had a background check on them before they were hired, so it's not like Nick had ever been violent before. He took a plea deal so that the two counts of attempted murder would be dropped, and he would go instead to a mental hospital for offenders. The reason that I'm sharing this story now, other than the other stories on this subreddit inspiring me, is that I got a call two weeks ago notifying me that as long as there is no setbacks to his health status, Nick is set to be released on June 8th of this year, Maud's birthday. When I called Josh, he said that he had received the same news that day. Neither Josh or I work there anymore, and Josh has since moved away to another town on the other side of the city, and I have switched to going to college completely online, and I'm now in a new place that I'm renting with a roommate. I don't think he'll come after either of us. I don't see how he could blame us for what happened. I've heard so many of these stories, and after the fact, everyone seems so prepared for what to do if they ever see the person they're writing about again. I don't think I'll be any more prepared to face him this time than I was back then. I've had pretty intense nightmares ever since that day. But, ever since I got that call, every time I close my eyes, all I can hear is that one sentence louder and clearer than I ever have heard it since it was actually said. They're never going to find you two. Nick, if it was true that you were diagnosed as a psychopath, I hope you're getting the help you need. You already destroyed my peace of mind, and even now, years later, I don't feel safe, especially at night. I don't believe in God, but I pray to anyone that's listening that we never meet again. I've always had incidents with paranormal activity, but this one story still baffles me, and everyone involved to this day. Just thinking about it now gives me goosebumps. For a bit of background info, this occurred in Lake City, Florida. My husband and I found the perfect house for our family of five in 2007. It was a huge 2,000 plus square foot mobile home on five acres, four bedrooms with two baths. It was, amazingly, within our budget, only $830 a month and rent to own. So we signed the contract, assuming the low price was due to it being in the middle of nowhere. Our three kids were nine months, three years, and five years old at the time. The older two were ecstatic to finally have a room of their own, but this was short-lived after moving in. From the very beginning, we were all a bit anxious in the house but we kept saying it was due to the large size of the home. We moved from a very small two bedroom apartment and it being located so far out in the middle of nowhere in the country, plus it being a new house, period. It started by us noticing lights on that we knew were supposed to be off, doors being open that were supposed to be closed and vice versa, bumps in the middle of the night with no explanation. The kids all started having night terrors, and after about a week, we discovered the older two kids asleep on the nine-month-old's floor besides her crib. They started doing this every night. My five-year-old daughter had such bad dreams one night, it caused her to vomit. She came in crying and throwing up, saying there was a man on fire floating outside her window. She was truly terrified. Back then I worked night shift, and my husband was the one dealing with the freaky incidents at home at night. 
After several months of various incidents, my husband had to go out of town for two weeks due to his job. They were going to build a house in Steinhatchee, Florida. Since I was working night shifts, the kids were shipped off to the grandparents. This event happens on the first night of my two days off, and my mum said she'd keep the kids for an extra night so I could catch up on some much needed sleep. Now, backing up. The town my husband was working in did not have cell reception for our carrier, and the only place he could get service to call was in the town standing in a very specific location. So he couldn't call from the job site or the house they were staying in, and I rarely got to speak to him while he was gone. He literally had to drive into town, stand next to one of those large ice cream maker machines, which he discovered by accident one morning while getting their cooler ice for the day, that his phone randomly downloaded all his missed texts so he figured he got service while standing there specifically. On my first night alone in this house, I was truly scared after several hours of hearing things. Here I am beyond exhausted from barely getting any sleep the week before, and I can't sleep because of the house noises. I went out to the couch and decided to try and fall asleep with the TV way up loud to drown out the noises. I carried a weapon under my pillow and another one next to me, and felt safe enough to fall asleep. At 3 a.m., a call wakes me up. I looked at the screen and it said, my baby, AKA husband. I answered. He was in a panic. Honey, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Why? He's freaking out, telling me he had a nightmare. He asked if I was asleep on the couch. He asked if I had a weapon under my pillow and another one next to me, saying specifically what they were. He asked what I was wearing, and I said yes to all his questions. He even confirmed the direction my head was. This were all things that he should not have known, considering we hadn't spoken a number of days. He's all but hysterical at one point, saying he had a nightmare where a man broke in and did horrific things to me before ending my life. Any other time I would have called him crazy and told him I was staying put, but there was something about his voice and the desperation that got me out of the house. At this point I decided to leave, especially considering how out of character it was for him. And I heard a bang coming from the opposite end of the house. My blood runs cold. It was almost like a bad omen. Since he's not the type to normally act like this, I panic and make him stay on the phone with me while I grabbed the car keys and my purse. I hit the button on the car to turn on the lights and make a run to the car. I got the hell out of there, not bothering to change clothes or grab anything. Once he verified that I was on the road safe, he said he'd call me tomorrow and check on things. I then called my mum to let her know I'm coming, and I tell her the story of how this all came to be. I drove the 45 minutes to her house, shaking the entire way. After arriving, and some time talking to her, I settle in and fall asleep. I tried calling my husband in the morning, but kept getting voicemail. That's completely normal for the town he's working in. At this point, I must go to the house to grab clothes and a few bits. I made my mum go with me because I was still freaked out by everything and there was no way I was going back there alone. When we get there, I immediately noticed the screen had been cut and the window was broken out. Picture a normal double wide mobile home with a large deck and a window on either side of the door. The window that was broke out was the one right next to the door. I called the police immediately. They cleared the house and walked through with me to see if anything was missing and to add to the report. There wasn't. I wouldn't have known if someone had been in there if it hadn't been for the scream and window being broken. I tried to call my husband, but couldn't get through to him. And after leaving several voicemails, he finally called. 
I told him that his weird nightmare just might have saved my life and explained everything to him. He's completely at a loss and asked me what the hell I was talking about, that he hadn't called me. I froze. Yes, yes you did. He's adamant he didn't. He says he didn't have a nightmare, nor did he call, and we argue for several minutes because I knew he called. How could he? When he said, when he was at home all night, and he only got cell service in one place. That hadn't even crossed my mind at that point. I told him to check his call logs. He didn't have any outgoing calls. My phone, however, showed that I had received a call from my baby at 3 a.m. I sent him a screenshot of my phone, and he has no recollection of ever calling or of the nightmare. I'll never forget the panic in his voice, the desperation for me to leave, the details he couldn't have known. Who called me and saved my life that night? The police didn't find any fingerprints or anything that could lead to an arrest. We ended up moving out very soon after because we didn't feel safe, especially when we were dealing with a haunting at the same time. I spoke to two of our neighbors and they said no one ever leased it for more than six months. Where I'm stuck is who called. Last summer, my boyfriend and I were camping somewhat remotely in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, presidential range. The sites are well off the beaten path, not a campground, no water or electric, and a tents only. Sites are half a mile to a mile apart, very deeply wooded and isolated. Without a vehicle, you'd have an hour or so to walk to the nearest road. In spite of this, it's still a known area and frequented by campers and hikers, but it's still New Hampshire, so it's already very weird. Over the course of the summer, we made four trips to the same area. The last time was the most remote, with no restrooms. We used the woods. While most people take the general trail, as you can tell where others have been, it really ruins my outdoor pooping experience, so I prefer to find my own new path. In doing so, I wandered a fair distance from our tent site through heavy woods, stopping at the edge of a big thicket of skinny pine trees. I could not have felt further away from civilization or people, and crouching down, thought to myself, as much as any of the animals that must be around me and I couldn't see. It wasn't eerie, but rather hypnotic, just me and nature. I felt anything or anyone could be watching me, and I would never know. Right in front of me as I crouched down, I saw something strange. Out of place were two pine trees that had been roughly chopped to about stump size. They're skinny young trees, the types that break easily and can be pushed out of the ground in cold or mushy weather. Each stump was wrapped near the top with gray duct tape and a lot of it. My immediate thought was something was tied up there and then the trees were chopped rather than unwrapping the tape. But why? And what? What could have been held there? This was not the end of the trail. It was really in the middle of nowhere. Someone else would have found it the same way I had. There would not be room for a vehicle or an ORV or dirt bike. This was someone in the woods. What tied something up to these two trees using a lot of tape? Suddenly I felt the density of where I was and that I was within yelling distance of my boyfriend and our tent site, but wasn't alarmed. I could see it wasn't new, but the tape also wasn't faded or worn. I looked around the ground nearby and didn't see anything else with tape or signs that something had possibly been built there. It simply looked like something was tied between two trees with duct tape. And for some reason, the trees cut at the top above the wrapping, leaving two stumps somewhat resembling torches in the ground, not burned, 
that that's the best way to describe the appearance. It's important to note, this would not have been used for hanging food or meat. If a person had been tied there, it would have been in a sitting position, and the tape was low to the ground, not high. I took my boyfriend back there later to show him, and we both agreed we couldn't come up with an explanation other than someone tied up something between those trees. But what I wonder, and more importantly, why? Back in 2008, I was a student planning to go to university and needed some extracurricular stuff I could put on my entry applications. As most UK students know, one of the best to have on there is the Duke of Edinburgh Award. As part of this award, you have to embark on an orienteering expedition, basically a long trek throughout woodlands and rural villages following nothing but a map and compass. No GPS allowed. It's a teamwork experience, and you camp and overcome hurdles together, etc. I was out of shape at the time, so my uncle volunteered to take me out to the middle of nowhere to get some idea of what orienteering was like. We didn't stay out overnight, which is what I would need to do during the real thing, but we hiked 10 miles through woods in a small village in pretty abysmal weather. By the end of the journey, we were soaked to the bone and pretty miserable, looking forward to getting back in the car and heading home. For the last part of the journey, we were on a dirt trail heading uphill with bushes and trees on either side. We were marching onwards in silence at this point, until all of a sudden, there was a rustling in the foliage to our left. From behind a large bush, stepped an old man in a black suit with a red bow tie and dress shoes. He looked to be in his late 70s or perhaps early 80s. Very pale, with liver spots dotting his face and a grey and white comb over to match. I was instantly weirded out. Who dresses like that to go into the woods? The instant thought is that seeing some guy at this age out in the woods in these clothes and in these weather conditions is that this guy has certainly lost his marbles. There was something else that took me an extra moment to notice though that puzzled me. He was bone dry, didn't even have mud on his shoes. We stopped in our tracks and just stared at the man for a moment, who appeared to be as frozen and shocked as seeing us. My uncle made the first move, taking a step towards him, asking if he was all right. The old man continued to stare for a moment, not moving even a twitch, then became suddenly very animated. It was like he suddenly snapped out of a trance. He began flailing his arms wildly, saying something awful had happened and that a good friend of his needed help. He began walking backwards into the woods, motioning for us to follow him, which we did. We started off at a brisk walk and escalated to running as we struggled to keep up with the old man. After a minute, he disappeared ahead of us, but we could hear him and continued following the noise until we reached a huge slope. We stopped at the edge and looked down to see the old man standing at the bottom, motioning us, pleading with us to follow him. I remember looking down at the slope. It was probably a 40 degree angle and spanned for at least 50 feet or more and slick with mud. It looked like an accident waiting to happen especially given there were no shrubs or roots to hold on to or anything. I remember looking down at the old man on the other side of the slope and wondering how the heck did he cross it so quickly and cleanly. I mean, at that distance, it's hard to see any fine detail clearly at all, but I swear he didn't appear wet or muddy at all. Me and my uncle looked at each other and I saw that he was getting as weirded out as I was. Despite my feelings, I made a step towards the edge and was going to try and make my way down when my uncle grabbed me firmly by the arm and pulled me back. Something's wrong here, he said under his breath. We took a few steps back from the edge and at this point, the old man at the bottom started to get irate. 
He began pleading with us to come down the slope, telling us he needed our help. His friend was in trouble. My uncle shouted down at the old man that we would head back to our car and call emergency services. That professional help would be on its way soon, and they would have all the tools that they needed to help. The old man then got furious and began jumping up and down, demanding that we come down the slope right away, or there would be hell to pay. His voice has changed drastically at this point. He was now practically growling his words, his hands bunched up into fists, pounding his knees like an angry toddler throwing a tantrum. I've never seen a grown adult fly into such a rage in my life. His eyes looked like they were on the verge of bursting out their sockets, his skin gone pale to red in almost an instant. We began to hurriedly make our way back the way we came in, his demands and threats getting less audible as we got closer to the trail. Once on the trail, we practically power marched the remaining quarter mile or so to the car. All the while, my uncle was on the phone to the emergency services, explaining to them that there was a possibly mentally ill man wandering the trail. We were ordered to get into our car and await the police so that we could show them where we had encountered him. About an hour later, we met four officers, two of whom had dogs with them, and a pack of supplies like first aid and emergency blankets. We led them to the exact spot, and then pointed the two officers with dogs in the direction he led us through the bushes, and the search lasted a weekend, but there was never any trace of the old man. Officers said the only trail they could pick up had been mine and my uncle's, they didn't find any footprints or anything belonging to the old man we encountered. This has been one of my weirdest experiences to date. We were at our family cabin, deep within the Norwegian woods. There's no running water in the cabin in the winter, as the pipes tend to freeze. We get drinking water from a nearby lake and water we use for washing and cleaning we get from melting and boiling snow. This started one winter as my father went outside to fill a tin can with snow. As he crouched down by the side of the cabin, removed the lid from the can and filled it with snow. As he turned around to put the lid back on, it was gone. No big deal, he thought. It probably slid or blew away, and since it was dark out, he went back inside without the lid. The next day, we went outside and looked, but never found it, and eventually forgot about it. Life went on, and the next winter, when we were at the cabin once again, we still used the same tin can to collect snow, still without a lid. My dad went outside, filled the can, and as he turned around, he heard a weird sound as he took a step. There it was, on top of the new snow at the same place he placed it one year ago. He was pale as a ghost when he came back inside. Any scout that has been to Camp Wanokset has heard the tale of Seiji and Seiji Island. The original tale is about a Native American boy who goes back to his village to skin and properly dispose of the dead animals that the settlers had left and killed. He starts a bonfire in an island, slowly bringing the animals across to burn in his canoe. He gets down to the last three animals, a bear, a deer, and a moose, when the settlers see him and shoot at him. He gets onto the island and jumps into the fire with the animals, Thanks to the fact that he was still alive and holding the animals, their spirits merge together to create what is most commonly referred to as a Wendigo. Every once in a while, he can be seen wandering the woods and streets around the camp. Now on to the story. Being as though it was my third year at Camp Wanok Set, I was very comfortable staying there even at night out in the woods. Both me and my friends, Kyle, Will and Ryan, are sitting at our table under an awning, telling stories and just having a good time. When Kyle 
says to be quiet and listen. It was silent for a bit, until we heard what sounded like someone running in the woods. We all look over to see antlers poking out from behind a tree. At first, we were pretty worried at the fact that a deer would get this close, but then we realized something. The antlers were three feet above where they should be. Right as we started to back away, it sprinted from behind the trees and slashed at our tents, about 10 feet behind us, and broke some other things. After about a minute of it breaking things and us getting on top of our picnic table and grabbing our knives, it ran off. For some reason, only a few other people noticed it. Our scoutmasters came running over to ask if we were okay and what happened, seeing as though we were almost crying and pretty shocked. After that encounter, I will never go back to that camp again. Whenever I think of that camp, I get the eerie feeling that I am being watched. In the late spring of 2014, I made the long and scenic trek from Kansas to Arizona. It was in early May, after packing up an apartment full of way more than enough stuff for two people, we removed ourselves from the flatlands and wheat fields of eastern Kansas to the high desert of Arizona. After everything was packed into the box truck, and the car was secured onto the pull-behind car dolly, I started the 1500 plus mile trip for the first time. I had never been further west than Colorado prior to that particular trip, as I was born and raised between the Midwest and the eastern side of the United States. Little did I know, I would make the drive again a year later, to collect the belongings we left behind at the cabin when we'd abandoned it. I'll never forget driving through Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona. There is just something about that part of the country, that specific region, that just is flat out magical to me. And apparently I'm not the only one who feels this way. If you've never been, I suggest you do if you ever get the chance. The first evening that I arrived in Arizona, the sun had already gone down as I made my way off the main highway about 40 miles from the Grand Canyon, and picked my way through the well-worn dirt roads that led out across the desert and towards the cabin that I would be renting for the next several months. I didn't know much about the cabin before my arrival, other that it was supposed to be entirely self-sufficient, with a 500 gallon water tank and four full-sized solar panels, including areas for gardening, walking trails, RV pads, and that the nearest town was located several miles away. In addition, the world's largest stretch of Ponderosa Pine Forest, 1.8 million acres, was situated just 10 miles from the cabin in the Coconino National Forest. This particular national forest was something I had been very much looking forward to get into explore. It was in this area of the expanse of Bomberosa Pine Forest that I first saw a wild wapiti, Native American for elk. In actuality, there were three of them, each one massive and was standing shoulder to shoulder as if posing for a photo. Likewise, each one had an enormous rack. They were easily four feet tall with more points that I could count. I had never seen a wild elk before, let alone three large and picturesque bulls like this. I wish I had been able to take a picture of that magnificent view. I saw several more while I was in the area over the course of the next few months. However, I never did see any more that was so large, or with such tall wax as those three bull wapitis from the first night. Being somewhat of a mystic, I instantly took it as an extremely excellent sign to see such impressive stags so close to the cabin, as if they were waiting to greet me. Just standing outside of the tree line on the edge of the road, in some strange way, I honestly felt like they wanted to say hello. The cabin itself was everything that I expected and needed at the time. It had a built-in garage, a full loft bedroom, living room, 
working bathroom with solar shower and flush toilet, a kitchen sink, stove, and a lovely workshop located in the garage. In other words, once I gathered up some necessary supplies from the nearest town, I wouldn't need to interact with anyone on a day to day basis for long periods of time. And honestly, that was the plan to begin with. The first week or so was spent exploring the general area, including several trips to Williams and Flagstaff, Williams being the nearest town, as well as hiking around through various areas of the Arizona high desert. There were little in the way of trees, other than the above mentioned Ponderosa pine forest, as well as scatterings of junipers, which where I come from, seem more like large bushes than actual trees. I hiked in the Coconino National Forest a few times, and I enjoyed it very much. However, I didn't get to spend as much time there as I had hoped to. That said, the area directly around the cabin, all 15 acres of the property as well as the hundreds of surrounding acres, were far more interesting than I had anticipated. Once I became familiar with the acreage, I went to work for three solid days building a sanctuary in the middle of the property. During my day hikes around the cabin, I found a perfect outcropping of juniper trees, which appeared to be an old solid clump. But upon further exploration, I discovered one could be entered into this particular grove of trees. Inside there was a much more considerable amount of hidden space than it appeared from the outside. To me, it was perfect. This hidden corpse of junipers was the space that I decided to build my stone altar on. Furthermore, I paved a path of sand and stone from the entrance of the hidden grove up to the altar, and eventually beyond. I inlaid the central space with a full moon and crescent moons, using the red rocks found easily in the nearby desert. Beyond this sacred spot, reserved for the altar, I extended the stone pathway to a full circle that I created for meditation and metaphysical workings. I raked and smoothed the working circle, the center of the circle rather, cleaning it of all debris and broken stone until it was the same consistency of a charred sandbox. Next, I gathered four gigantic stones from the surrounding desert, one stone from all four of the cardinal directions, and I placed the large bulky stones according as capstones to my working circle. Once the circle was complete, I extended the red rock inlay of my sanctuary floor from where it ended slightly beyond the altar, all the way to the working circle in between the circle with the altar and the working circle. I inlaid another full moon with two crescent moons, the sign of the triple goddess into the walkway. Each morning when I would meditate facing the east, sitting in the middle of my circle, as the sun rose over the desert, when I could feel the warmth of the sun begin to warm my inner eye, only then was my morning meditation ritual complete. I repeated these meditations throughout the day by meditating in the correlating directions of the sun at noon, and again directly before sunset as well. In all honesty, I would have to say that I've never been so in tune with myself. That said, I constantly had the feeling of eyes upon me. I cannot tell you how many times I stopped hiking and spun around expecting to see some person, predator, or something darting behind a juniper or cactus. I never did catch a glimpse of whatever it was, but I do have a feeling that I know why. It is a strange thing to try and convey to something else. I suppose those feelings are similar to those of a hunter who spent years hunting and tracking prey. After a while, they are able to develop a sixth sense and able to feel when something is watching them. That's how I felt. I've heard Native Americans describe the same feeling before. I know it's cliche that you have the feeling that someone's watching you. That's the sort of thing I'm talking about, but just much stronger and it never went away. Some Native Americans proclaim it to be a thin veil between the worlds, 
and that the ancients inhabiting the other side can see through it, but that most people are very much unaware of its existence. I'm sure that many of the strange occurrences that I experienced during my time at the cabin had a lot to do with this bizarre feeling of being watched continuously without break. Spending three days of building my sacred space was an experience that I will always remember and cherish. Actively using the area is another experience that I will never forget. That said, many strange things happened there. One day I was hiking through the adjacent desert hills surrounding the cabin. I ventured further away from the property by at least a couple of miles further than usual, and I came across a massive skull of what I could only assume was a longhorn deer. However, it immediately reminded me of the great white buffalo that is sacred to so many Native American nations. The skull was enormous and had two large horns coming out of it, as well as being completely covered in thick snow and white fur. I carried the skull home and properly, after consecrating and blessing it, placed it on my stone altar, where it became the centerpiece until I left for good. I don't know what became of that sacred space, but it sure meant a lot to me. I was heading north and east of the cabin and was staying in just outside of Flagstaff and Williams, almost precisely the moment that I turned onto a particular highway. A stream of shadowy winged figures began swooping back and forth over the top of my car. Please try to imagine a long and lonely stretch of road through the heart of the four corner regions where there is little water hardly any trees at all, and is otherwise very uninhabitable. There are no other cars on the road for miles and miles. I don't recall passing even a single car on that particular stretch of road that night also, though I had to traverse it for several hours. As soon as I turned onto this particular road, a large shadowy figure started swooping around back and forth over my car. At first, I thought it was a bat of some kind or a nocturnal bird, but I wasn't aware as much. I was still new to the southwestern region of the United States at the time. I really didn't think much about it and just kept driving. However, about five minutes into the occurrence, it seemed as if more and more of these things started streaming into the air above my car. Whatever they were, they were keeping up with the speed of my vehicle, so I accelerated. I was taking the car over a hundred miles per hour, and to my complete horror, the dark winged figures were still keeping up with my vehicle, like it was no problem at all. Perhaps 10 minutes into this bizarre situation, I was flying down the road at a speed of nearly 120, and eventually decided to slow the car down to the creeping speed of 15 miles per hour. I was barely moving at this point, but nothing changed. Not knowing what exactly to think or expect, I merely resumed the speed limit, maybe five to 10 miles above it for the remainder of this road. And the winged things continued to follow me. I would assume that this experience occurred through only at least 30 miles. However, it could probably be a bit more. After that terrifying experience, I finally came across an eatery, made a pit stop to take a bite, and noticed that over the road, there was a Navajo museum. This caught my attention. I finished my food excitedly and got out to explore the Navajo collection. The entire thing was dedicated to the Navajo people, as those lands even now belong to their nation. The whole area was a Navajo reservation, and even the encounter I described earlier, with the winged shadows flying over the top of my car for miles, occurred on Navajo land. The museum wouldn't amount to much for the average person, I'm sure. I highly doubt that it received much attention. I myself spent the better half of an hour going through the handful of exhibits and reading each plaque with detail. 
Each display was filled with basic things, tools, mock dwellings, and other artifacts. All in all, the place explained a great deal about the Navajo people, and how they'd managed to survive in such a harsh landscape. After I finished walking through the place and checked it all out, I ran across a hitchhiker. It was not only the first hitchhiker I'd seen on the trip, it was in fact the first person or vehicle I'd seen in hours aside from the pit stop. I started slowing down as soon as I passed him. I noticed how heavy his gear was and also took note of how he appeared to be Native American. Pulling over to the side of the road, my car came to a stop 50 yards or so ahead of the man. I watched him through my rear view mirror as he hunkered down and began running when he'd realized that I was stopping for him. I asked if he needed a ride, to which he replied in the affirmative, and told me he was going in the same direction I was, and that he just needed a lift for the first 30 miles or so. I jumped out, threw his stuff in the trunk, and then jumped back into the driver's seat and took off with my new passenger. Over the next half hour, we shared some lovely conversations. I found out he was full-blooded Navajo, and went by the Christian name Raymond. He was well known in the area, or so he claimed, and that he had lived there for his entire life. When we approached Flagstaff, he asked to be dropped off near an underpass as I was heading further south, and he needed to go west towards Arizona slash California. I pulled off the major highway that Raymond and I had been traveling on for several miles, then let him out underneath the off ramp he indicated for me to pull over at. Thumbling down cars near underpasses and overpasses where two interstates connect is quite reasonable for hitchhikers as they have an easier time catching a ride along these stretches of highway and interstates than anywhere else. I offered him a brand new tent and some other gear that I just happened to have in the back of my car as an avid hiker and I had purchased some extra equipment you see, Raymond had explained to me how his previous gear had recently been ruined due to certain circumstances. So after a tiny bit of coaxing, he graciously accepted. What happened next was one of the strangest things. By the time I left Raymond with his gear and doubled back around onto the highway, heading south, I had a clear view of where I had just left him, and he was nowhere to be seen. There is no way possible that in this short amount of time, Raymond and all the gear that just left the vehicle had vanished. He couldn't have walked off very far in any direction, and it was fairly visible everywhere. I feel that it's important to take a moment to mention that during our conversation, because of my genuine liking for this man, as well as recognizing the hardship he was currently facing in life, I offered him an open invitation to come and stay on the property that I was wanting any time that he made his way out. There was a second cabin, albeit much smaller, which had previously been occupied by a Navajo. He'd been a friend of the woman who owned the land, and quite frankly, he was also a man that I rather enjoyed having a conversation with the few times that I had the pleasure. However, I find it critical to mention this open invitation was for a reason. And the reason is that I gave Raymond the exact location of the cabin, as well as directions as to how to get there from the nearest town, Williams, Arizona. Having grown up in the region and being 50 something years old, I'm sure it wouldn't take him long to find his way there. That same night, extraordinarily upsetting things began to take place in the cabin. For the first time since being there, which at this point had been several weeks, I heard coyotes for the first time. Previously, I had heard them far off in the distance, but never near the actual property. I hadn't found their tracks around the place either. I thought it was a bit strange that they didn't seem to be cutting through the property, as it was several acres wide, being 15 acres, and I could clearly hear them near the surrounding properties, which were much more extensive. There were plenty of rabbits and small game near the cabin, I kicked them up daily when I walked around the place. However, at the time, I had much bigger issues to worry about than why coyotes weren't bothering me. The night after I returned from my trip, I slept well. Lots of things on my mind. 
and the next morning, of course, I notice the coyote tracks around the cabin. I didn't think very much of it as I had obviously heard them and knew that they had been there. However, the next morning was a different story altogether. That night, the coyotes returned to run circles around the house for what seemed to be half the night. Almost no sooner had my head hit the pillow did I hear the footsteps of what sounded like a rather large pack running around it. Not long after, I began to hear their heavy footfalls pounding through hard packed earth around the cabin. They continued yipping and yapping for some time. That's right around the time I was once again reaching the rationalization that maybe they had driven another poor old little rabbit into the area, despite the fact I didn't find any fur nor blood, or indicators that they had actually found one or eaten it. This is when I hear a clear and distinct sound, claws on the door. The way that this particular cabin is set up, or was at the time at least, the entire upstairs floor stretched the length of the cabin and was set up as the only bedroom in the place. I had set up my bed in a particular area, which was located on top of the garage, and the headboard was directly above the wooden side door of the cabin, which led into the garage. This was also the main entrance to the cabin, as the other two entrances were an automatic garage door, which made no sense to open on a daily basis to get in or out of the cabin, and a set of double glass sliding doors on the side of the living room, which also wouldn't make much sense to be opening and closing numerous times a day. So the little wooden door on the side of our cabin was our maintenance entrance. And that is the door that I heard the claws scratching. You can only describe terror and shock in so many ways, with so many words, none of which accurately do it justice whatsoever. What I felt lying in my bed and hearing something run around the cabin, scratching on the doors as if trying to get in. I could not convey to you in words if I use 10,000 to do so. Paralyzing fear, that must be the closest. That said, it doesn't bother me to admit the terror that gripped my entire being as I heard something steadily scratch on the door. I began to wonder how it could actually withstand something trying to break through. It wasn't a very expensive door. It didn't consist of solid oak or anything like that. In fact, I believe it was probably made more like particle board with a thin layer of real wood on either side. So I knew it wouldn't take long for the door to give way and allow whatever was outside to get in. I often wonder why I didn't get up, go down and open the door to see what was out there. And then I quickly remember the unnatural terror I felt at the time and remembered that what I did do was lay there paralyzed with fear until I fell asleep, only to wake up and realize it was already next morning with the sunshine shining through. My morning ritual at the time consisted mainly of meditating in my outdoor sanctuary and the returning to the cabin shortly after sunrise to prepare coffee and then relax outside near a large raised bedstone circle garden where I would then feed the three ravens Edgar, Alan, and Poe, the latter of which would behave somewhat like pets returning daily, day after day for the table of scraps we left them, like offerings inside the stone circle. Sipping coffee, chills ran through my body as I suddenly recalled what happened the night before and what had occurred the previous night as well. When I couldn't take it anymore, I went from my chair to look around the cabin, only to find what appeared to be the tracks of an entire pack of coyotes. Tracks upon tracks. But amongst these, several more massive tracks could be seen. They were obviously disturbed by the smaller ones, which greatly outnumbered the larger ones. This little fact left with me even more questions, as I knew full well that no wild dog or wolf is going to accept it and run into a pack of wild coyotes. Keep in mind that it is nothing for a pack of coyotes in this particular region of the country to number well in the dozens. The tracks, the massive ones, piqued my curiosity and left me scared because it was only then that I remembered the scratching sound. I ran to the door, remembering the eerie noise and stepped in front of the simple wooden door. I felt my heart beat against my chest. 
There were several sets of long and deep scratch marks that stretched from about the middle of the door and ran several feet up the door almost to a stop. I really had to fight with myself to remain calm and not freak out. You see, as a long-time independent researcher of folklore and mythology, and indigenous culture from all over the world, including the oral law of Native Americans, I had the sinking suspicion of what may be responsible for the marks, but couldn't bear myself to admit it at the time. Perhaps one of the most mysterious aspects about these incidences that took place over the course of the few days was not just the tracks, let alone the deep gorging scratches on the door, but the fact that for me, to clearly see so many tracks around the cabin, I could not for the life of me find the source of where they came from. It's as if they only appeared out of thin air outside the cabin, ran circles and then vanished again from whence they came. To claim that I understood what happened on the property would be a bald-faced lie. To say that I've come to my own conclusions, these several years later based on countless hours of research, before and after the events described, I would very much believe that I was in the presence of a real-life skimwalker. Native American legends say that these creatures are actually thought to be humans twisted by greed and dark magic, and are not creatures at all and have been known by local Native Americans to frequent the area for centuries. In fact, the skinwalkers are better known amongst members of the Navajo Nation more than any other in the country. Many people don't believe that they exist anywhere else in the world outside of this particular region, as they are thought to be Native Americans who's lost their way and given into dark powers. What I will say, however, is that I still deeply believe deep down that Raymond and possibly some of his friends had paid me a visit and would yet pay me another. On the third night after I'd picked up Raymond, the yipping and yapping coyotes, as well as the pitter patter of their claws circling the cabin, found its way to my ears once more. At that point, I was beyond trying to understand what was happening and even further beyond trying to confirm it. I had no way of proving anything, and no intention of trying to do so. I have convinced myself, in my heart, that what I experienced out there for three nights in a row was none other than a Navajo skinwalker, maybe possibly more, in its own territory. As far as what you decide to believe, that's entirely up to you. After the events of those nights, it wouldn't be for a few more short weeks before I lost my nerve and left the cabin for good due to other circumstances, somewhat similar, but yet worlds apart. For my own safety, I left Arizona and never returned, save one time during many months later with several other people to gather up my belongings. To this day, I wouldn't step one foot back onto that particular piece of property, especially at night, even if you paid. This happened a little before my 20th birthday, about four to five months ago. It was about 5 p.m. and I was waiting for a friend at a bar and he was running a little late. So I went ahead and got my first drink while waiting. As I was sitting at the bar, a guy came up and started talking to me. Definitely nothing to worry about yet. It was a bar and he definitely seemed like he was just trying to pick me up. We had a light conversation and he offered to buy me a drink, and I accepted. He called the bartender, and I ordered. We spoke for a little, exchanged numbers, and I told him I was waiting for a friend, and he asked if she was as pretty and unique as me. Being an alternative girl, guys never really know how to compliment. I laughed and said no. He is definitely prettier, and with almost perfect timing, my friend messaged me that he was there but couldn't see me. I told him I was sitting in the end corner of the bar, and he came to find me. I gave my friend a hug and introduced the two. The guy started to act a little strange now, saying that he didn't want to interrupt our night and being kind of standoffish. He said he had to go and just up and left. I wondered if maybe he was intimidated by my friend because he's six foot four but is also lanky. I had his number and thought I'd message him tomorrow. 
I had a nice night with my friend. We had some drinks and then went to get a few more drinks. About 11ish, it was time to say goodbye. And we walked to the train station because we live in different areas and took different trains. His showed up before mine. We said our final goodbyes and I waved him off. I had another 10 or so minutes before grabbing my own train. So I just took out my phone and browsed my socials. This is when I got the feeling that I was being watched. I look around and see no one looking at me. And since I was in the city, even though it was kind of late, people were still about. So I went back to my browsing and had someone sit down next to me. Thought it was you, the voice said. I looked up and was surprised to see the guy from the bar. I asked if he was also heading home and he said he was and that he needed to feed his cat. As a cat person, I asked more about that and he showed me pictures. He asked if I wanted to come home and feed and see her too. I told him maybe some other time and he was pretty insistent, but I still refused. My train was coming and I stood to go wait for it. As I was about to turn and say goodbye, he was standing as well. He said he was taking the same train and at this point I was a little suspicious, but it was a main train. So we got on and I sat down again and he sat next to me. I had to get off in two stops, then get on another train for another two stops. And he got off also at the same stop and on the same train again. The whole time having normal conversations with me. Obviously I was freaking out a little, so I messaged my housemate and asked him to wait for me at the station. Luckily him and his missus were still up and he asked me why and I told him to just do it. When we got off at the station that was only a short walk from my apartment, I said it was a funny coincidence that he also lived around here. He turned to me and said, no, you're taking me to your place. I apologized if he had misunderstood me, but I never had said anything like that. He said that he was already all this way and that I should just let him come over. Like he was ordering me around. It all felt gross. At this point, I was in full on panic mode. There weren't that many people at this stop and we were in a suburban neighborhood now. This is probably when I looked noticeably panicked and my housemate saw this and came out of the car. He's 29 and quite a big guy. He came over and in his Lebo accent asked if there was a problem. And the guy said that he was my date and that I was taking him home. I said that was a lie and my housemate just walked me to the car and I mean mugged the guy the whole time. Sitting in the car, I got a text. It said, I'll see you again. I had totally forgotten that I gave him my number. I looked up to see him still standing at the station. We locked eyes and he smiled and waved. It wasn't a creepy smile. It looked nice and genuine. Then I think that is what made it creepier. I avoid that bar now and would rather not see him again. I'm a 31 year old female and I've had a long history with drugs. I started using heavy hard drugs when I was 21. Now I'm five foot and 135 pounds. I've always been on the smaller side, not the type you'd look at or even imagine I'd touched a joint in my life. I have a baby face and most people guess I'm 25 years old. When I was 21, I looked like a preteen. A good example of this was when I was 18, my boyfriend and I went to Cincinnati Reds opening game and the first 100 kids under 14 got a free bobblehead. Well, I received a free bobblehead. My poor boyfriend felt very awkward to say the least, but this is getting off topic. Just basically, I want to point out how I look young for my age. This event happened when I was 23, so I looked like I was 16. I was sitting alone on a notorious drug street in a very bad area of Cincinnati. This was incredibly stupid of me, but at the time I had this mentality. 
Then I run the streets. I have these hitters that got my back, so no one would ever dare mess with me. Obviously, this was a very stupid mentality to have, which was tested and changed my mentality forever and made me far more street smart and cautious. In fact, I'm very lucky to have made it away from that situation completely unharmed. It definitely messed me up for quite a while and made me much more aware of my surroundings and who I deal with and who I trust. I was sitting on the street waiting for my lottery guy to pull up to give me my lottery tickets and be on my way so that I can play the lottery. I'm sitting there in my vehicle, minding my own business, jamming out and not paying any attention to anything going on around me because I had this stupid mentality that I was untouchable. This guy comes and taps my driver's side window. Bear in mind, I've never seen this guy before, but anyone who knows anything about playing the lottery on the streets knows that sometimes there are others who come and bring your deliveries. It's not always your same guy, but generally they will let you know if someone is taking their place. So I crack down my window and they go, hey, you looking for some tickets? Nah, but if you want to throw me a ticket with your number on it, I'll keep you in mind because I do play a lot of games. It's always good to have more than two guys. Ah, oh, cool, cool, I live right there. I'll go grab you some tickets and be right back. No red flags going off just yet. Because bear in mind, a lot of lottery dealers get new customers in this way. Then I see him coming back with another dude. My car was this little Honda Civic with manual locks and I did not lock my doors. That's when this guy immediately opens the driver's side door and puts a weapon against my head. Are you pregnant? He asks. And this catches me completely off guard. It was winter and cold, but me being female, I'm like, no, I'm not pregnant. Do I look pregnant to you? Give me your money, he says. Now, never before or since have I been in a situation like this. And honestly, I feel very blessed by this. He keeps telling me that I need to give him my money or that he'll pull the trigger. I have horrible anxiety and honestly, I couldn't think of what to say and just said, give me a minute. I just need a minute to think. He actually stops and goes, okay. The horn on my car didn't work or I'd have been blowing it like crazy. Now me being a big lottery player and only having enough money on me for two tickets, I couldn't give this dude my money. I'd be sick and I had work and stuff to do. So I call his bluff. I don't have any money. My lottery dude fronts me my tickets, I say. I watch him as he moves the weapon around to whip me, which he wasn't even doing correctly. At that moment, I knew this guy didn't have it in him and had no idea what he was doing, fortunately for me. So I lean my face into the passenger seat and proceed to bicycle kick him in his nuts. I had Timberland boots on, unfortunately for him. Then I start screaming, saying that I'm being robbed and that his fingerprints are all over my car door and handle. This has the desired effect. Him and his friend start running away. And as you can imagine, I did not go back to that area to purchase my lottery tickets anymore. Thankfully, I no longer buy lottery tickets, but if you do buy off the street, please be safe out there and always lock your doors. I just want to say something. If you are someone who buys lottery tickets off the street and don't want to be, I do want to say there is hope for you. I was told by my counselor at rehab that there was no hope for me and they were wrong. There was hope and I'm doing great things now. I may have lost everyone and everything, but I also began to gain that back after I lost my way. But I'm back. I'm fortunate enough to have a great mum and family who are always there for me. Please, don't think it's too late like I did. We all have someone who loves us and needs us, regardless of what you do or have done. You're special and amazing. And 
I just think that there are some of you out there who may need to hear it. But you're worth it, and special. You can find yourself again, and there is hope for you. I was, and still am, living in Kelowna, British Columbia. At the time I was 17, and living with my mum but working full time. I normally left the house about 4am to walk into work for 4.30. I started my walk like I did every other morning, got myself bundled up, it was during the winter, put my headphones in and started to make my way to work. I get a few houses down from my mum's place and a guy steps out onto the sidewalk. He shouts something out at me that I don't quite understand because I had my music in my ears. So I pulled out an earbud and asked him to repeat himself. He looked at me with this wide-eyed look, and I immediately regretted asking him to repeat what he said. Jesus loves you, he says in this creepy sing-song voice. Uh, thanks, I guess. And Jesus wants me to take your life. At this point, my blood ran cold. The street was empty beside us. I was training in martial arts at the time, so I kinda shifted my stance knowing full well I could get my ass kicked, but I still didn't wanna show fear. I reached into my pocket and grabbed the pepper spray my mum handed me earlier for when I walked around at such an early hour. I showed it to him and screamed with all that I could to leave me alone. Leave me alone right now, I'm gonna call the cops. Jesus loves you. He said that, half sung, half in a mocking tone, and skipped like an excited child away from me. I walked down the road a bit further and called my parents on the house phone from my cell so that the ring would wake someone up. And when my dad answered, I practically shouted at him to meet me outside with my mum and bring the phone out in case he decided to follow me home. Upon getting there, I called the cops and they told me something similar had happened to a girl my age, and she kept walking. But when she turned the corner, three other guys attacked her and nearly ended her life. Because it was so dark, I couldn't really make out the details about this guy. All that I could tell is that he was high or something. I stayed home for three days and refused to leave my house because it happened not more than three houses down from where I lived. The police couldn't really do anything as I didn't have a description, and they weren't sure if the attackers and taunting Jesus loves you guy were working together, or if it was just unlucky for the previous girl. I was 13 years old. We lived in Lowell, Indiana. Our house was built in the 1800s, antebellum style and huge. It always creeped me out. From the very day we moved in, I was aware that we weren't alone in that house. The house itself had seven bedrooms. I had three sisters and one brother, although we had plenty of rooms to have our own. We paired up. I shared a room with my older sister, and my younger twin sisters had their room together. I will now share with you two of the most frightening experiences I had when I lived there. The first one before we decided that we would rather have a roommate than be alone. It was around the first month or so of us living there. I had trouble falling asleep to begin with, and it was summer, but I remember it being extremely cold in my room. So cold, that I shivered and rolled onto my side to curl up under my blankets. Finally, I fell asleep, but I awoke and my skin was ice cold. My blanket was missing. I didn't think much of it. So I looked over to the right side of my bed on the floor, then to my left, nothing. The hair stood up on the back of my neck as I crawled to the foot of my bed and saw my blanket laying perfectly flat, like someone had taken it off me in the middle of the night and laid it out on the floor. Absolutely no wrinkles in it. I actually don't recall how I reacted. I just know that it creeped me out so much that I moved into my big sister's room on the second floor that very night. 
The second incident that really stood out and still does confuse me was we had a horseshoe driveway and a security light in our front yard. During the summers, we always kept our windows up as it stayed cool enough due to the light breeze and fresh air. One night, really late, the doorbell, which was extremely loud, rang. I got up and looked out the window down to my aunt Kathy, who was standing there with my cousins, Steve and Jessica. I could see them from their headlights, and it was pouring rain like a monsoon, which I also saw thanks to the headlights. I yelled down, Hey, you guys okay? Yeah, can you let us in? She replied. Me and Keith are fighting again. Yeah, let me wake up my mum, I reply. So I wake her up, and she firmly says, as a matter of factly, Well, let them in. I ran around the banister down the 27 stairs to the foyer and opened the door. There was no one there. No car, no rain, nothing. Just a warm breeze and the scaredest I've ever been in my entire life. I'm not sure if any of you know about these things, but can anyone explain what happened to me? I'm not the only one who witnessed it. My sister and my mum were both awake, and my sister was looking out the window as well as me. I always wondered what it was I let into my house. Like, what was it that rang the doorbell pretending to be a loved one in trouble? It's like, whatever it was, knew that we'd open the door if someone we loved was in trouble. Insidious is how it felt. At the time, when I looked down from the second story window at my aunt, Kathy, cousin Stevie, and Kathy holding baby Jessica on her hips, Jessica wasn't born yet. But this is what shakes me too. I told my mum, Aunt Kathy, Stevie, and baby Jessica are here. At the time, Kathy was only three months pregnant. There are a number of stories that I wish to share with you about the house I used to live in. I was home alone in the bath, but I had closed the door so that my dogs wouldn't run in and try to jump into the bath too, as they always did. I was there for a good 45 to 50 minutes, and when I climbed out and opened the door, there had been a table moved right in front of it. I never heard a thing while it was happening. Never even heard my dogs bark, and they bark for anything, and they were playing outside, which was so strange for them. There was also a stage of about three to four weeks where my dogs would refuse to sleep in my house. They would rather sleep outside. Within that time, I would constantly feel like I was being watched, hearing people coughing or sneezing outside my window. One morning, I awoke with a scratch on my face. Remember the dogs were all outside as they were refusing to sleep inside with me. I woke up in the middle of the night once. I was partly asleep, partly awake. I needed to use the bathroom, but I couldn't get through the door. Something kept blocking me and pushing me back. I was physically pushed back to my bed, and I just remembered climbing back in. I woke up next morning, like thank goodness it was just a dream, got up and realized I was on the wrong side of the bed, and I was filled with scratch marks down my arms and legs. Scared the ever-loving crap out of me. This one's more on a funny note. Every night at nine, the door would rattle. Seriously, every night. Now my mum and her husband also picked up on this. And one night, my mum decides she's going to stand by the door and wait for the rattle sound of the door handle. So without her knowledge, her husband jumps through the bedroom window and runs to the front door and rattles it. I have never seen her run, glide and fly through the passage so fast like I've never seen anyone so scared. I felt bad for her, but hey, cruel pranks. This other story is from my other house. I could honestly spend hours telling the stories of the crazy stuff from living there. Now this specific house is the house I grew up in, and the first time I ever saw something was when I was about seven. I had a playroom that was in the bottom part of the house, the house was set up in a way that it was just one long passage, six bedrooms and my toy room. 
That was the last bedroom at the inn. Now, we never went to the bottom part of the house. I always thought it was because we never needed to. It's only later I found out the real reason. To get back to the story, one specific day I had something I didn't recognize come into my room and told me to start running. I just about crapped myself and ran to my mum. She immediately told me it was nothing and that it was probably my shadow and the TV in the background. Only when I was older, she admitted she'd actually seen it herself. I described exactly what I saw and never spoke of it again. Fast forward a few years later, my little cousin, about five at the time, comes running out of the same room screaming to her mum that a shadow told her to start running. Another incident, I would usually lay in the entertainment area and watch TV at the bottom of the passage. Only in the day though, nobody dared doing that at night. My back was towards the rest of the passage as I was laying on the couch. I was home alone at the time and we had tiles, so I hear footsteps walking towards me and naturally assumed it was my dad. So I didn't think anything of it until after a few seconds, I turn around and there was nobody there. There was another incident in the house I grew up in, like I've just said, but I wanted to point out that I've always had animals growing up, never just one or two in the same house. Maybe I'd have two dogs and three cats at one time. Now see, this is all perfectly normal until you realize that while having animals and living there, none of my animals would ever get to reach their first birthday. They would always die. I've lost so many animals in my lifetime. It still messes with me. They would all just pass away of illness and it would be so out of nowhere. One day they'd be happy and healthy and the next we'd find them. My mom and I still talk about it, even though it's a touchy subject. We really loved all those animals and it was terrible. Every single person that knew that house completely believes that there was something wrong with it. Now for the part that most certainly can't be explained. There was a brief moment in living in the house where all my animals had passed and we had none. And I remember it like it were yesterday. I would literally still hear my animals running down my passage past my bedroom every night. Both my parents and absolutely anyone who came wouldn't be able to get past the third child's bedroom. They'd immediately get goosebumps. You could honestly feel someone watching you. You could feel the cold wind when there was no one there. You'd get goosebumps. The air would lighten up and you'd tense up. It was horrible. We ended up moving out of that house when I was 13. One day we went to visit the new owners of the house a few years later. I can't remember why exactly, but they actually asked if we'd ever experienced anything weird and strange in the house. I remember the intense conversations that night between the two families. The house I'm currently living in, I found out that the old woman that used to stay here was heavily into witchcraft and her husband passed away here. I'm a 22 year old guy from South Africa. And this incident happened about two years ago. You must understand that South Africa has been notorious for having a high crime rate, especially at night. I'm a six foot tall guy, relatively big, and I'm a complete introvert. I was never a big fan of going to clubs and parties. My friends always knocked me for being so antisocial and for being such an introvert. So this one time I decided to tag along with them. When we got to the club, it was better than I expected it to be. The vibe and music was amazing, but I never danced or socialized with anyone. My friends went off to socialize and chat up people being the social butterflies they were. As for me, I just stood there awkwardly and alone until this one girl came up to me. She was petite, attractive and hit me up with a Hey, I'm Chelsea. In my head, I was filled with confusion. I mean, it's not like I was the most attractive bloke. I went with the flow and introduced myself nonetheless. We were then sat at the counter over a few drinks. We had an awesome conversation going. And after a few drinks, I noticed the conversation started to feel a bit awkward. 
She kept on glancing a few times at something or someone behind me, and started to speak less and seemed less interested in what I was saying now. With me being in such a tipsy state, I didn't even bother to turn around and to see who it was she was looking at. And after a few more drinks, I had an incredible buzz going for me, and then decided to go out for a cigarette and excused myself from the girl I was chatting to. As I was outside, I could feel my legs being hard to move. My head became heavy, and I became lightheaded and dizzy. I thought it was just the alcohol. I brushed the uneasy feeling off and went outside, lit my cigarette, and started to browse through my phone. Then I could hear footsteps approaching me. Another guy was coming towards me. He introduced himself as Craig and tried to bum me a cigarette. Reluctantly, I reached for my pocket and gave him one. My vision then started to get really blurry. I was losing my balance and couldn't stand straight. Then I saw two more silhouettes walking towards me, and felt a blow to the back of my head. I woke up to the faces of my friends a few hours later, only to realize I was in a hospital bed. And according to them, one of them had seen me going outside when I went for a smoke. They proceeded to go out and join me. When they eventually got there, they saw three men holding me, as if I were passed out drunk, and walking to a nearby truck in the parking lot. My friend then called out the guys. They turned around, dropped me, and fled in their truck. According to the medical, I had some drug substance in my body, and was in shock. Then it hit me. That girl Chelsea, she kept on dropping a few of her belongings towards my side of the chair. Me being in a buzzed and happy state, I was happy to pick them up, thinking it was gentleman's etiquette. I was really oblivious to the fact that she was purposefully doing that to distract me. She then probably threw something in my drink, and then began to signal the guys behind me that her objective had been completed. From what I've heard, there were incidences where an attractive girl is used to lure lonely and vulnerable-looking guys into a trap, so the guys can take them somewhere to do, who knows what. Their intentions weren't to rob me because they never took any of my belongings. They clearly had something much more sinister planned. I'm glad my friends saw me leaving at the time, and it scares me to know what could have happened if they didn't. Stay safe, people. And be very careful at clubs and parties. Don't lose sight of your drink, and be cautious of strangers who come across as too friendly. You never know what their real intentions might be. When I was seventeen, I got a job working for a major thrift store chain in North Seattle, a location considered by many to be sketchy. The M.O. of this chain was to buy up old grocery stores or other serviceable old buildings, and open up stores. The building was, I believe, one of the old grocery stores of the area. It was tiny and very old. I had made a few friends while working there, most of whom I'm still friends with today. And recently, this was brought back up. It blows my mind I could have forgotten this because it's the only actual, tangible evidence I've ever seen with my own two eyes of real paranormal activity. Here's what went down: one night after everyone went home, the security alarm went off. That flagged the security company to send a police car and to inform the building owners. So on and so forth down the chain of command until it landed at my friend. The store's supervisor's feet. Since he lived within walking distance of the store, he was responsible for meeting with the patrol and verifying that the building was all clear, and it was. With that taken care of, everyone went about their business. The next day, he obviously checked the security footage to see what might have set off the alarm. He actually called me. And a few others into the office to show us the footage. Let me describe the layout for you, so you can get a better mental image of this first. 
The front of the store was an entire wall of floor to ceiling windows with three doors. An entrance, an exit, and an emergency exit with a big red handle that would trip the alarm if used. The registers stood between that front wall and the racks of clothing, with each rack having a little end cap sign on a little metal post. If you've thrift shopped, I'm sure you know what they look like, as it's pretty much the same in every shop. The back part of the store, the employee only area, had a bunch of racks of clothing waiting to be priced that sat there for the next morning. So he showed us this CCTV footage. It's dark, it's empty, and nothing seems to be happening for a minute. Then, one of the end cap signs starts to slowly spin. This I could easily write off as a vent draft or something, but things started picking up. The CCTV would pan back and forth between the camera, overlooking the front windows slash registers slash partial view of the racks and end cap signs to the back of the housing area where we processed all donations. In the back, you could see the sleeve of a coat being lifted, as though it were being pinched at the cuff and lifted above the collar before being dropped again, over and over. That could not be explained by a draft. Back to the front camera. The sign is now spinning extremely fast, and the crappy cardboard signs that hang with fishing line from the ceiling are swaying like crazy, almost like an earthquake. And then, the glass window actually started flexing violently. The red handle on the emergency exit door, a long metal bar, almost as long as the actual door at the front, thrusted up and down, while the whole door and surrounding windows looked like they were being wailed on by someone, or several somebodies. This is what set the alarm off. There was no one there. The parking lot was visible through the glass, and there was not a single person in that entire place. All the activity started very slowly and ramped up into a somewhat violent frenzy, and then just stopped. All within maybe a one to two minute span. So I have no proof, but it's very frustrating, as the footage has been lost but I can't think of any logical explanation for any of it. I'm flawed, and I will never be able to forget what I've seen. And that was the better part of a decade ago now. This dream has stayed with me, and I think it always will. Although not profound or life-altering, I've never been able to shake the memory and the feeling of absolute terror and dread. To give some context, this was a number of years ago. Currently, I'm 23 years old, and this dream occurred at the age of 11. As a child, I suffered from sleep paralysis for a number of years. At first, this terrified me to the point of me not wanting to sleep. It became so bad that I pushed myself to states of exhaustion before my body could no longer remain conscious and I would pass out only to return to the horrifying imagery of my subconscious. The first time I ever experienced sleep paralysis, I still lived with my aunt who fostered me, which is another story entirely. But I was in my old room in my old bunk bed, and I remember it all so clearly. I awake to the sensation of not being able to move, struggle as I may, and this confused me, but didn't scare me, not yet. It was only when I saw what stood in the corner of the room did my fear really start to descend. It was a hooded figure, all black, so very black, darker than the darkest shade of black. In its hand was some kind of weapon, like an oddly shaped axe or scythe. Its face was that of a skeleton, ghostly white, and dark black holes that felt as though they were sucking the life straight out of you, where his eyes should have been. It stood there, 
staring at me. My eyes widened as I prayed for this to be some kind of dream or hallucination. I was frozen in fear. Not that I could escape, even if I had the courage to move. Its sharp, crooked, daggered teeth began to form a smile. The most gut-wrenching, heart-stopping smile I could ever imagine. The kind of smile that alludes to such confidence, such domination and power over me, that it only frightened me more and intensified my fear. It slowly, creakily, almost clockwork doll-like, began to turn its head, continuing until it was such at an unnatural angle, and then it started to inch towards me. It didn't move. It simply began to move closer. It didn't obey any natural law or any flicker of logic. I guess in retrospect it makes perfect sense, just adding to my confusion. It edged even closer to me, unmoving and unchanging in its deadlock, icy grin, its gaze of absolute horror still peering into my soul. Looking back, I can still picture it, and it disgusts me. It continued until it was halfway across the room. Then, without warning, it just stopped. This is where my blood ran cold. It slowly raised its arms from beneath its cloak to reveal its hideous, revolting arm, a mixture of rotting flesh on bone, decomposing right there in front of me, and the sight of it made me want to gag. Then it did something I'll never forget. It methodically raised its hand slowly, that putrid thing, and began to point. Not at something in the room, but at me. My eyes widened further still, and my heart began to thump in my chest. It then placed both hands upon his head, and began to twist and pull his head back into place. A noise sent shivers down my spine. It creaked and cracked, and screamed back into place, and then the figure began to approach me. It was at this point full-blown panic set in, and I started to struggle. I kicked and twisted and tried to throw in my body, but I could not. I couldn't move. I was trapped and paralyzed as the ominous creature drew ever closer. I couldn't free my invisible shackles. So I screamed with all my might. I thought at the very least my family would be alerted. At the very least, they'd surely see what happened to me. Fair whatever small comfort that may bring. But to my dismay, no sound came from my mouth. I tried again, but now the figure was almost at the foot of my bed. My cries for help failed. In my head, I was screaming like a madman. The figure was now at the foot of my bed. Only now it's not smiling, but it looks more terrifying, teeth all aligned jaggedly. I continued to struggle, but it was futile. It continued to get closer and closer until it was stood right in front of me at the side of my bed. I was frozen. I just looked back at it, petrified. It leaned in until its face was face to face with me, and at this point I knew my life was over. It reached its arm towards me, and it screamed a blood-curdling scream. I closed my eyes and prepared myself to be ripped apart by this thing. But no nothing. Just like that it was gone. I look around my room with my heart thumping so hard I thought it would burst from my ribcage. I was sweating profusely, and I was afraid. I scanned the room but it was empty. I turned on the light. Nothing. I crawled back into bed, confused and fearful. No more sleep was had the next night, and the light remained on. The previous night's ordeal haunted me, the next day, and I couldn't focus. I tried to talk with my aunt, but she put it down to a bad dream, maybe a demon that had taken a liking. The latter was her way of trying to be funny and reassure me that it wasn't real, but I didn't find it comforting in the slightest. In fact, it made me more paranoid. I dreaded going back to bed that night. When night came, I wasn't prepared and I decided I wouldn't sleep in fear, 
of what I saw returning. I tried my hardest, but eventually my struggles resulted in failure. It was no good. My eyes became heavy and tears started to stream down my face. Whatever that thing was, had shaken me to my very core. It might sound silly to some, but I genuinely believed that when I fell back asleep, my life would be in serious danger. I sobbed and cried myself to sleep, and the next morning I awoke, and I was fine. No figure, no traumatic experience, at all. And this filled me with so much joy, than ever before. Maybe it had just been a dream. Maybe I didn't have to face this thing. It was exhilarating. Later on, I would learn about sleep paralysis, as I did end up suffering from it for quite a few years, and ended up doing some research, which confirmed it to be nothing more than sleep-related hallucinations. Even when they would return several times as I returned to sleep, eventually I did discover something useful, something to help you escape, even if it's just temporarily. The trick is to move. I know you probably think, well, that's useful considering you're legitimately paralyzed, hence the name sleep paralysis, but there's something many people fail to consider. Yes, it's true you can't move your arms or legs or even your head. You can't scream or make a sound, but what you can do is move your tongue. It sounds silly, but move your tongue as much as possible and as quickly as possible. And if you try and waggle those fingertips and toes at the same time, you'll wake up much faster. Maybe there's someone hearing this who's suffering from sleep paralysis. Maybe there's people listening who already know this and don't believe it would work. But if you're suffering and the once tranquil thought of sleep has been replaced with the fear of what awaits you, then give it a try. It may just help. I was 16 at the time, and at a small hunting camp near the eastern panhandle of West Virginia. The camp has a fairly large pond when you drive in. The camp itself is in one large circle with a couple of branching roads. When you come in, you can go straight and sit up by some old growth pine with nothing growing at the bottom, and nestled in is a little shack. To the left will take you by the pond, and you can continue onto the road and circle up to the mountain where it links with the other road. I have a place on this side, about two and a half miles from the pond. At about 10 p.m. one night, I decided I wanted to go camp fishing. So I loaded up my four wheeler with tackle, a road mining hat with a light and a hatchet for any snakes and drove down to the pond on the rocky dirt road. I get down there at about 10.30 and my first line is out. When I'm at the wooded area to my right, that's as thick as blackberry bushes with a path cut through to another fishing spot. The road to my left and back down is a little dip. I fish for about an hour and a half, only catching one small fish when I felt eyes on me and heard a branch snap. Now I've been in the woods my whole life at this point, so I grab my hatchet and set it in my lap and keep an eye in the woods what little bit I could with how thick it was, thinking it was at worst a coyote or black bear. About 30 uneasy minutes pass, never really feeling the eyes leave me. Then suddenly the air was thinned and everything felt normal. About 10 more minutes pass, and I hear a loud skittering and then a thud coming from the direction of the old pine grove. Thinking one of the drunks out there had gotten out and fell, I got up and make my way over to the bank, past the little shed into the old growth, scanning back and forth with my light mounted to the hard hat, when it happened. In the very edge of the light was a pale humanoid figure on all fours. Its eyes darted to mine. We locked eyes, it being in the edge of the light. I didn't get a good look, but I froze in complete terror, knowing that if I turn my back to it and run, it might react like a cougar and pounce. I readied the hatchet to defend myself and took a step back. It took one equal in distance to mine towards me. This continued down the bank, it stopping 
at the top to gaze down at me. Without taking my eyes off it, or turning my back to it, I turned on the four-wheeler, angled the lights to it, and after I do that, I packed my stuff, not turning my back, and hopped on. I floored the four-wheeler at it, making it back up and tore down the road to the left, hitting 30 to 40 down the road I normally take at 15. I look over my shoulder and see this thing running on all fours beside me. This went on for about half a mile until it stopped, crawled into the middle of the road and watched me drive off. I get to camp as fast as I possibly can, load up my weapon in the corner of my room and don't dare sleep that night. The moral of the story, don't turn your back and run from the unknown unless they come at you first and never go catfishing alone. The details I have on this story are very vague, but someone told me about a teenager who went into the Akala National Forest to hike and then was reported missing several days later when he didn't return home. A couple of months later, he was found in the woods and he was like a different person. He appeared to be either drunk or under the influence, but when he was tested, everything came back negative. Mentally, he wasn't all there, but physically wasn't showing any signs of being exposed to anything which would cause this. He kept telling people that he encountered something very strange. It was several months before he was himself again, and he had very little memory of what had happened all those days. I've asked people that I know who live in Akala, or have camped and hiked in the Akala National Forest, and they'd never heard of this story. I really didn't know if this person who told me this story knew if it was true or not. Sounds like it might be true and strange, and weird things have happened in state and national parks. But I do know that over the years, people have gone into the Akala National Forest and never come out. Some of them were harmed or killed by animals. Others had their lives ended abruptly by other humans. And some just vanished without a trace. I've driven through the forest on State Highway 40. And at night, it's creepy. Even in the day, at times. This particular event happened to me when I was around 10 or 11 years old. But I have been visiting my grandma's cabin in Big Bear Lake several times a year since I was a child. This isn't the first strange event to happen to me there, but it is definitely the most memorable. A little backstory. My grandma's cabin sits at the end of a cul-de-sac, right at the edge of a vast, mostly unpopulated stretch of forest. No matter what I do or how I'm feeling, I always have a very strong sensation that I'm being watched when I'm in many of the rooms in the cabin alone, day or night. I've seen shadow creatures many times in the cabin, have heard strange knocking, whispers, and just generally feel like there is something else living there with us. My grandma has told me of similar experiences and has warned me before that if I ever get a strange feeling when I'm walking in the forest to go home immediately, but she never elaborated. Anyway, me and my dad and uncle were walking on a trail that we've been on hundreds of times before. When we reached the first peak of hill that we usually like to stop and look out at the view from, my dad and uncle wanted to keep hiking for a bit, but I decided to go back to the cabin on my own as it was only five to 10 minutes away. I head down the usual path that I go on, not too thinking much about it, when I realize I have no idea where I am. Everything looked the same as usual, but something was wrong. The normal path was different in a way I can't really explain. It seemed to be 10 times as long as usual. Everything was silent, and there was absolutely no wildlife about, not even a squirrel. I kept having all of these morbid thoughts coming into my head about how I was lost forever, or some sort of creature was going to swoop me up. Every 10 or so minutes, 
I ended up at a part of the trail that I definitely recognized, only to be in a completely alien area moments later. The path kept winding and winding downhill, and the sun was setting pretty rapidly. I had to have been walking in the direction of the cabin for more than an hour because I remember I kept checking my watch and panicking. At this point, I just accepted that I was lost. I finally made it down to the street and was relieved to be able to orient myself, but I was only one street away from the cabin, although I should have been much further away. I was expecting my father and uncle to be home by now and for my parents to be worried about me being gone for so long, but instead, my mother asked me why I was home so soon. I asked my dad how long they were out there, but they said that they'd only walked maybe 15 minutes longer from when I left them. I don't know if I'm just reading too much into this, and if I were a kid with different perceptions, but something definitely felt very off about that entire ordeal. I was 12 or so at the time. Some friends of mine were in Girl Scouts and invited me to join them for a sleepover at this old tuberculosis sanitarium in Marin, just north of San Francisco. At the time, 50 years ago now, the building was not in the best of conditions. There was an old caretaker's cabin and some outbuildings. My friend and I wandered about that first day there. Saturday and, well, we weren't the best behaved little monsters. In spite of the locked doors, we crawled through a window into the caretaker's cabin and explored in there. My friend went upstairs and I stayed down as a sentry. Already nervous, I was even more jumpy when I heard someone coming up the stairs, but it wasn't my girlfriend. There was no one there, at least visibly. Fast forward to that evening. In an attempt to go to sleep, we were overtaken by giggles. Hey, we were little girls. One of the counselors separated us so the other girls could sleep. I was placed in a bed in this sunroom. It was an enclosed room, but with windows on three walls. The wall I was facing when I woke up had a set of French doors and a balcony. Early, before anyone else was awake, I watched a woman with an old-fashioned dress and parasol walk across that balcony and descend down the stairs. I just figured it was one of the counsellors, rolled over and went back to sleep. Later in the morning, after getting up and dressed, my friends and I explored that balcony, and there were no stairs. Strange. We explored the wooded acreage all around the old sanitarium, and off we went back home. It was only a few years ago I decided to do some research and learnt that many have seen the apparitions at the facility, so I wasn't just imagining things. One time, me and two other friends from Miami went home to my home in Kansas to visit my grandmother because she wasn't doing well. She passed later that month, and one night, me and my friend went out on a drive while my other friend stayed with my grandma to check on her every once in a while. Me and my friend had went to go out. I don't remember to get what exactly, probably milk. We'd taken a wrong turn. At this part, it almost seemed like out of a movie. Our radio stopped working. It was about 10 p.m., and we were in the middle of a random dirt road in nowhere, Kansas. Me and my friend get out the car to see our surroundings because there wasn't service and after about five minutes of being outside the car, we see a very large deer jumping around in the field to our right side. I get my buddy to look at the deer and he sees it. It was maybe 50 yards away from us, about half a football field. The deer seen us too. It all goes silent. The deer starts to let out this loud scream that almost sounds like an elk, but a lot more human-like, which goes on for 15 seconds. And in the middle of it, he starts to stand on his two legs and runs at us. We get back in the car so quickly and drive away as fast as we can. And I remember distinctly that sometime in the middle of our panic, 
our radio starts to come on and it's playing a ward tour by a tribe called Quest. It was one of my favourite songs, but now I can't listen to it without remembering that scene. We came straight home, and I pulled my friend to the side, and me and my other friend tell him the story of what had happened, and throughout the whole time, he thought we were lying. I think at some point he started to believe the story, but it was by far the creepiest thing I had ever seen. I just can't begin to describe how it was at least nine foot tall and running like a human on two legs. Such a distinctive scream. This happened over a year ago now, when I was 17. I quite often get the train into London to visit my boyfriend. I go up on the Friday or Saturday and come back Sunday evening. My parents always told me, and quite rightly, to try and get an early train home on Sunday, in order to avoid traveling late by myself. But me being naive and stupid, always accidentally missed the earlier trains, in order to spend time with my boyfriend. This particular Sunday, I was getting a train that got into the station where I lived at around 9pm. My station is the last stop on the line, and where the train terminates, so by the end of the journey, it is always relatively empty. Sometimes I'm the only one getting off aside from the guard. Usually I would just put in noise cancelling headphones, settle down and zone out of whatever was happening around me. I'm quite an anxious traveller, so blocking out the sound helps me relax. I also try and sit at the end of a carriage where there aren't as many people as having lots of people around can make me more susceptible to anxiety attacks. After this evening, I always made sure to sit near people. I'm sitting with my headphones on, tucked away with my suitcase in the footwell of the seat next to me, and a pair of seats next to a window sitting in the window seat. When I notice a man stumble into the seats adjacent to mine across the aisle, he leans across the seats, looks directly at me, and mumbles something to me. He was wearing all black, a massive black coat, and had a big duffel bag. I'm a little anxious because I'm not the biggest fan of talking to strangers. I take off my headphones and politely ask him to repeat himself. His speech is slurred, making what he is saying completely incoherent, but after he's repeating himself several times, I realise he's asking if I know if there are any taxi companies at my station. I say no, sorry, and put my headphones back in. He leans over again and asks me the same question. I take my headphones off and give him the same reply. No, I don't know of any. Sorry. He says something else. I ask him to repeat himself because his speech is so slurred I can't understand him. This strange conversation persists for about 20 minutes. I can't understand much of what he is saying. He is sort of half mumbling, half speaking, and he's not really making much sense. He keeps asking me how I'm getting home and where I live. I just say by car and don't say anything about where I live. I'm super nervous now because this guy just gave me the creeps. I had a feeling something bad was going to happen, and he's starting to make me feel uncomfortable. There was just this vibe about him, that he was bad news. He then asks me if I'm going to call the police on him, and I say no, and he starts mumbling and swearing profusely, saying something about beating my brains in. And at this point, I'm really starting to freak out. All of a sudden, he moves across the aisle to sit in the seat next to mine, trapping me in my seat. I can't escape. I'm sitting next to the window, and he's completely blocking the aisle. I'd have to awkwardly climb over him in order to leave. I've decided he must be high or drunk, because his eyes look absolutely crazed, and his speech is so slurred. He tells me that I'm very beautiful, and asks if I have a boyfriend, moving closer until I could feel his breath on my face. 
I look around to see if there's anyone in the carriage with me, but I can't see anyone. He leans in really close, and I'm freaking out now. But luckily, the train guard comes through from the next carriage, sees me looking very scared, and comes over to ask if everything's okay. Immediately, the sky's demeanor changes. He leans away from me, and he waves his hand as if to say nothing is wrong. I say yes, everything is okay. But by the look on the face of the guard, he can tell I'm super uncomfortable. The guard makes small talk with the guy, and then moves to stand by the door behind us. I don't know what to do. Even though the guard is behind me, I still feel really unsafe, and now I have to get away from this guy. I ask the guy if he would please move back to his seat, and say I don't want to talk to him as he's making me feel uncomfortable. He moves back and starts muttering and swearing again, mumbling half-formed threats under his breath. I call my dad, who's picking me up, and when he answers the phone, I immediately say, "Hey, dad." The guy looks at me and says, "I'm sorry. I didn't know you had a dad." He tries to talk to me while I'm on the phone. He's talking over me the whole time, but I can't actually make out his words. I have no idea how to try and communicate with my dad that I'm not feeling safe, and this weirdo is talking to me without him overhearing. The train is pulling into the final stop, so I pull my suitcase out of the footwell and try to make a quick exit from the train. The guy gets up very fast. And goes in front of me, grabs my suitcase, and takes it off the train, to presumably steal it. I still had my hand on it and managed to pull it back out of his hands. He gets off the train quickly, and I stand next to the guard for a few minutes because I didn't want to get off the train at the exact same time as this guy. The guard asks if I'm all right, and I burst into tears. I'm already anxious and tired. And this may seem like something insignificant, but I suffer with really bad anxiety, and it really creeped me out. A lady comes over. I don't know how she knew I was crying about what happened with this guy, but she must have seen him getting off the train. She says he was asking her about taxis and making her feel uncomfortable, until she told him to ask someone else. She apologized for sending him my way. And they both offered to walk me to my car. Luckily, my dad is sitting in the parking lot, and I get in the car safe and sound. There's no sign of where the guy on the train went, and I wish the story would stop there. We make it to a small supermarket on the way home, and usually, my dad would send me in to get whatever we needed. But because I'm still upset from the train, I sit in the car. In the deserted parking lot, as soon as my dad enters the supermarket, a car pulls up on the other side of the lot. I see the same guy from the train in the passenger seat, and my blood runs cold. The car he's in isn't a taxi either, which I found strange, as that's what he was originally asking me about. I sink down in the car seat a bit, hoping he doesn't see me. But it's like he already knows I'm in the car. He starts pointing at me and talking to the driver. They get out of the car and start walking through the lot towards my car. I immediately lock the doors. My phone is in my bag, which is in the boot. So all I can do is sit there and pray my dad is going to come back at any moment. They've nearly made it to the car when my dad gets back. He was only going in for bread, and they see him. And start walking immediately in the other direction towards the supermarket. I yell at my dad to get in the car. I'm crying so hard, and by the time my dad has got into the driver's seat, the men are nowhere to be seen. I manage to calm down enough to tell my dad between sobs about how the guy from the train was in the parking lot in the car with someone else, and that they were walking towards me. I point at the car they were in. And my dad doesn't say much, and just starts driving home. When we get home, and my mum has managed to calm me down a bit, my dad tells me he noticed the same car driving behind us when we left the station, 
meaning they must have followed us from the station to the supermarket. I felt really embarrassed, like I was overreacting and making a fuss over nothing, because I'm just oversensitive with bad anxiety. When the guy started talking to me on the train, I felt physically sick and just had this overwhelming feeling that something bad was gonna happen. Even though I have anxiety, I don't usually get these feelings just from speaking to a stranger. But come on, this behavior isn't normal. And I'm pretty sure those guys had far darker intentions for me than we originally thought. I grew up for the most part in an Australian city, but lived with my grandmother in a small country town in rural Australia for a while. This town was about a 25 minute drive away from a larger country town that we did all our major shopping in once a week or so. We go into this town to do some clothes shopping and pull up into the shopping center car park which directly connected to the entrance of the center with the closest car park only a few meters away from the entryway. 10 meters from that entrance, there was another entryway to a standalone store. The store was quite large with many aisles and the cash registers right near the entrance on the left side of the door. We'd finished our shopping in the main center and had gone into the other store to do some shopping. And my grandmother noticed a man who would come in not long after us and was floating around the entrance, looking in very suspiciously. We were in an aisle about 10 meters from where he was and me being the young oblivious kid I was didn't notice him and just continued to look at different shirts for sale. I moved further up the aisle and every step that I took closer to the end, he inched a little closer towards us. I didn't notice this, but I remember my grandmother walking up to me and putting her arm around my shoulder and telling me to stay right next to her. I remember looking at an item and asking my grandmother how much it was as I couldn't see a price tag. So I asked if I could go ask the cashier. She reluctantly agreed, but told me to walk straight to the counter and back. As I walked to the counter, he moved even closer to me. It was just left of the door, perhaps five meters from the guy. And I'm guessing he thought I was walking towards the exit. As I only changed my direction right as I got to the counter, all of a sudden, he grabbed me by my left arm and tried to pull me towards him. But as I just changed direction towards the counter, he wasn't able to get a good enough grip of me and I pulled away quickly. He looked so startled and shocked that he just ran straight out the door and into a car just outside and pulled away. That was it. No number plate, no police, no nothing. My grandma grabbed me and we left. I can't help but think, what if this wasn't his first time? What if he succeeded after me? Or if I'd heard stories of children going missing before and after that, that he was responsible for? Did he spot me while we were shopping earlier and wait for the best opportunity to try it? I hate to think, what could have happened and what may have happened after that day. But creepy guy, I now have a baseball bat and I hope to not meet you again. The first real paranormal experience I had was when I was 24 years old and the year was 2002. My husband and I were living in a rental house that we moved into in late October of 2001. The house always gave me that weird feeling that I was being watched. I was working a part-time job four hours a day, Monday through Friday, and I would get off work around 1.30 p.m. 
My husband worked a full-time position with his hours all over the place. You could say that I was home alone a lot. We had a German Shepherd chocolate Labrador mix named Bear Claw. He was a smart dog and very happy and always by my husband or my side. Let me explain the layout of the house before I continue with the story. When you walk into the living room, there was a bedroom off to the left. Straight ahead is the dining room. The second bedroom is also to the left in the dining room. And we had a Jack and Jill bathroom between the two bedrooms. Off the dining room is the kitchen and through the kitchen was a family room with a sliding door and to the backyard and a half bath. The whole house was a hardwood floor with a crawl space underneath the house. There were no carpets in the house except for the family room. So you had to walk across the floor and you can hear footsteps and the floor would creak because it's uneven. Bechtel loved being outside, but when he was in the house, he would never leave the family room. Bechtel would stand at the doorway watching me in the living room and cry when I was alone in the house, but he wouldn't cry when my husband was there. I had a hard time walking through the kitchen. The air was heavy in there and my skin would crawl. It got to the point that when my husband left for work, I would walk to my mother's and father's house, which was three blocks away. Skipping to March 2002, it was late. My husband and I were asleep in a full-size bed. It was small and cramped, but my husband and I loved to cuddle, so we were okay with it. It's also essential to know that we had no bed frame, so the box spring and mattress sat on the floor. We had a duck lamp that gave off a strange orange glow that I used for a nightlight, because I've always been afraid of the dark. It was a hot night and I could not sleep because of the heat. I would take my blanket off too to cool down, but then it got too cold, so I covered it back up. It was too hot to cuddle. My husband and I were both lying on our backs, shoulder to shoulder, him fast asleep, which I found odd as my husband does not take heat well. I finally got to the point that I just stuck my left foot out and handed over the covers and hung them on both ends of the bed. My body temperature was just starting to stabilize and I felt I could finally go to sleep. I closed my eyes and as I do, I hear someone step into the room with a loud creak sound. My heart jumped to my throat. I tried to open my eyes to see who came into the room and to my surprise, I couldn't open them. I didn't understand what was going on. Just then, I felt a large skinny cold hand grabbed my ankle and then my wrist I went to yell for my husband, but I could only scream in my head. My heart was beating faster and I was being pulled off the bed. I then went to grab my left wrist and whoever had a hold of it, but I couldn't move my arm. I kept trying to call for my husband and trying to move my right hand. And finally my right hand moved and grabbed my left wrist, but there was no one grabbing me. Then my eyes pop open and there was no one there. And I was partially off the bed. I crawled back onto the bed and under the covers. I got so close to my husband that I'm nearly laying on him, but I was so scared I didn't go to sleep till the next morning sun shined through the bedroom windows. When I finally got up next day, I told my husband what happened to me. He said that he thought he felt me being pulled away slowly, like from him, like I was being dragged. Then he felt me put my arm around him. In the following weeks, I found a thing called sleep paralysis. You know, that frightening state that a person finds themselves in when they're unable to move. It's due to an irregularity in passing between sleep stages and wakefulness. I then asked him how this could be sleep paralysis if I found myself partially pulled off the bed. I could still feel the hands around my wrists and ankles the following next few days. He pulled out a book about supernatural creatures and read me one about a beast called the night hag or the old hag. A short explanation is a supernatural creature that's used to explain sleep paralysis. The phenomenon happens to a sleeping person who's on their back. The person feels a presence and the person can't move and then they feel the person sitting on their chest and they can't breathe or they feel the creature sit on the foot of the bed. I don't know if that was it, but I know that it wasn't sleep paralysis. Since that day, I've seen and heard things that others can't. 
a few weeks after that night, I found out I was pregnant with our first child. I thought just maybe whatever it was, wanted my unborn baby. To this day, when I think about that night, I can still feel two large, thin, cold hands on my wrists and ankles, like it's a mark that was given to me that opens the doors to the supernatural. I just wish I could give it back. My sweet little grandparents are essentially my parents. They raised me most of my life and gave me everything. My family is fairly international, and my grandparents would often take trips out of the US to go to visit various family members. I would go with them often when I was younger, but as I got older and they retired, they would occasionally go on trips without me while I was still in high school. On this occasion, they had left to go to the UK for two weeks. I was 17 at the time, and they deemed me old enough to stay home alone for the last week of school and first week of summer vacation. We lived in a nice house in the more suburban area of our city, in a gated community. The neighbors knew I would be alone and thus had emergency keys to our place, as well as being on call if I should need anything. Our house had an alarm system which was great at first and did help us feel very safe and secure as we slept or if we were away. Before they left, the alarm had been set off a few times in the night, but it was not only for the doors, but the windows as well. And I believe it even had a motion detector for the last room and kitchen areas, as none of us tended to wander into those areas at night when the alarm was set. A few times it went off, we couldn't tell what had tripped it, and concluded that maybe a bird had knocked into the window and set it off. None of us were particularly concerned about it. My grandparents left for their trip, and per the usual when they were gone, I would sleep in their bedroom as it was closer to the alarm pad, had a phone in the room for emergencies and was also closer to the laundry room, where we tucked our two small pups into sleep every night. It just made me feel more secure since I was still a little wary of being alone at night. The second night I was alone, the alarm was tripped at about 2 a.m. It wasn't a school night, so I was up watching TV, but when it went off, nothing sounded like it had been broken or open, and the dogs weren't barking at all. So I stayed on the phone with the alarm company while I checked everything out. It was also a freakishly loud alarm. So the husband of one of my neighbors ran over and cleared the house with me. We concluded another bird had hit the window somewhere. So even though nothing was found, I reluctantly went back to bed and slept without incident. A week passed with no further issues. I had friends over the next Friday a few days before my grandparents were sent to return. We swam, indulged in a little wine, and played rock band until the wee hours of the morning. I saw everyone off, cleaned the house until about 3 a.m., and passed out in bed. It should be noted that I slept with the bedroom door locked, and all the lights off except in the foyer and entryway. I woke up in panic at around 4.30, the alarm is going off, and the dogs were going absolutely bonkers behind the laundry room door. Most disturbingly, one of the lights in the master bathroom was turned on. I had a single glass of wine, and I knew I hadn't woken up to use the bathroom because I noticed just how badly I had to pee when this was all happening. It was odd too because the specific light had come on, and we rarely used it. It lit up the big jacuzzi tub in the corner of the master bathroom, and different from all the rest of the normal sized light switches on the panel, it was a small sideways switch underneath the rest. The alarm company called me. I was terrified this time, so I grabbed the phone and hid under the bed. They asked me if I was okay, and relayed that the motion detectors in the living room were going off. Someone was inside the house. It seemed like hours went by, though it was mere minutes, before I heard my neighbor unlocking the front door. He came in, found me, 
and cleared the house with me. No one was inside, and no one would have been able to get out while I waited by the front door. The rest of the doors were locked, no windows were open and nothing had been smashed. He even checked the attic, though it had a minimal crawl space, and we would have heard the ladder creaking loudly as it had been pulled down and back up, so we knew no one hid there. I ended up spending the next few nights until my grandparents returned with the neighbors and their kids who I frequently babysat. After that night, I felt the strangest heaviness in the house for weeks. It was oppressive and even my deeply religious grandparents noted how the feel of the house was just off. I never saw anything, never heard noises after that, but the house felt dark and heavy for weeks. To this day, the thought of that night still freaks me out. Eventually, the house seemed to return to normal, but I never felt comfortable alone there after dark again. I still wonder what was inside that house that night. Back in 2007, I found myself working as a bartender at a now closed pub in my hometown. Not a job I particularly liked, but it paid the bills. At this time, they had hired a new kitchen manager that we all simply knew as Kearney. Kearney was a pleasant enough guy, mostly keeping to himself, but always stayed late to help the barman do our closing duties. So we all liked him for that. New in town, Kearney had yet to find a place of permanent residence and I had recently lost my tenants. So someone suggested he asked me. He was considerably older than the tenants I usually took in, but having a streak of bad luck with tenants my own age, I thought an older man with a nice steady job may be a shift in the right direction. So I agreed. Kearney wasted no time and followed me home that very same night. Only he wasn't alone. Enter Lawrence, the boyfriend of Kearney. Honestly, I hadn't even recognized he was gay up to that point, but was water off my back regardless. Looking back now, what really should have bothered me though was Lawrence's appearance. He looked like he had been sleeping on the streets, rather appropriately as I would find out later. Kearney moved in. Lawrence was there a lot too. And it was easy to know when due to his mobile ringtone sounding like the quacking of a duck. Kearney had some habits that were rather noteworthy to this story. In particular, he basically never closed his bedroom door, no matter what he was doing in there. It was always open. And although he was a heavy smoker, he never once smoked inside the house. After Kearney had been living there for about two weeks, I had come down with an awful case of pink eye. This being highly contagious, I was given leave of absence from my bartending job and therefore decided to go wait it out at my sister's for a few days. Apparently, I didn't mind giving it to her. The day my sister was scheduled to come pick me up, I took a casual stroll into the bar that myself and Ben, a good friend from high school, at the time, co-worker, had been building in my house and something caught my eye. All our liquor bottles were completely empty. Now, those who had been frequenting my house at the time would know that we weren't just talking about one or two bottles of brandy here, but bottles of whiskey, gin, vodka, snaps, liqueurs. Basically, it was a fully stocked bar that could host pretty big parties without requiring much in the way of additions. So I called Kearney, asking him what he knew about this receiving feedback that Lawrence and he had been on a slight drinking binge. Those were the actual words he used and had left me both furious about the thousands worth of stock they had drunk out, but also slightly impressed that he was actually still alive. Regardless, I said that I would be dealing with this upon my return. So I'm with my sister for a few days and on Friday, I get a call from my local police department asking me if I know Conrad Schultz. Ironically, even though I didn't, they finally add that I will probably know him as Kearney and that I should probably come down to the station. 
as I had just arrested his boyfriend, trying to sell my camera equipment. So my sister rushes me back home where all my camera equipment was on display at the police station. It's on this visit that I'm informed that Lawrence was actually a Navy SEAL, who got dishonorably discharged before turning to a life of crime, and now had a rap sheet the length of the Bible. The kicker was that both he and Kearney were actually homeless men who had met at the Salvation Army. So Lawrence is in jail, and my sister drops me off at home more or less at the same time that Kearney gets home as well. Based on Kearney's accounts of what happened, he had turned Lawrence in himself, as he couldn't allow Lawrence to do what he was trying to do. Although I had appreciated his sacrifice, I still told Kearney that he would have to go, having been the overall cause of this. However, not wanting to leave the homeless man, well, homeless, I gave him until the end of the month to make another arrangement. Monday comes, and after having completing staff meetings, I walk home to encounter a very much free Lawrence sitting on the sidewalk across my house watching it. I confront Lawrence as to why he's there, and he tries to apologize before begging for money. Rather out of character, really. I dismissed him without giving him a cent. Now, I go back to the previous night. See, I had mentioned the staff meeting for a reason as it was at this meeting where we had gotten a rather sizable list of liquor bottles that had gone missing from the storeroom, leaving us all suspecting each other. I, however, would not have to wait long to figure out who the real culprit was, as a few days later, I opened the garbage bin in my kitchen to see the missing bottles all empty and staring back at me. I decided to sit on this information for the time being, although I did photograph it all just in case as I needed it for evidence later. I'd also called over Ben to inform him of the developments, as this was quickly becoming a detective game. We decided to enter Kearney's room to search for further evidence. Nothing of vast significance in there, with one exception, two single photographs of Lawrence. Before he had turned into the homeless version of Lex Luthor, actually, there were several of Lawrence things still there. But as Lawrence had spent a lot of time there before the incident, I accepted this as normal. Now I should also add that I had mentioned Lawrence's release to Kearney, and had told him that if I even suspected that they were still seeing each other, I would throw him out of the house myself. Only a few days would pass before this came into play. On this particular night, I had been bartending again, and Kearney had constantly been stopping by the bar to help himself to draft glasses half full of wine and half full of coke, which he would go drink outside the restaurant. We confronted him about this, but as he correctly pointed out, he was still a manager and we had no right to tell him what he could or couldn't do. On his fourth trip, however, I had grown suspicious and decided to follow him outside where I encountered Lawrence sitting out sharing the half coke, half wine concoction. This annoyed me. So the next day I returned to the restaurant with photographic evidence that I handed over to the general manager, who was also a friend of mine. Although I hadn't physically seen it, I had heard the confrontation through the office door when he fired Kearney. Kearney left obviously upset, and apparently had no idea that I had been the one who turned him in. So we had closed early that night and I was walking home, going past the high school. I saw Kearney coming from the opposite direction. He walked past me, literally only saying two words, I'm scared, before disappearing into the darkness. That would be the last time that I would ever physically lay my eyes on Comrade Schultz. So we reached the final week before Kearney's eviction was to take place. Ben had come to stay with me for that duration, as we both wanted to monitor the situation and make sure nothing else happened. It was in this week that Kearney's behavior suddenly changed. He was constantly smoking in his room, and his door was closed 24-7. In fact, neither Ben nor I had caught so much of as a peak of him in that entire week, which we hadn't thought much of at the time. The day of Kearney's eviction comes around, Ben had got home for a few hours, 
and I finally hear Kearney's bedroom door open. Someone walks out the room, opens the front door and leaves. I follow him outside, but somehow he's already completely vanished. What was left, though, were his house keys, indicating he obviously wasn't planning on returning. I look at the keys and notice something strange. Although the correct keys were on the keychain, there were also several that weren't mine. Why would he leave me all the wrong keys? His room was a shock, not because of the state it was in. The two had broken his bed in an act of wild monkiness, but I had already known about that. As I said, he never closed his doors. But more than that, he had literally left almost all his belongings behind, with one exception, the two photos of Lawrence. Upon further investigation, I suddenly realized that all traces of Lawrence ever being there had completely vanished, with all of Kearney's stuff left behind. There was one thing of Lawrence's left behind though, his duckling ringtone, which it turned out hadn't so much been a ringtone as an actual duckling, which now strolled around casually in the vacant bedroom. We called him Neville. So Ben returned and gets updated about the developments, both of us thinking the way he left was rather weird, of course. And the whole thing had been very strange. It was only when I asked the infamous question that this all becomes a conspiracy theory. Did you ever actually see Kearney in this week? It was to our shock that we realized neither of us had and suddenly started putting puzzle pieces together. The changing habits, Neville the duck, the wrong keys, only Lawrence's stuff being gone. It was to great discomfort that we both asked the question, who had really been living in our house this last week? During the last few days, Ben and I went on a mission, searching the town, crawling into drainpipes, trying to find any trace of Kearney's whereabouts, but they all added up to nothing. Comrade Schultz had simply vanished off the face of the earth. This wasn't the case with Lawrence though. He was still around, having made some new homeless friends. We encountered him several times, begging on the streets, and every time I asked him, where's Kearney? But he just acted like he'd never heard of him. The last time I would see Lawrence was across from work attempting to break into a car. I called the police on him and they arrived rather quickly, arresting him on the spot. While he was being led away by police, I shouted at him one last time, where's Kearney Lawrence? But he ignored me and let the cops drag him away. The next day I filed a missing persons report as I thought Kearney was missing and suggested that Lawrence may know something about it, but never came of it. So Lawrence, I don't know if you did something to Kearney or not, but if you did, let's not meet again. For those of you wondering what happened to Neville the Duck, we kept him for quite a while, but due to the malnourishment he received his first few months, he never grew and ultimately passed away. For those of you wondering what happened to the case, unfortunately, South Africa has a very unique way of closing cases, as in after a month or two, they just send you a text saying, case closed due to lack of evidence or case closed with no arrests. I didn't get one in this case, but did get one in an armed robbery I fell victim to in 2017. So not too helpful that they did much effort here. Regarding Lawrence, I saw him one more time after getting arrested. He was only locked up for about a week. After that though, he disappeared. I'm not sure if he left town or got arrested again. For the first two years after graduating nursing school, I have worked in this nursing home. The things I have experienced at my night shifts have made me believe in the paranormal. I will share my experiences with you some are about patients that have recently passed, and a story about a poltergeist taunting me at work. Background. The nursing home itself is only 20 years old and quite modern. There is a large tree yard with all kinds of fruit trees, and there are some water surrounding the property. The nursing home 
houses about a hundred patients. All of these patients have dementia in the later stages of the disease. Because of this, many of the patients pass within the nursing home. Our job as caretakers is to make their lives as enjoyable as possible and bring comfort in the last stages of their lives. An older male patient of my ward developed pneumonia and passed within a week. This man was not able to speak much more. The only things he would say is, who can help me in a very distinct voice. Five days later, I had my first of four night shifts. A message appeared on my pager that a sensor detected movement in another room at the end of the hallway. When I went to take care of the patient that probably needed a pee, I walked by the room of the deceased male. When I crossed his door, I heard him call in his distinct voice, who can help me? Not being able to think very fast, I planned to take looks at what's going on after I helped the patient from my pager. A few minutes later, I stood within the now empty door from which the deceased called out. Only then I remembered he was to be cremated the next day. Chills went down my spine as I realized. After this experience, I studied a bit more about the paranormal. Many of my more experienced night shift colleagues told me they were experiencing similar events. I also got told about a probable poltergeist who resided in another ward in a more abandoned room in the other ward. A few months went by and the occasional feeling of being followed occurred. I've also had an experience where the temperature around me would drop drastically and I would suddenly feel freezing. I later found out this could mean there was a ghost present. We had two house cats that were always fighting each other in the hallways. Besides that, they are sweet and cuddly pets who spend a lot of time being loved and petted by the patients. These cats would sit at the door of patients that were passing. They didn't make any noise, they just sat there waiting. Sometimes they even tried to sneak into the room of that patient just to sit on their beds. After a few months, I transferred to the ward with the probable poltergeist. The feeling of being watched continued frequently in this ward, and we had many more paranormal occurrences. When a patient passed, sometimes bed sensors would go off randomly in the rooms of these patients. This was frequent to happen after the patient passed and lasted until they were either buried or cremated, which usually happens a week later here in the Netherlands. My understanding and interest about the paranormal grew and the more I knew, the more obvious things would happen. Within a month, I experienced another situation like the first experience I described. A patient with a distinctive cry. She always cried due to illness. She shared a room with another female patient. When I went to check on the woman after the other one had passed, I was about to close the door to the room when the distinctive crying of the deceased woman filled the room. This went on for five seconds and then just stopped and the room was quiet again. Now, the poltergeist I mentioned, the room that he inhabits is number three, which has something to do with the evil spirits according to ghost adventures. The room was used in the times where the nursing home was full of patients to house the terminally ill, as lots of patients passed there. The room kind of fell out of commission when the demand for nursing home beds went down People that were passing could be nursed in their own home since there was no longer a waiting list for new patients. The poltergeist would follow me around the ward if I passed the room. When I got an uneasy feeling of being followed, I knew that it was there. Sometimes it would make my emotions go from really angry to being sad to the point I had to fight not to cry. Being a young male, this is abnormal for me. At some point, the center of that room would go off even when there was no one in that room and the sensor wasn't activated. I never had the guts to go into that room alone and always asked for backup. A lot of my regular night shift colleagues knew what went on in that room and would always be very helpful. 
Sometimes sounds like small knocks on the doors could be heard, all the walls, and I once heard something scratching inside the door. There was also a time I saw a figure standing in the window of room three. The figure had a human appearance, but was plain black. It really freaked me out. There was one colleague in particular that I would share my experiences with. She was paranormally gifted and could see ghosts and has the ghost of a small boy in her home. She told me the poltergeist couldn't do anything to me if I didn't let it. The tip she gave me was to speak to the entity and tell it not to bother me or to leave me alone. And for the most part, this did help. Around the time this happened a lot to the irregular night shift colleagues and they quit because of this. But using the tip I got from my colleague, the night shift became more relaxed to me and not being stressed out about this cheeky spirit. My theory is that when people pass, their spirits remain within the nursing home, mostly residing in their room or ward. Sometimes they might try to contact people by seeing something or making a noise. I don't really know. No one truly does. But after they tend to be buried or cremated, I feel like their spirits move on. This is something that happened to me in 2014, about two weeks after my dad passed away. I am a 39 year old female, originally from Miami, Florida and I've been living in the Hudson Valley area of New York for about six years, when in February of 2014, my 59 year old seemingly fit and seemingly healthy father was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer that had spread to his liver. I was devastated as being a registered nurse. I knew there was no hope. My dad decided to take the chemotherapy treatment against his better judgment because my mum, brother and myself were so distraught that we begged him to try as we prayed for a miracle. After seven months of feeling sick and making little to no progress as had been expected, my dad, mum and the doctor came to the decision my dad would be placed on a hospice and it was time for me to fly back home and spend my dad's last days with him at the house and surrounded by our large and supportive extended family. I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to tell my father how much I loved him and what a perfect father he had always been to me. Two days of being on hospice care, all around the clock morphine, my dad fell into an almost coma-like state where he would not open his eyes and barely moved. The next five days were full of anxiety, sadness and at times desperation. We didn't want to lose him, but we didn't want for him to suffer anymore. Finally, after seven days of being home on hospice, on a beautiful and sunny Miami day, my dad passed away surrounded by family. I was always extremely close to my dad, and at that moment, it was surreal for me. I let out the pain and emotions I had been keeping in for the past week, in the form of loud anguished sobs as I hugged his dead body and kissed his face and head. My dad was gone. About a week later, after ensuring my mum and younger brother were okay, as could be expected, I flew back to New York. As I had work and my children and husband needed me, I was in a fog of sadness and disbelief as I tried to get back to my routine. Two weeks after my dad's passing, I found myself in a dream where my mum and brother and I were walking in an indoor place with lots of people from different parts of the world walking around and talking to each other. There was a river that ran through the place and I and my mum and brother followed it until it reached a bend. And upon trying right to continue following it, my dad appears in front of us. He looked young, healthy and radiantly glowing. His beautiful green eyes were healthy again, so bright. And I yelled in absolute joy, Dad, I miss you so much. We hugged and then began to speak telepathically, not using words. It's a bit difficult to explain, but basically our communication was entirely through feelings and in our mind, but no words were exchanged. I simply understood what he was conveying to me and he understood me the same way. This is what he expressed to me. 
I don't look like this anymore. I came to you in this way so that you'd recognize me. I knew the family was all there, but I missed my brother. Tell Jay that not all of them are good and to not give his light to just anyone. It's important to understand here that my dad's brother was not present during my father's last two days because he was in prison and wasn't due to be released for at least another year. The two had grown up very close because they had been abandoned on the family farm in Cuba to be raised by relatives as my grandmother moved to Havana to start a new life. Regarding Jay, he's my little brother and my dad's youngest son. He had been doing drugs and spending time with bad people. And although we didn't know the extent of his involvement in this type of lifestyle, we knew he was potentially in danger. Although smart and spunky, Jay has always been kind hearted and sees the best in others. So he's an easy target for malicious people to take advantage of. After communicating with my dad for a bit, his late mother, my grandmother who passed away a year earlier, came into the dream with desperation and urgency. I didn't want to speak with her, but she insisted I had to listen because she had things to say to the family. I looked at my dad sadly, and he communicated that he could not stay and could not communicate with me anymore because she was there. Apparently she was stronger than him. He was gone. Despite her insistence and desperation, I didn't listen to my grandmother except to learn that she was trapped in a place and needed to move on. I did not try to help or listen further as my dad was gone. I woke up. I had an intense feeling that this was not a dream. And now five years later, I remember the dream vividly and the feeling that this was a real communication with my dad and unfortunately my grandmother. I believe my dad wanted to let me know he was okay. But I also got the feeling that he was very new in the place where he was and not yet strong enough to truly hold his own there. I believe he had an opportunity to speak with me and took it. I've had dreams of him in the last few years, but never one like that. I love and miss my dad every day. A few years ago, my boyfriend worked in a warehouse that was out in the middle of nowhere in between railroad tracks and the river. On one side of the warehouse, there was dense forest. He had gotten done at work around 8 p.m., right as the sun was setting. He was sitting outside waiting for his ride and talking to me on the phone. The conversation was normal until I heard his tone change. My boyfriend doesn't want to show much emotion at all, but I could instantly tell something was wrong. I asked what was going on and he explained that he thought he heard a baby crying from inside the woods. Now I probably would have second guessed and thought he was joking around because that's his personality. But the way he was talking, I could tell he was serious. The cries went on for a while and he said that they eventually turned into whales and it didn't sound like it was too far. He disconnected our call much to my dismay and sent me an audio recording of what he was hearing. Sure as hell it was the sound of a baby. He told me he was tempted to go into the woods and try to find the source of the sound and I begged him not to. Something didn't feel right. Thankfully his ride came to get him before he could step into the forest. I've heard these kind of stories before and many say that it's something or someone in the forest trying to lure people with the sounds of a baby crying, but I can't wrap my head around it. It honestly gives me chills when I think about it to this day. Even my boyfriend doesn't talk about it much because it genuinely freaked him out. I guess I'm just curious to see what you all make of it. My dad grew up on a forestry in Queensland, Australia, as the son of a forest ranger. My whole life, we've spent a lot of time out in that forest, camping and driving through parts of the forestry that only rangers would travel on occasionally. One place that my dad loved to take us was a little farm in the middle of the forest that was impossible to find unless you knew where it was. Locals knew the place as Spike's Hunt. Spike was a local farmer who had lived there for decades until the 90s and had a reputation for being abrasive, violent, bigoted, and not concerned with the laws of men. He had a habit of approaching guys in the bar who were wearing earrings and tearing them straight out. 
and there were a few stories about people who displeased him disappearing. Basically, Spike was not a nice guy, and his farm hut reflected that pretty well. Dad would take us out there every time we visited the forest, and the hut would be more and more dilapidated, but the vibe was always the same. That straight up feeling of being watched, even though Spike was long gone. As I got older, I became more aware of the signs of life in the place when we went to the visit. There would be 44 gallon drums full of smashed beer bottles, fire pits with reasonably fresh coals. Someone was definitely out there. God knows why, since the place was literally a snake pit at that point, but that didn't seem too concerned. One trip when I was a teenager, things got strange real quick. My friends and I were piled into my dad's four x four and were driving through the bushes to Spikes so dad could tell his scary Spike stories and freak us out. We drove onto the property and something immediately caught my eye. Up on the hill opposite Spike's hut, there were what appeared to be a cowboy slumped against a log, hat over his face taking a nap. Something about his body position looked unnatural and uncomfortable. It wasn't the way you'd sit if you were taking a casual nap in the middle of work. And even if it was, there was no reason for anyone to be out there. The farm was long defunct and there was no forest business to be taken care of by the property. I pointed it out to my dad and instead of letting us get out the car at Spikes, as he usually did, he said he wanted to keep driving through the farm to show us something. He maintained that it was nothing but that if the figure was still there when we came back, he'd stop and check it out. Of course, whatever he wanted to show us seemed totally made up as he drove us through the forest a bit. And when we came back, I spotted the slumped over cowboy again, not having moved an inch, still in the same unnatural position. I yelled out to dad to stop, reminding him of the promise, but instead he acted like he couldn't hear me locked the truck doors and drove off the farm faster than he'd ever driven on those dirt tracks before. My friends and I all looked at each other in confusion, but we all knew that when it came to this area, questioning my dad was futile and at best dangerous. My dad denied any of the events that day ever happening after that, but my friends and I were still curious about what was going on out there. So a few months later, we went camping on our own to see if we could find Spike's hut. It took hours of driving through the forest to find the gate to Spike's property, but eventually we found it without dad's help. Something was just off once we got there, more so than usual for that day. My mates jumped out the car, but were suddenly frozen, not wanting to walk any closer to the hut for no visible reason. The vibe was just wrong that day, and it felt like we had walked into something that didn't belong to us. The tug in my gut to get out was strong, but I'd spent two hours finding the place and I was gonna explore it. One of my friends acted brave and walked from the car to the hut with me, quietly acknowledging more and more signs of inhabitants with nods between us. We said nothing to the others, but were on high alert. It felt like someone could be back any minute or that they'd never left and were watching us as we poked around the debris. We walked up to the side of the hut to find a kind of small shed with three walls. And I heard my friend's voice go squeaky as he called me over to look inside. On the ground was a huge pile of ash from what looked like a cooking fire. And confirming this was the presence of a giant makeshift grill made from cross hatched wire sitting over the fire hinged on the shed wall. As I'm looking at this setup, I fear that whoever has been here has been hunting and cooking large chunks of their kill over the fire. Pretty clever, actually. But then my stomach dropped. As my eyes traveled down from the grill to the ground, I saw a baby sock. Tiny, pink, and terribly out of place. Then another. Then a shirt. A ribbon from a child's hair. All sitting right beside the ashes on the ground next to a woman's weekly Christmas cookbook. That's when the alarm bells in my head went off and I rounded up my mates to get out. 
some ranger or crazy old bushy hanging out at that trashed hut was one thing, but there was absolutely no reason for a baby to be out there. There's no way anything good could have come from having a child's clothes right under a huge fire and grill. When we got back to the campground, we couldn't shake the rotten feeling of being watched, and all of us were so unsettled that we packed up our stuff and decided not to stay the night. When I got home, I told my dad about it, and he just shook it off saying weird stuff happens out there. Being young and dumb, I never thought to look up missing persons in the area in an attempt to explain either the cowboy or the kid's clothes. But I can tell you, I will never make the mistake of going out to Spikes without my father again. It began in summer of 2013. When I got a divorce and had to move out of my home in the suburbs of Southern California, I met someone, my current husband, pretty soon after the divorce, and things moved quickly, as he asked me to move in with him and I accepted. He had just brought his dream cabin on a local mountain range, with an inheritance he received. We are in Southern California, and the mountain and lake are popular tourist destinations. At the time, I was struggling a lot. I had to quit my teaching job due to severe stress and had lost a substantial amount of weight and was barely weighing 100 pounds. Looking back, I was probably an easy target due to my vulnerable state. We moved that winter just in time for me to vacate my previous home that I had once shared with my ex. It had just stormed and there was ice and snow on the ground. The new house was really dark and just felt sad to me, especially on cold, snowy days. But it was a beautiful cabin that was on a long, private dirt road in the woods. The house was a larger chalet style home with dark wooden beams, bricks, and wood walls with a big old wood burning stove. Shortly after moving in, we found out that the lady that previously owned it was hit by a drunk driver and had to move into a care facility for the severely impaired, which kind of creeped us out a bit. I immediately realized I didn't quite like living in the mountains. The people in the town, especially our handful of neighbors, were really strange, paranoid and rough. There was just a negative energy there, especially in certain parts of the mountain. I was so in love with my then boyfriend though, that I wanted to make him happy and knew how much he loved it there. So I didn't say anything at first. The first time I noticed the negative energy was about a week after we moved in. We went for a hike towards early evening. We wanted to explore the miles of wilderness behind our home and were excited. As we walked further along, we saw old abandoned ranches and log cabins. There was even one area that had some evidence of witchcraft. There were many local legends of a satanic cult that referred to themselves as goat men. As we walked into a thickly wooded area, all the hair on my body suddenly stood up and I noticed an electric charge in the atmosphere, along with the sizable deafening silence. I tried to ignore this creepy feeling and kept walking. A few minutes later, my husband stopped in front of me and said he had just realized we weren't on the trail anymore. We looked back and sure enough, there was no trail in sight. The sun was now setting and the scenery was disorienting. After about an hour of trying to find our way home, I started to cry. It felt like we were going in circles and I was sure we would end up as missing people, but fortunately found a trail that led us back home. I think it was this day that something from the land attached itself to me. Soon after the incident in the woods, I started to feel oppressed by something very dark. I started doing things that was really out of character for me, like binge drinking and picking fights. I would almost go into a trance and from what my husband tells me, I'd run out into the forest and disappear for hours during fights, even late at night. I'd have no recollection of this. I only remember standing in front of our house late at night 
with cut up bare feet and being confused and disoriented. My husband would be upset and tell me he had been frantically looking for me for hours, but it never seemed to me as if any time had passed. I got a job working at a local church camp. I'm not super religious, but jobs up there are scarce. And I noticed that the only time I felt normal was while I was at work. I felt like I was having some kind of internal battle between good and evil. While I spiraled down at home, I got diagnosed with a severe illness that no doctor could really explain, was constantly in the hospital and put on heavy narcotics, which only aggravated my spiral downwards. We seemed to be having really bad luck too. For instance, one time my husband was driving in a really remote part of the mountain when his car broke down. So I jumped in my car to go fetch him when suddenly my car blew a gasket clean through the hood, which no mechanic had ever seen or could explain. I had to hitchhike to where my husband was and we had to tow both cars. My husband's car mechanically had nothing wrong with it at all. And it worked just fine after we towed it. Yet it would always break down periodically and always in a remote part of town with no cell service as we lived way off the beaten path deep in the woods. Something always seemed to go wrong. Just before things could go wrong, I'd get that creepy feeling with my hair where it stood on end and the feeling of electricity in the atmosphere. As things progressed one day after drinking and taking pills, I remember feeling pulled out into the forest. I went stumbling through the woods, sobbing and having an overwhelming urge to end myself. I kept thinking that this was the only way out. This was a common thing I started doing. And it was as if I was only in some kind of trance. I remember constantly feeling paralyzed with fear, sorrow and despair. I began to feel like my true self was gone and I couldn't get to her. I began to feel numb, regardless of how much I was unraveling at home. I still functioned at work and even managed to get a few promotions. I felt like I had two personalities. Around this time, weird things started happening in the house. It would start with electrical feelings, goosebumps, and then bam, all the lights and ceiling fans would turn on full blast on their own. I'd come home from work and think someone was in our house because all the lights would be on. One time I was sleeping and I could hear the remote control button for fan speed clicking on. And then all the lights turned on as well as the fans. I would get out of bed and yell, stop it, and hide the remotes for the fans and TVs but it started taunting me. It would turn on all the electronics late at night. If I lay down for a nap or any time I was laying in a room feeling depressed, it was like it knew that that would push me over the edge. Around this time, we felt an oppressive presence, like it was watching us sleep. It was only then that what had been causing these problems revealed itself to me. There was a small wooden door in our bedroom that led to the attic. And one night I had a nightmare that felt incredibly real of watching myself sleep from a different angle in the room when a pure black demon with tight black shiny skin, red eyes and a goat looking head and giant horns came out the door and was crouching down watching me sleep by my bedside while breathing what looked like smoke around my body. As it stood up and reached for me with its long pointy fingers, I suddenly woke up choking in a panic. I looked over and the attic door was open. Now that door was extremely hard to open and you had to really tug at it due to it not fitting quite right and running against the door frame. We always left it shut because it was cold, creepy and drafty up there. Terrifying. After that, I dreaded going to sleep and would often stay up all night drinking and descending into madness. No matter where I was, I always had the sensation of being watched, but I was too afraid to sleep, especially in our room. When all the electronics would turn on, when I'd get goosebumps, I knew the demon was near. It really scared me that I couldn't see it, but I knew what it looked like and I could feel its presence. 
Things at work eventually got weird too, and I could barely function. I felt like I was hanging on by a thread. I was an emotional wreck. And in heavy counseling, heavy drinking and pill popping, my relationship was on the rocks and I had become a regular at the bar and liquor stores. I was completely out of control and was beginning to get evil intrusive thoughts. One night I was in a rage and picked a fight with my husband. I don't remember it, but the next day when I was begging him for forgiveness, after he threatened to leave, he told me I didn't even look like myself, that my eyes and face looked dark and evil the previous night when we argued. Then he told me I had shoved and hit him, and my heart shattered to a million pieces. I'm not an angry or violent person at all normally. That broke me. I couldn't stop acting that way though, no matter how hard I tried. I hated myself. One night I got a friend from my hometown who also happens to have abilities. She told me the land there was bad and that she wouldn't go up to visit me and that I should consider moving home. She had a friend that also had moved up there after a divorce and experienced a similar oppression and fled home in the middle of the night taking only her animals. She'd seen something that she refuses to talk about. It clicked right then. Whatever was up there was evil and affecting me deeply. I broke down and begged my husband to leave. He's the type to do anything for me. So we both started job hunting in the town we wanted to move to and he listed the house for sale. The second I got hired, I threw some clothes and my dog in the car and never looked back. Luckily, our home sold pretty quickly because we priced it to sell ASAP. The dread lifted slowly and I made my way down the mountain and back into the city and I felt like I could breathe. I remember thinking how dark it always felt up there with all the trees. It felt suffocating. Within a month of moving away, I started to feel back to normal. At first, there was still some activity like the demonic dreams and one time being awoken by something that felt like a pillow hitting me with a crazy force across the face. But after I had a cleansing done by a Ricky master, it mostly stopped and I completely lost any desire to drink and switched medications to a non-narcotic. I've never been a drinker and to this day I have on average one or two beers a year. My personality went back to my happy, loving self. The dark thoughts seemed like a bizarre memory. My marriage is solid and we are like any boring couple. After months of moving, we did receive a call from the couple who purchased our home, asking if we ever noticed any weird or demonic activity in the home. They kind of just made it a joke. Ha, ah, never mind, we'll stick to our plan to get an exorcism done. I felt like there really was no point in telling them as it was never the home it was the land. It was like a horrible nightmare that creeps me out just sharing the story. I even avoid talking or thinking about it due to weird feelings it gives me. I feel like part of my soul is gone forever. I can never take it back. What I put my poor husband through. I'll never view things the same. I know there is real evil out there and it wanted my soul. This happened a number of years ago. I was walking with my two nephews, Richard and Jay. We were doing our normal route through the forest when we walked past a tree and saw some strange scratches on it. The thing is, we walk around here a lot and we'd never seen them before. They didn't appear to be human made or animal for that matter. We don't have any large animals where we live that could explain how they got there. We investigated a little bit and walked further. At least Richard and I walked further while Jay stood next to the tree. We turned around and at that moment heard a scream and Jay came running for his life towards us. There was a stick that had flown towards him that had been launched at his neck. We calmed him down, checked his neck and didn't see anything and walked towards the fence towards the back of the forest. 
we looked at the terrain when we saw a terrifying entity. It was all black, about two meters in length. Its legs, its arms, its fingers were longer than usual with these red glowing eyes. It was staring towards us. We were so scared we ran back to the beginning, went through the gate and just stood there for a few minutes. Jay said, my neck stinks. Richard and I checked his neck and saw something at the spot where he was struck. It looked like the number seven. We took a picture and after that, we spoke about what we saw. When we turned around, it was standing at the start of the forest, 20 meters between us. When the thing noticed that we had seen it, it vanished, running into the forest at inhuman speeds. We were so scared to go back in and went back to our tents. Richard and Jay told their mum what happened and she looked at Jay's neck. A scratch was still visible, but it was nearly gone. If anyone has ever experienced anything like this, I'd love to hear your story. Please, let me know. This happened to me about three years ago. I was around 15 and have lived in New York City for my entire life. And I like to think that I can handle myself in any situation because I'd seen it all. It was a Friday night and I was meeting my friend for a nine o'clock showing of some movie near Times Square. The subway we were on was only half full. I was sitting on the six train heading up to Times Square. I was wearing jeans and a t-shirt, which wasn't very revealing at all. No makeup and my hair was kind of a mess because I figured I was just gonna sit in a dark movie theater for a few hours with one of my best friends. And I didn't really care what other people thought. I was on my phone with my earbuds in and I noticed a guy across from me just staring at me with this blank expression on his face. I made eye contact with him, smiled politely and looked back at my phone because I was sitting right across from him and I thought he must have just zoned out. Five minutes later, I looked back and he was still staring at me, this time smiling a frankly creepy smile. I smiled again politely and looked back at my phone, hoping he got the hint and stopped staring at me. Two stops passed and he was still staring. Finally, the man stood up and I calmed down a bit. By now the train had gotten pretty crowded since we were approaching Times Square and there were people in front of me blocking the man from view. Next thing I know, however, the man was standing directly in front of me with the hand on the pole above me. I was getting pretty paranoid at this point, but the man was on his phone and I thought I was just exaggerating the situation and that I shouldn't overreact. My stop came. I excused myself, pushed past the man without looking at him and shoved my way through the doors. Even though I thought it was nothing at this point, I was still freaked out at the proximity of this man and his creepy gaze. And something just felt very wrong about the whole situation. So I booked it out of the subway car. I thought I heard a wait behind me, but I ignored it because it could have been anybody and kept speed walking. The 42nd Street station is pretty big and complicated and usually very well crowded. I considered it lucky it wasn't very crowded that day. And as I was a pretty skinny girl, I'm very used to dodging tourists in large crowds since I live in a very popular touristy area. I started weaving through the massive crowd faster than I had before. I stepped onto the first escalator, a bit less nervous, and pulled out my phone when a man walked up to me and stopped on the stair directly behind me. He was so close that I could feel him breathing down my neck, and I glanced behind me to see it was the same man from the subway. He had managed 
to catch up with me. I have no idea, but that was when I really started to freak out. At the top of the escalator, I broke into the fastest walk I've ever walked, trying to get out of there as fast as I could, without looking too distressed. I made it up a few flights of stairs, and out of the huge mob of people, and started to calm down, thinking again that I was definitely overreacting, and that I should just calm down because it was probably nothing. Soon enough, I found a small back exit that consisted of only one turnstile, and nearly no tourists, and for some reason, I thought that was the perfect place to go instead of somewhere where I would be protected by tons of people. As I was starting to walk up the stairs, I laughed at myself for overreacting at the man just looking at me on a packed subway, and someone grabbed my arm very tightly. I froze halfway up the stairs and whipped around. It was the man panting, squeezing my bicep like his life was depending on it. I was too shocked to say anything, and just stared him down. Hey, he said eventually, not taking my obvious fears into consideration. You're very beautiful. Thanks, I managed to say eventually, and tried to rip my arm from his grip, but he held on tighter. At this point, I was starting to panic. I looked around and found that because I'd chosen the quieter exit, it led to a pretty empty side street, and there were only a few people walking around. Can I have your number? Keep in mind that this man looks around 35, with a graying beard and nice business clothes on. While I wasn't short or young looking, I was very obviously a teenage girl. I stared at him. No. I wrenched my arm from his grip and started to walk up the stairs again, trying to stay calm. The man kept following me. And when I made it to the top step, he grabbed me again. Come on, sweetie, why not? You're so pretty. I said thanks again, because I guess I was just too polite not to but firmly shook my head and told him, no, you can't. Why not? He asked, because I'm 15. This was my attempt to give the man the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he thought I was 20 something and genuinely just wanted to give me his number, right? Instead, the man smiled the widest smile, his grip tightening. So, that's illegal. So? So no. I was thoroughly terrified at this point, and I pushed him off me and bolted out of there down towards the more populated area. Behind me, this man was shouting at me to come back, and that we could have a good time. But I just kept on running, and eventually lost him in the thick crowds of Times Square. Once or twice, I looked back, and the first few times I noticed his head popping up and down as he tried to shove past tourists, but I eventually lost him in the crowd. I made it safely to the movie, but took a huge detour to get there, so that I could stay in the streets crowded with people. Once there, I took the time to roll my sleeves up, and noticed the man had squeezed my arm so hard he had left light bruises on my bicep. I don't think that man's intentions were innocent, but what he was thinking chasing a clearly terrified young girl out of the subway. But I hope to never meet him or anyone like him again. I had recently gotten a job and had more money than I was used to having. So of course, being the fiscally irresponsible 18 year old I was, I was constantly online looking at Amazon and Groupons and just anything to spend my money on. I found a Groupon for a local pizza slash game place just outside of the county of OKC, kind of like a Dave and Buster's, but with a pizza and dessert buffet, among other party place food items. The food was right past the hostess counter on the left, and to the right was a room with chairs and booths and anything to eat at. Typical arcade eatery things. 
Walking past the food and dining area was the huge back area with the games and a small roller coaster. I went with my older sister, who didn't seem incredibly into the place, but was content to hang out with me and just spend time together. Looking back, if I had a license, I may not have gone with her, and I shudder to think what would have happened. After playing the games, we could and found interesting. She wanted to sit down and eat. We had gone on this simulated roller coaster ride with the double plastic seats and a screen in front of them, the kind that shakes and tilts and gives kids a good time without giving their parents a heart attack on a real roller coaster. She joined me for one of the simulated experiences and said that she felt sick from it. It's understandable since it's very jerky and our mum has vertigo, most likely passing it down to us. But I wanted to do the rest because it was the most fun we had since we went in. She said I could by myself, but she was gonna grab a plate and wait for me. I don't know what made me get back up, but as soon as she left, I really didn't want to be alone. I'd gotten lost before as a young child in a similar place, so I figured I was just being socially anxious and paranoid as normal. Even though nothing was wrong, I still didn't like being alone in public because I'm just over five feet, barely over a hundred pounds and look much, much younger. I got up, found her at the buffet, about to sit down and hurried to grab a plate and a slice of pizza and a few sweet things. Shortly after we sit down and start eating, a young woman sits next to me. And luckily for her, I'm on the passive end. And while I'm incredibly uncomfortable, I shift over to give her room, mostly just to distance myself from her because I always try to keep my boundaries and don't like people touching me. If she had tried that stuff on my sister, she would have not budged an inch and probably even bumped her off. If it wasn't weird enough, that this weird lady sat down next to me, she started acting like she knew us, saying stuff like, I can't believe you guys left me back there. I was calling you. Wow, Erin, why are you ditching us? All the while laughing like we tried to pull a joke on her and she saw through it. My sister looks at me. Do you know her? Even though she's 100% sure that I don't, she just wants to establish we aren't friends and maybe she mistook us for them in some way. I shake my head. Okay, who the hell are you, woman? I'm sorry, but we don't know you. Please sit elsewhere, my sister said. Her words polite, but in a matter of fact tone. I should also mention, my sister practically raised me because we had a single mum who, if she wasn't working to support us, was going out on dates to try and find Mr. Wright. So my sister is amazingly protective of me and an absolute rock star when it comes to weirdos trying to make me feel uncomfortable. And she knows of my social anxiety and boundary issues. So this whole situation is not okay. Don't be silly, we went to high school together, this woman says. Still trying to insist, we simply forgot her. This raises huge red flags for my sister because we moved around a lot from a young age and almost never stayed in the same place for over a year. Not to mention my sister attended high school in Hawaii, Oklahoma and Louisiana, and I attended the same school in Hawaii and a school in Missouri and two others in Oklahoma. We both attended the same high school a few years apart in a very small town, so small that even people in neighboring areas hadn't heard of it. The school that I uniquely went to was in a smallish town and I dropped out when I was 18 because they were racist and sexist amongst other things. I stay quiet, my sister getting annoyed. What was the name of the school? My sister asks, knowing she'll never say the name of the school we attended. Oh, you know, we went together. We even had a few classes. Don't you remember me? She said her name was Bunny and neither of us knew anyone personally with that name. No, I don't remember you. Which school was it so I can try and remember? My sister pressed and the woman kept saying that we should remember her and tried to avoid the question. My sister then got fed up. You need to leave. We don't know you, you're making us uncomfortable. And after a bit more of trying to convince us we were wrong, she got up, 
huffed off through the door that looked to be employees only. And I didn't get close enough to see if it was the case, but the bathrooms were on the other side and no one went near that door, save a few staff. It was a strange occurrence. We finished eating and considered telling the security guards, but since she was already gone and nothing actually happened, we shrugged it off and went home, not feeling like sticking around in case she was lingering. Writing this gave me horrible feelings looking back. If I'd been more independent and got my license and went alone, or if I'd have stayed at that ride and she pushed herself next to me and tries to force conversation, I would have been too awkward to say anything and might have let her go too far. What could her intentions have been? My sister feared she might be a scout for traffickers or something because she kept repeating the same lines and looking around. Perhaps she genuinely thought that we had gone to school together, but in that case, why could she not say the name? I think it's just too odd of a situation to completely discount the fact that it could have had a very nefarious intention behind it. Most days from seventh grade to senior year, when I walked home from school, I'd cut through a park. It has a track around it, which is just a two foot wide paved path. And on the other side, there's a church and a funeral home with their backs to the park. And on the other side, it's just woods. It was January of my sophomore year and we'd had a warm winter, so no snow, but plenty of rain. That made the little paved path so covered in puddles, it was impossible not to splash. And the grass was so soggy it make a squelching noise when you walked on it. No matter the weather or time of day, there's always at least one person jogging or something. I was part way down the path when I heard footsteps, like a man wearing heavy boots and a dog collar jingling very close behind me. I moved to the side so they could pass me, but no one did. I turned around and there was no one behind me. No one as far as you could see in any direction, not even any cars in the church or funeral parking lots. I thought that was weird, but I kept walking. I heard them behind me again as soon as I started up. So I stopped and turned around and the footsteps and jingling stopped. When I continued walking, so did it. This happened a few more times and I was starting to get nervous. And the fact that the person and dog were walking and didn't splash through any puddles was weirding me out. It was ankle deep water almost. They sounded so close too, like they were less than a foot behind me the whole time. Oddly enough, I didn't hear the dog's footsteps, just its collar. But after maybe the fourth time, I stopped. It sounded like the person had come to a stop right behind me. Then directly behind me, I heard a deep, low, unmistakable dog growl, which sounded like it was coming from maybe one and a half to two feet off the ground. Well, I didn't need to hear that twice, let me tell you. So I started running down the path, out the park, and the quarter of a mile home. I've never run so fast or run more than a few feet in my whole life, and I triple checked that the door was locked. I later realized that I'd first heard the man and dog when I was walking past the back of the funeral home. To this day, I'm unsure if that's of any significance. I have lived in a small English town in Yorkshire for the entirety of my life. The same home from birth till 26. Now, I live with my mother and younger brother of 15. We've always been an open family with each other, never shy to talk about feelings or anything of the sort. We live in a three bedroom semi-detached home. I'm in the attic and have been since my brother was born when I was 11. My brother's bedroom door is directly opposite my spiraling staircase, and mother's is across the landing at the front of the home. So our landing is a sort of L shape with five doors in various places around it. We don't need to have these specifics as they aren't really that important. We have always been quite in tune with otherworldly happenings, apart from my brother, who maybe didn't want to admit to anything happening out of fear. Possibly. I wouldn't want to believe at that age either. But as for my mum and I, 
We've always said that we feel things in the house, whether it be a cool breeze or in some of the most bizarre cases, gifts. This brings me to the first case in our house. I was around 14 and my brother four at the time. And me and my dad, who passed away five years ago, were in the main bedroom while my brother was playing in his. And we hear him talking as best a toddler can. We stood and listened out of view after he stopped. My dad walked in and asked who he was talking to. So he replied, the nice white lady. This led me to ask my dad a volley of questions. What does he mean? What lady? Was it a joke on me? He then decided to give me a full overview of the things that had happened in the 31 years of him living in that house, always referring to the ghost as she. I got to a point where I wish I'd never asked. We went downstairs and the excitement was overwhelming to hear his stories, or so I thought. The first being long before I was born. Dad was downstairs washing the pots, my mum in the bath reading a book, as she still frequently does, and she heard my dad walking over the landing. Until she caught sight of, not my dad, but the lower half of a slender dress drifting past the door slowly, almost gracefully, and through the wall into the neighbors. Mom obviously freaked out, screaming for my dad, who ran upstairs thinking she had hurt herself, only to find her as white as a sheet. My dad always says he could feel when she was near, which used to scare the living daylights out of me, watching the hairs on his arms stand on end. I never doubted him in many things, but in ways I still wanted some proof for myself. The next story was when they first moved into the house. My dad was working on fixing up some old dressing tables in the attic. Mum was downstairs in the garden and it was summer and she likes to try and tan. If you can do such a thing in England. While he was busy varnishing the table, he turned to the other table and noticed a small bunch of what looks like dried out brown flowers, no bigger than the palm of your hand. With seeing this, he bolted for the stairs and stood inches from my mum, to which she asked, what's wrong with you? He asked if she had been upstairs at all, to which she replied, no. He held the flowers out to her and she knew straight away they weren't a joke. They're kept inside a Bible that she has always kept in her drawer. Now, four years ago, me being the one in the attic, one day I was cleaning the bedroom as normal. After vacuuming, I noticed something on the floor. Nothing could be in that spot as I have hoovered meticulously. When I pick it up, I realized I'd seen the exact same thing before. Another bunch of dried up brown flowers tightly bundled together. Without question, maybe less freaking out than my dad, I passed them to my mum who placed them in the Bible along with the others. I have read before that angels can often leave flowers or white feathers, but dead flowers, that I can't seem to understand. Many times dad told me of things that happened to our ghost friends, from her stroking his hair ever so gently while he drifted off to sleep, to passing through the living room each night at 10, to things going missing, and then weeks or even months later magically reappearing in spots where they wouldn't be left to begin with. Sometimes when the house is quiet, you can hear footsteps from one side of the main bedroom to the door on the landing, never knowing when anyone else in the house and never during the same time. I know every sound of the house, from the pipes to the creaky top steps of the stairs. Hearing the footsteps aren't new either. This has happened for as long as I can remember, but something that you get used to over time. Sometimes I would feel the odd feeling when I was in bed of someone sitting on the bed. To begin with, I was paralyzed with fear, not knowing if I was actually feeling this happen or imagining it. My mum had a medium slash psychic come to the house. As soon as she walked in, she commented on how strong the presence was that she could feel, but it wasn't a dark energy, it was light, which I have begun to come to terms with. For me, this was confirmation all along. 
that the others, let's call odd occurrences, were real. Until, as I previously said, when my dad passed away, there was an energy that seemed to stay in the house. Now I'm almost certain she is warming to me more. I also feel my hair move on a night, trust me. I've tried to stay still when this is happening to see if it's me moving, but to no avail. It's like you can feel each finger run through your hair, and it gives me chills just thinking about it. Even when the house is warm, I can walk through certain parts and feel a chill, a freezing cold chill, and walk by the same area again and it will be gone. Nothing has happened to hurt my family, but it still isn't convincing to think someone could easily be watching my every move beyond the veil. And what's to stop not so nice presences from coming for a visit too? This event happened 20 years ago, when I was nine years old. My family took a ski trip to West Virginia, a ski resort. My dad really wanted to get his money worth, so he had my whole family come out on the slopes about 20 minutes before the lifts were even running. It was something like 15 degrees and around lunchtime. My mum and I were getting too cold to have fun, so we decided to get hot chocolate at the food hall while my dad and brother and I stayed out for a few more advanced runs and all agreed to meet for lunch about an hour later. My mum and I got our hot chocolate and were warming up in the food hall when I got a second wind. The kiddie slope was right outside the building. So I asked my mum if I could do a few runs while waiting for my dad and brother to return. My mum was usually extremely cautious about letting my brother and I do things on our own. But from where she was sitting, she had a view of the slopes through the window and probably for that reason said okay. At first, everything was fine. I was thrilled to be out on my own and I felt invincible, blasting down an easy slope after the trickier ones I'd been on with my parents. I went down a few times and was feeling good when I started to notice myself passing a specific man over and over. This man was very distinctive looking in the crowd of skiing families, wearing 90s style snow gear, tall, wearing what appeared to be a black trench coat, not a ski jacket, with a long dark beard and dark rimmed glasses, and a black hat with a rim. As a nine year old, his appearance kind of scared me a bit, a bit like a cartoon villain and I began to feel like I was seeing him everywhere. It wasn't a huge slope, but it still seemed like we passed each other more often than I was passing other skiers. I also started getting the sense that he was trying to get on the lift with me, like waiting to get in line until after I did. Even though we never ended up being put on a lift together, I couldn't tell if I was being paranoid or if he really was showing up way too often, so I decided to test him. The next time I got off the lift, I went back down the slopes like normal, knowing he had been on a few chairs behind me and would probably come right down the slope as well. When I was about halfway down the hill, I stopped suddenly and the man passed me. That's when it started getting weird. After passing me, the man went a little way further down the hill and gently fell down in a controlled way. He sat on the ground and watched me pass him and then immediately got back up and skied the rest of the way down the hill, getting in line for the lift, several people behind me. I don't know what he said, but he spoke to each of the people that were in line between him and me and managed to get right behind me as I was about to go on the lift. Right as the chair came around, he got up beside me and tried to get on the lift with me. At the last second, I played dumb and said, Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, and stepped back to let him on. He seemed surprised by what I said, but got on alone and I got on the next lift with a mum and her daughter instead. They were really nice, and I had a good chat with them on the way up the hill. For some reason, I was too stupid and shaken up to tell them about the man. I was hoping it would look like they were my family or at least someone else on this slope that was paying attention to me. At this point, I felt pretty sure that this creepy man had singled me out 
and years of my parents saying stranger danger and that training told me that it was probably time to find my mum. I resolved to ski back down to the food hall as soon as I got to the top. Instead, I got off the lift, said goodbye to the mum and daughter, and was immediately approached by the man who clearly waited for me at the top. He came right over to me and said, Are you all alone, little girl? It's funny to think back now, but at the time I remember being kind of insulted at this question because it sounded so much like all the cheesy lines my parents would come up with when they taught my brother and I about stranger danger. I couldn't believe this guy could think of a less obvious question to ask, or that he actually referred to me as little girl instead of pretending to know me, or something less conspicuous. I think his audacity in that regard kept me from being as afraid as I otherwise may have been. It made it seem like a game or simulation, which probably helped me act more natural. I answered him in a very matter of fact way, saying that I wasn't all alone, and pointed to a nearby man and his teenage son, saying that that was my dad and brother. Then I walked away very casually, as if I wasn't at all weirded out by his question, and skied down the hill to the food hall where I quickly found my mum. I told her all about the guy and the weirdness, and while I was telling her, I saw him come inside and start walking around with his head high, clearly scanning the crowd like he was looking for someone. My mum was really freaked out and didn't let me leave again, even to get food. My dad and brother arrived soon after that, and my mum told my dad the story. He brushed it off as someone probably being awkward but trying to look out for me, but my mum wasn't too convinced and neither was I. I think about that guy every now and then, and wonder what was really going on with him, why he was dressed so unusually, and unseasonably while skiing. Why was he only skiing on the kiddie slopes, when he didn't seem to be with a family? Why did he notice me at all? All that I do know, is that I never want to see him again. I've never really believed in the paranormal, but haven't denied it either. But after tonight, I'm 110% sure that it exists. I work in a care home for the mentally challenged slash severely handicapped. We have two people working night shift, one awake and one sleeping in case something happens that needs two people. Yesterday was my first awake night shift. Nothing spectacular happened, just sounds I've never heard while working day and didn't really pay any mind to it. I just thought it was weird. The sound I noticed most sounded like someone using a belt and slapping it against something with a little bit of force, but not a lot. And the timing between is erratic, but not longer than three seconds between each. Not shorter than one second. My shift starts at nine. Nothing really weird happened, just the sounds that I heard the day before started to begin around 10. My colleague that has worked there for several years commented on the belt sound and said that he had never heard it before. Now, I begin to feel uneasiness in my body. You know, just me expecting the worst. The belt sound stopped after four to five whips. Everything is quiet and sound until two. That's when I have to give someone their medicine. Just outside the person's apartment, there is an entrance, 10 meters in front of the door to the apartment. The entrance door is made of thick and sturdy glass and metal. Just when I'm gonna try and give the person their medicine, I hear a really loud sound from the entrance. It literally sounded like someone ran right into the door. I know how it sounds because every apartment building in the neighborhood has that kind of door as an entrance. And in my drunken adventures, I've run into one of them and know exactly what it sounds like. Really didn't pay that much attention to it. Started wrapping up and heading out of the apartment and went to the next one to take the trash out. Just as I exit, I hear someone tugging at the door handle with all the might of an angry teenager at the staff toilet door that's right around the corner. I stop dead in my track and my heart skips a beat. I hastily check the door and it's open, 
The goddamn door is open, and I can guarantee on my mother's grave that I closed it ten minutes earlier. Now I'm scared. I check every door in the whole building, and every door that is supposed to be closed and locked is locked and closed. It's impossible that it was my colleague, since I would have heard the staff sleeping room door open and close since it's right next to the staff toilet. After that, I walked into the staff room and have been sitting here for two hours since I'm too scared to move, and I don't want to step one foot outside until 5 a.m. Everything that's supposed to be done is done too. Just three hours left of this shift. I'm sure I'm gonna have bad nightmares. This is the most terrifying and vivid dream I've ever experienced, and was a few years ago. I was in my sister's hometown because she was in the hospital, so her room as well as her roommate's room was empty. My parents stayed in her room while I stayed in the roommate's. We'd been there for a few days and I had no previous issues up until then. I was laying on her bed watching TV, on the phone with my boyfriend and overall drifting off since it was late. I could faintly hear him snoring on the other end of the phone, and I too, myself, felt like I was drifting. I vividly remember what apparently was a dream that felt very real. I was in an unknown house getting out of the bathtub. I walked past the hallway and to the room to sit and watch TV. Everything was normal for a few minutes, when out of the corner of my eye I saw movement. I turned seeing the long hallway of this unfamiliar house. The light above it was flickering like it would in a typical scary movie. I ignored it and looked back to the show I was watching, but again saw something with my peripherals. I turned quicker this time, thinking I'd be able to catch whatever it was before it disappeared again, and I saw a tall dark figure, but it wasn't a person. I was immediately filled with fear and dread. I was frozen for what seemed like hours. The light began flickering in longer bursts. It would shut off completely, then light back on for a brief second. And every time it did this, the thing would move closer to me. The light would illuminate it closer than the previous time. And I jumped off the couch and tried opening the door to escape, but no matter how hard I tried, the door just wouldn't open. I was scratching and clawing to no avail. I could sense this thing behind me. I knew it was there, but I was too afraid to turn and see it face to face. I was completely filled with fear. I felt something hot on the back of my neck and heard a mumbling, though I couldn't make out what was being said. I collapsed to my knees, still clawing at the door, this thing looming over me even if I didn't see it. I knew it and felt it. Suddenly my eyes opened and I was back in my sister's townhouse, but unable to move. I was awake again, but in what I can only describe as sleep paralysis. Movement draw my eyes to the right side of the bed and I could see curtains moving. My mind tried rationalizing it. The fan? No, it was off. Was it the window? No, I never opened it. Again I sensed movement from the curtains. Something was pushing through it, getting closer to me. I could see the outline of a very tall person like the figure in my dream. My brain was screaming for me to get up and run, but my body wasn't cooperating. The curtain pulled off this thing and I was face to face with it. I wanted to shut my eyes, look away, anything to not see it, but I couldn't even shut my eyes. It was in the shape of a man. As I said previously, it was very tall and skinny and it was inky black, the blackest black you can imagine. It had no features, no clothes, nothing. It had no eyes, but I felt like it was staring at me. I was in full panic mode at this point. I saw a flicker of color, and suddenly I realized I was staring into a pair of glowing red eyes. We held contact for what seemed like hours, when I felt movement in my body again. I snapped out of it, jumped out of the bed, and ran down the hall to my sister's room where my parents were asleep. I knocked frantically on their door, calling for my mum. The knocking turned to pounding, and my call turned to yelling for my parents to let me in. I never turned back towards the room. I was too afraid to see those eyes peering through the doorway or seeing it stalking me. 
They opened the door, confused at the sight of their 22-year-old daughter crying and screaming in the middle of the night. They questioned me, but I made up a lie, as I knew they'd think I was having a nightmare or I was just exaggerating. I told them that I thought someone was trying to break in through the window, but that didn't make sense either, since we were on a second story, but I stuck to it. My dad went to check and of course found nothing. Needless to say, I opted to sleep in the floor of their room with my parents for the rest of our stay. I don't know what it was and I can't explain it, but it was definitely a traumatizing experience that I still struggle with. Did I get a visit from a shadow person, ghost, demon? Or was it just all a dream? I'm a 25 year old, and even though these events happened 11 years ago, I still remember them very clearly. This is by far the creepiest thing I've ever experienced. When I was 14, my family and I moved out of town into a small house situated right in the middle of a cane field. There was a dirt road that led from the main road to the front of our house and the sides and back were surrounded by cane. I was what my parents called a fitness freak because exercise was my thing. So I took my dog Jet and went jogging early mornings and late afternoons every single day. Because we had just moved to this house and it being surrounded by cane and all, I had to find a new track to continue my routine. Our house was two stories high and my bedroom window faced the front of our house so I could see the main room. After finally moving in my stuff and setting up my bedroom at the new house, I noticed from my window that there was a little dirt road on the side of the main road. Perfect, I thought. It was about 5.30 in the afternoon, the usual time I would go for my job. So I would go and check it out. The road was long and narrow, fitting no more than one car, as there were rows of cane on either sides that stood tall and well above my head. I had been jogging for about 15 minutes, and looking back, I could no longer see the main road as this track was straight, but then slightly curved, leading me up towards another house. I could only see the roof of this house in the distance, as the cane was still very high. As I got closer, I noticed a little boy in a red shirt sitting on the top of her roof. He looked about five or six. That's weird, I thought. I remember thinking how on earth did he climb up there? And if his parents knew he was there, because not only is the roof visible over the cane, as it was obviously a two story home, so I stopped jogging and called my dog back, who was running a few meters ahead of me, and turned around to go back. I wasn't interested in going all the way up to the house, just in case I'd be trespassing on private property, or if they had dogs, as mine didn't get on with other pets very well. When I got home, my dad was sitting on the couch watching TV. I asked him if he knew the family who lived up on the opposite dirt road. Nah, no one lives up there, he told me. Well, there must be someone who lives there, I say. I just saw a little boy sitting on the roof. My dad looked at me and lowered his eyebrows as if he didn't believe me. No, Tory, no one lives there. It used to be an old workhouse that farmers used to store their tractors and working equipment in. I was so confused, questioning whether I had just imagined a little boy sitting up there. My 12 year old sister then walked out the bathroom drying her hair with her towel. Gemma, come jogging with me in the morning? Uh, why? Because I need to see if I'm just imagining something. Okay. First thing in the morning, I dragged Gemma to come along. We left the dog at home just in case there really were people living there. So what were you imagining? Yesterday, I went jogging on this road and down the end was a house with a little boy sitting on the roof. So? So, that is saying that no one lives there and it's bothering me. We get close enough to where the roof was finally visible and there was no little boy in sight. Let's go all the way in then, Gemma said. 
and I hesitantly followed. When we got there, it became pretty clear that there couldn't possibly be anyone living there. To try and describe it as best I can, it was a large two-story house covered in black streaks, as if it had been burnt down once before, and had three large square gaps on the front that clearly used to be windows. The stairs to get inside were at the back of the house, and behind that was a small murky colored lake. It seemed definitely abandoned, and like it hadn't been used in many years. My dad was right about it being once used as a storage place for farmers. Around the yard were old tires, tractors, and cars. In all honesty, the whole place was straight up creepy. This is gonna sound weird, but do you have a bad feeling? Jim had looked at me for a moment before agreeing. Um, Tori? Is that the little boy? She said, her voice shaking. Before I got a chance to answer where, Gemma was pointing towards a small room downstairs with a smashed hole in the window. Through the window, there was a little boy sitting there. We both stared in shock for at least another second before bolting back down the road. We got home, bursted through the door, telling mum and dad what we'd seen. Dad laughed. I told you girls no one lives there. I was getting frustrated. Dad, seriously, Gemma saw him too. They both brushed it off and didn't think much of it. Being dumb teenagers and all. Gemma and I decided to go back in the afternoon to the house with the dog. When we got back there, we checked where we had seen the boy in the morning, but he was gone. Jet was going crazy. We unclipped his leash from his collar and he took off running behind the house and the upstairs. We called out to him, but he wasn't coming back. Great, now we have to go get him. We walked around the back and started slowly walking upstairs. They were old, rickety and creaking with every step. Gemma got up the stairs before me because admittedly I was scared and I was only halfway up before Gemma called out. Oh my God, Tori, you have to see this. I walked straight in as the front door was missing and I had chills. On the dusty old floorboards was kids' crayon scribbles and a small blue shoe. If only dad could see this. I immediately wanted to leave, but Gemma was still calling out to Jet and he hadn't returned. We walked through the kitchen and into an open room of the house and found Jet sitting there staring at a large cardboard box that was at least a meter tall. We looked inside, and it was full to the brim of blank videotapes. Every part of me was screaming to get out. Gemma looked at me and slowly reached in to grab a tape when we heard quick and heavy footsteps coming from the front of the house, exactly as if someone was running towards us. We both panicked and got the hell out of there. It was late in the afternoon and it was starting to get dark. It started pouring with rain as we were running away. And as we got further down the road, we looked back, seeing a few shapes of large men standing in the gaps of the windows watching us. When we got home, we were sweaty and so far out of breath trying to explain to mum and dad what we had seen. Videotapes, that's weird, Dad said. Mom wasn't so interested, so she chose not to believe us. We explained that when Gemma tried to pick up a tape, we heard what sounded like someone coming towards us, even though it was now dark outside. My dad suggested he would go for a drive to the house and have a look. For some reason, even though Gemma and I were absolutely scared out of our minds, we decided to go with him. We drove up slowly through the dirt road as it was dark and eerie, and all we could see was the gravel of the road directly in front of the car where the headlights shone. We pulled up at the house, thinking it was scary enough during the day, but it was like going to a horror movie during the night. We sat in the car with the headlights shining directly onto the old creepy house and darkness surrounding elsewhere. My dad, Gemma and I almost jumped out of our skin 
and I swear for a second that my heart stopped beating. It was the sound of a gunshot. It sounded like it was shot no more than a few meters from our car. At that moment, Dad immediately put the car into reverse and spun it around, about to drive off when he just stopped still. My heart was about to beat out my chest and I yelled, Dad, what are you doing? Gemma was almost crying in the front seat. I looked at both of them, and they were both doing nothing but staring directly in front of the car. So, this thing I noticed on the way there, was since it had rained a bit earlier, there were no tracks or anything marked on the road, since they were washing away by the rain. So our tyre tracks were the only ones. Then I saw it, sitting perfectly upright, on top of our tyre tracks was a bullet shell. It's safe to say we never came back to that house, and it's quite obvious we were not wanted there. I began jogging on a track from the back of our house, and have had a much better experience. But still to this day, so many questions remain in my head. I wonder what the hell would have been on those tapes. Why there was an entire box full of them. Who did they belong to? And why were they being so protected? I have to preface this story by saying that yes, I was young and dumb, and made some major mistakes here. I don't need any judgments, trust me, I know how stupid I was. But on to the story. I was 18 years old and had just joined the army. I was doing my basic training in Georgia in the middle of summer. I was struggling with some mental issues at the time, and to make a long story short, I was in the process of getting chaptered out of the army, aka quitting. My squad mates and even drill instructors had all told me it was going to take months for me to get out, and I'd still be stuck there past Christmas. Mind you, this was June. I was very distraught about the thought of being stuck there, forced to do meaningless chores till January, while my mental state deteriorated. But then a drill sergeant decided it would be fun to deceive me and convinced me that if I went AWOL, ran away, and made it home, they would simply send me my discharge papers and I would be free. Looking back now, that was clearly a trick. But at the time I was desperate, and bought into what he said. I hatched a plan to sneak out at night with a buddy from another unit. We were going to walk on the train tracks in the nearest town and catch a bus home. Easy enough, right? The night finally came for our escape, I snuck out of my barracks and headed to the meeting point. Upon arrival, I noticed my buddy wasn't there, and after waiting 30 minutes, I realized he wasn't coming. It was too late for me to try and sneak back in, so I was on my own. I headed to the tracks, made it right onto them, and headed into what I thought was the direction of town. Boy, was I wrong. Walking on the tracks in the middle of the night, surrounded by woods, was a bit creepy, but I figured it wouldn't be long, and that I'd get to where I needed to be. After walking for over an hour, it hit me. Maybe these tracks weren't going to take me where I needed to go. And when I found a dirt path, I made the stupid decision to leave the tracks and follow that instead. The path led me past some fake houses, set up for training, and continued into the woods. This whole time, mind you, it's dark, and I have nothing but the moonlight to see with. I kept hearing noises in the woods and seeing shapes in the trees and bushes lining my path. Eventually on this path, I spotted some kind of wild dog wolf sitting just off the left side. By the time I had noticed it, it was too late to go back. My only option was forward. I faced the animal and backed up against the right side of the path as much as possible, and slowly kept moving down it, never taking my eyes off the canine. Oddly, he never moved or showed aggression, just watched me as I inched by him, possibly because he was full, or maybe he just wasn't interested in me. I honestly had no idea. After passing him, I continued until my path died, and ended in a 50-foot drop. 
At this point, it had been hours. It was hot. I was alone, scared and thirsty. I had no idea where I was or what my next move should be. So I glanced around my surroundings and the only thing I could see besides the wood was a radio tower off in the distance to my right. Here is where I made my big mistake. I decided the radio tower couldn't be that far away and someone had to be there to help me, right? So I left my path, headed into the woods straight towards the radio tower. As you can imagine, it didn't take me long to realize once I headed into the woods that now not only was I lost, but I was lost in the almost pitch black woods with no way to find my way out. I continued to march in the direction I thought the tower might be in, slowly losing hope of ever seeing anyone again. Now tired and bleeding from my legs thanks to thorn bushes and my dumb idea of wearing shorts, I was on the brink of giving up. Where I came across a dry creek bed with a log in the middle and out of frustration and hopelessness, I climbed onto the log and screamed as loud as I could for someone to help me, which of course got no response. After several more screams, I heard a rustling in the bushes on the creek bank behind me. And I turned around just in time to see three wild dogs jump out of the bush and glare at me like I was dinner time. I absolutely lost it here. I ran in the opposite direction of them as I heard them taking off after me. I was terrified running through the darkness with them chasing me screaming at the top of my lungs and thinking that this was going to be how I'd die, painfully torn apart by wild dogs in the woods and then eaten. I don't know how far or for how long I ran, but eventually I came to a down tree that was leaning on another and I scurried up praying they wouldn't climb it. I finally looked behind me and they were gone, nowhere to be seen. I wasn't sure if they had stopped chasing me, but I was relieved that I hadn't become their dinner. The rest of the night is mostly a blur of walking through dark woods and hearing other animals. At one point, I couldn't do it anymore and was just going to lay down and give up. As I sat down facing my own mortality, the thought hit me that they probably wouldn't even think to search the woods for me and that my family, friends and girlfriend would never have any idea of what truly became of me. That thought is what kept me going and made me continue to try and find my way out. Eventually the sun came up and I had survived the night. The lights brought with it some comfort since I could now see everything. After a few more hours, I stumbled upon a ribbon tied to a tree, which out here could only mean one thing a land navigation marker for training. I knew that if I kept following the ribbons, they would eventually lead me out. And eventually they did. I made it back to the path and ran into a sergeant who was heading out in his truck to go fishing. He returned me to my unit and I paid for my actions and was eventually discharged. I learned a lot from this experience and have a wonderful life now. And I'm thankful for every day that I'm alive and will never go into the woods again without a flashlight. While this experience was terrifying and life-changing, I am glad I went the wrong way on that track and didn't make it a walk, or I would have gone to jail and not been where I am today. Labor Day of 2015, my mother, my wife, and my three children and I went to a very remote cabin that we rented out. It was an old fire watchman station or something of the sort. So I had the cabin and three other sheds slash shops. I'll try to keep it short, but this is a bizarre story. We unpacked, settled into the cabin and then decided to walk a few hundred yards down the river barefoot. We got down to the pebbled shore and were playing slash throwing rocks when I realized there were about one foot snakes everywhere. My wife, mum and I yanked up the three kids and boogied off. After reaching a safe distance from them, I went back with a water bottle and caught one to see what it was. 
Turns out, we were in a nest of diamondback rattlesnakes. If one of these things latched onto one of my kids, they surely would not have survived. We were three hours away from any medical facility. We got back to the cabin, and my mum and I went for a hike slash walk alone, while my wife calmed the kiddos and fed them lunch. Upon returning 15 minutes later, all three of my kids and wife were inside with the doors and windows closed, even though we had left everything open for the place to cool off. We went inside to hear all four of them start yelling about a bear that was 150 yards from the cabin, huffing and puffing at the wife and kids on the front porch, eating. It was down by the river another 30 or so yards from the hill, and he poked his head up over and over. A few hours go by, and in that time an ATV passed three times, with two inbred looking freaks upon it and each time they stopped in front of the gate onto the property and stared at us in the cabin. Keep in mind, we're two hours into the wilderness in Idaho, with no sight of a person, the whole entire trip except for them. We decide it's bedtime for the kids, and it's pitch black out. Within 10 minutes, our son of five went from being perfectly fine to having a fever of 103 slightly foaming at the mouth and being completely unresponsive. It was at that point we decided to leave immediately and go seek medical attention. I opened the front door to the cabin and started loading the two cars by the light of the porch. And that's when all three of us heard about four to six large and heavy animals running all around the cabin and the property. There was one on the right side of the house that I could hear pacing back and forth and breathing heavily. I made everyone stay indoors and close the door every time, and I went to transfer stuff to the cars. I had a stick and a big pot that I was smacking as hard as I could, and each time was yelling out loudly and randomly. As soon as I'm done loading, I take each kid out individually and load them up between the two cars then escort my mum out and wife. My wife and I were in the lead car. So we pulled up out of the gate and for some stupid reason or another, I felt that I needed to close it. So I got out of my vehicle, walked behind it and my mum's car and closed it. Now this gate was literally a log that slid from one post to the other. It offered zero protection or barrier between me and the animals out there. And right as I went to turn around, I heard a large padded foot walk up to me directly in front of me then more than 10 feet away. Then I see eyes shimmering from the moonlight as the deepest, scariest growl I've ever heard in my life. I turn and run so fast I swear I must have jumped from where I was to the driver's seat up to the car some 30 feet behind me. And as I landed in the seat, I slammed into drive and spun out, finally leaving. About 15 minutes down the road, we were still panicking about our unresponsive son, and we both kept having this horrible, evil, doom feeling, like a shadow over us. I looked down and realized I still had that baby rattlesnake in the water bottle in my cup holder, so I grabbed it and threw it out the window immediately. Not even two minutes later, we heard our son softly crying. We realized he's responsive, and he stated something along the lines of, why are we leaving? What's going on? He was sad because he was sad to leave. He couldn't remember the last hour or so at all. My mother was about 58 years old at the time and has been a Jehovah's Witness my whole life, plus many more years beforehand, and she's the last person in the world that would believe in signs or evil or omens or whatever. The next day, my mum broke down extremely bad sobbing her eyes out, hardly able to talk, and she confessed to my wife that the night before we left, she had a nightmare in which we went on a camping trip, came across snakes, a bear and a pack of wolves. She said she knew a lot of bad things happened at that outpost, and it was full of evil. Most of all, she said, one of your kids passed away. I swear on my life to this very day, if I ask her who passed, and how it happened. 
she immediately starts crying and refused to talk of it. She lives her life now with a guilt that she willingly ignored her nightmare and put us in this situation, nearly taking one of her dear grandkids away from the world. She doesn't deserve to feel like that. I know all of this sounds crazy, but a week later on the local news were reports of a wolf pack in that area. Wolves and bears may not coexist in harmony, but they do share territories and respect each other. This outpost station of sorts was about an hour and a half into the wilderness from Lohman slash Banks, Idaho, if you want to verify the animals actually exist around there. Sadly, I grew up in the mountains for most of my pre slash early teen years, as did my wife until she was 10 years old, and even have a half sleeve of the wilderness slash trees on my left arm. But with that said, we don't care to go to the mountains anymore. About three years ago, I went camping with my now ex girlfriend, as she had always expressed interests but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest and is my go to trail slash camp spot, as it's hidden deep in the forest and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs. My family had been going to this spot for about six years and my friends that introduced me about 10 or so years. We went for the weekend trip, and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well, except we did notice a group of people that were hanging out next to our campsite, but they were just stargazing and ended up leaving. Then around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like someone was laughing at us, but the laughter never ended and got very high pitched and sounded as it kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try and sleep. And then that's when the laughing noise moved up higher and they started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped and then started again around 3 a.m. When it started again, the fire was going out. So I went to see if I should stoke the fire with my shotgun in hand and turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see any coyotes or something. But I didn't see anything or hear any movements below. This persisted until 6 a.m. and then stopped. And that finally was when we were able to get some rest. After we woke up, we checked around the campsite and didn't see anything out of the ordinary. So we packed up. Once we were packed up and good to go, I start my vehicle and it's completely dead. That really freaked me out as I'm always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that killed the battery and made sure everything was closed properly and unplugged. And yet somehow the battery still died. I was able to get a jump from a AAA. That phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but in the end, we both laughed. After that happened, I told my friend, who had shown me the campsite and also had a cabin in the same forest about 25 miles away, about what happened, and he got freaked out. He told me about two incidences which had happened, one at a campsite and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated one night after we had all returned from the trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While he was hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance and saw a pair of eyes up in the trees looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent eyes and he flashed his high powered flashlights at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, they were there looking right back at him. So he packed up and went right to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother and they were both just chilling by the fire outside when they both saw a pair of eyes looking at them from the trail that leads into the woods. They stated that the height of the eyes were looking at them Whatever it was had to be at least seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles 
and the eyes disappeared. But once they were done, they reappeared and were closer. At that point, they both freaked out and got back into the cabin and didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but I felt very scared when these events were happening. After we spoke about it, one of the brothers thinks it's a Wendigo. I really don't know what it could have been. All I know is that I haven't been that scared since. This happened several years back, but it still gets to me. I'm an American living in France. At the time of this incident, I was working in a hotel kitchen for a five-star hotel. I had to drive 30 minutes, catch a 30-minute metro, and then walk another 10 to get to and from this hotel. I'd work from 3 a.m. to 3 p.m. every day, and the boss was horrible. The customers were upty people who thought five-star meant that the staff are not human. Basically, it was the worst. One day, I was having a particularly bad shift. My hair was gross, my face was numb from smiling at rude customers, and all I wanted was to go home, take a shower, and sleep. So I put my earphones in and waited for the metro. At this stop, it was super busy. So the metro opened from both doors, letting people get on one side and off the other. The rest of the stops weren't as busy, so they only opened in the opposite side so people could get out. When the metro arrived, I stepped on and stood next to the door that wouldn't open again, knowing I could lean back for the rest of the trip. Then a man in an electric wheelchair rolled on, and he just stopped in front of the same doors as I was planning to lean against. He had a few bags hanging from the back of his chair, and they weren't pulled up enough so the door would shut on his bags. I knew the doors would close and remain closed, so instead of just telling him to pull them up a bit, I held the bags forward so that they wouldn't get caught in the door. The door closed, I let go, and the guy smiled at me. Then he started speaking to me. I had my earphones in, so I couldn't hear what he said. I was exhausted, but I'm a nice person, so I took them out and started talking to him. He clearly had a disability, as his speech was pretty hard to understand. My French isn't bad, but it wasn't good enough to understand him. Sorry, I told him, I don't speak French. And he immediately switched to English. It was a normal conversation. Where are you from? What are you doing? How long have you been here? You're beautiful. Are you getting off at this place? I was getting a little weirded out, but I said, no, I'm getting off elsewhere, which is one stop before where he said. He said, get off at this place with me. You can come over and we can hang out. I politely declined and he said, kiss me. Screw it, I thought. I said no and put my earphones back in, ignoring him. He kept talking, but I couldn't hear him. I was blatantly ignoring him. Then he pushed a loud buzzer on his chair to get my attention. Everyone was looking at us now, and I would have looked terrible if I'd have kept ignoring him. So I pulled my earphone out and he kept trying to talk to me, asking if I had a boyfriend, if I wanted to be his girlfriend, if I would kiss him. Keep in mind, I'm like 20 at this point, and he's a solid 50. Finally, my stop arrives. I say goodbye and he rolls out the metro with me. I told him that this isn't his stop and he said that he was coming home with me. I was thoroughly creeped out, but I figured I could ditch him easily at this point. We were two floors underground and I could easily run up those stairs before he could get the elevator. Feeling like a complete douche for trying to ditch a disabled guy, I stick to my plan, sprinting up the stairs, tripping a few times as I did so, mind you, and get to the ground floor and walk outside, satisfied that he is gone. As I'm walking to my car, I hear that buzz. He's behind me, zooming pretty fast after me, and I start running, terrified of this dude who won't leave me alone. I get to my car, 
and I'm so freaked out that my hands are shaking, and I'm having trouble getting the keys into the car. Finally, I do. I hop in, put it in reverse, and when I check the mirrors, there he is, parked behind my car and buzzing at me. I don't know what to do at this point. I can't reverse and run him over. I'm certainly not going to get out and talk to him, but I have to get home, so I can't just sit there all day. This standoff lasts for about ten minutes, before he finally just rolls away, glaring at me as he does so. I peel out there and drive home, shaken but satisfied that I'd seen the last of that guy. The next morning, as I pull into the parking lot, still sleepy but ready for work, I get out of the car, get down to the metro, and there he is, waiting on the platform. I'd forgotten that the day before, I told him I worked every day from 3 a.m. to 3 p.m. He knew I'd be there, and he knew when. He smiled when he saw me and began rolling over. I book it back up the stairs, calling my boss on the way, telling him I'm going to be late to work, and ended up just driving into the city, wasting gas and spending a ton of money on parking. I haven't seen him since. And I've since started going to a different metro station. There are few other stations I can park at, and they're sketchy as hell. But this guy has very limited movement, so I know there's probably nothing he could have done to hurt me. And he was probably just a lonely guy who wanted someone to talk to. But still, now I panic every time I see a wheelchair. I live in Melbourne, and at the time I was living in a small flat near a popular street called Chapel Street, that has a pretty busy nightlife. My flat was located about a hundred meters off a main road, just behind a police station, a five-minute walk away from the street, and due to this, I always felt relatively safe walking home alone from Chapel after a big night out. So, in order to tell this story. I have to go back a few months before the incident. I regularly shopped at the Woolworths just up the road from me, and was approached by a Jamaican man one day after walking home from getting groceries. He began talking to me. He told me that he had seen me a few times at the supermarket, and had always wanted to say hello. I was flattered, and we struck up this innocent conversation about what it was like growing up. In small towns, and moving to a big city like Melbourne, he insisted on walking me home. This was a foolish mistake. I felt a bit uncomfortable about this, but didn't want to come off as rude. So I figured I would just wait till he was out of sight to go inside, so that he wouldn't know which flat I lived in, as there were eight in total. He seemed like a nice guy, and when we reached my building, I said goodbye. And he asked for my number. I didn't really want to give it to him, as I was already seeing someone. But I figured maybe he was just looking to make friends in the area. He messaged me the next day, asking me to take me out on a date, and I politely declined and told him I had a boyfriend. That was the last I saw of him. At least, I thought. Fast forward seven months, and I'm walking home at 1:30 a.m. from a bar on Chapel Street. As I'm walking home, I see a guy in the distance walking towards me. I thought to myself, "Hmm, he looks familiar." As he got closer, I realized it was the Jamaican guy again. Just a weird coincidence, I thought. When he reached me, I said hello and expressed my surprise at bumping into him. This is when things begin to get really uncomfortable. He began telling me how he was at a bar with his friend when he saw me walk past. His friend, after discovering he knew me, told him to stop being such a baby and go talk to me. So this guy had jumped into his car, driven around the corner down the road, and parked up ahead in order to catch me. This made me feel uneasy. Come have a drink with me, he said. I've already been out. I'm heading home. It's late. I really want to just go to sleep. Sorry. No, come on, come have a drink. He grabbed my hand. I gently pulled away and said, 
I'm really not interested in drinking anymore. I want to go home. Please come for a drink. This little dance went on for a good five minutes with him continually grabbing my hand and pulling me away. I thought he would get the hint. Then he changed his tactics. Let me walk you home. No, thank you. He argued this with me for a while, then started repeating, but I know where you live. I don't know how he thought this would magically make me trust him. It only succeeded in freaking me out. And at one point, I remember him saying, screw the police. I can't remember the exact context of this statement though. We argued for a good 15 to 20 minutes before I gave in, a little worried what would happen to me if I flat out told him to piss off. And he ended up walking with me. As we were nearing my building, I had decided I really should say something to get him to leave before he saw which flat I was in. Just as I was about to talk, he said he should go back to his friend. I was completely relieved, but still shaken. He asked for my number again, and I didn't want to say no because I knew he wouldn't take it. And I didn't know if he would get aggressive. If I gave him a fake one, he could test it out before I left. I have had that happen in the past. So I complied. And as soon as he was out of sight, I ran to my flat, locked the door, and proceeded to check all the windows were secured. I lived with a boy who worked in the casino and was hoping that he would be home that night. I was very upset to find out he was not. And I called my housemate terrified and told him what had happened and asked when he would be home. He told me he wouldn't be back for another four hours due to night shift and to call the police if he came back knocking on the door. The guy messaged me about an hour after, saying how good it was to see me again, and then text me in the morning too. After calming down and gathering my strength, I replied to him, saying that the way he had approached me had made me quite uncomfortable, and that I would appreciate being left alone. Haven't heard from him since, he's probably not a dangerous guy, I just hope he learnt not to approach women that way after our encounter. It may not sound like much of an ordeal to you, but if you'd have been there and seen everything from your own eyes, you'd have been pretty terrified as well. When I was younger, I used to live in a condo. I had my own room while my parents' room was across from mine. Think of a T-shape with a room on either end of the top line. It would be relatively easy to see and hear someone in the other room. Now it was night time and I was asleep, but I woke up at what I assume was around midnight or maybe a few hours past, not exactly sure. Now as a kid, I was never afraid of the dark per se, but wasn't too fond of it either. The thought of not being able to see what could be lurking close by and being that vulnerable always kind of freaked me out a bit, but I never believed in monsters in the closet or under the bed or anything like that. But it always just got creeped out by that dark, something of which I've now grown out of mostly. And of course, being the kid I was, waking up that late at night when it was that dark out, I hid under the safety of my blankets. And that's when it happened. I was lying on my side, still under the sheets and I felt something poke me. It felt like someone just poked my side. That's it, nothing else, just that. Now I was a kid and it was late, but it was a very significant and noticeable feeling. Of course, immediately I threw off my sheets the second I felt that, and to my surprise, no one was there. I thought it might be one of my parents who sometimes got up late at night checking on me to see if I was asleep, as as a kid I liked staying up. I grabbed a late night snack from the fridge, ate that and went back to my room, pulling the covers over my head once more. And I even remember asking my parents the next day if they had come into my room and they both said no. This takes place in a very small town in Western Kentucky, as in one flashing caution light, blink and you'll miss it. There is a two lane highway that runs between this town and a large college town about 15 minutes away. At the time this story takes place, 
The highway was shut down for a few days for repaving in the very small town. Also, I was 20 years old and four months pregnant. I was working in a convenience store that only sold tobacco products and lottery tickets. I normally worked the day shift, but due to another employee's scheduling conflict, I was closing that day by myself. One of my regular customers had left about five minutes prior to closing. After I saw him pull out of the parking lot, I walked over to the door to lock it. It's also important to note that there were absolutely no other vehicles besides my own in the parking lot. If I could turn the lock, two armed men dressed in all black, including full face masks, rushed the door and pushed it open, ordering me back to the register area to empty it, as well as the separate lottery machine and register. I emptied both of these into a plastic bag. The guy carried a shotgun, ordered me to the back room where the safe was and had me empty this as well. At this point, I began hyperventilating and was trying to cover my pregnant belly with one arm, all the while trying to throw the cash and rolled coins into the bag. The man grew impatient and pushed me backwards into the wall, grabbing the cash that I had dropped. The second man came into the back room, aiming his firearm at me and shouted at me to stay back there and slammed the door shut while they ran out the front door. I had fallen to the ground after hitting the wall, so when I heard the front door close, I crawled to the door to the back room and cracked it open to be sure they were gone. After confirming this, I ran to the front door, locked it, then ran back to the counter where our phone is. My hands were shaking so badly. I could hardly dial, but managed to call the owner of the store, who called the police. Due to the shutdown highway, it took them about 20 minutes to arrive along with an ambulance. I gave my statement. The police called in their K-9 units to attempt to track the men since they had obviously fled on foot. But as far as I know, they were never caught. I was in shock. So my boss called my now ex-husband and asked me to come pick me up. There was no way I would be able to drive myself. The jerk was with his friends playing video games and refused. Thankfully, his son was able to drive me home, and I sat in our empty house for three hours before he came home. I was jumping at every little sound and was a nervous wreck when he did finally return. Ultimately, I had to go to the hospital because of the stress, causing me to go into early labor. Thankfully, they were able to stop the contractions, and my daughter made her appearance four months later. Fun fact. When my daughter was three, I was speaking about this to her preschool teacher and she said, yeah, I heard the whole thing. It was scary. She's now 12 and insists that she remembers this. I was told that my paternal grandparents had purchased the house they lived on in the 1960s when their town was still heavily forested and less populated. Even then, it was no surprise that the surrounding areas, along with the land that the house stood on, were rife with spirits, whether they belonged to the forest or among those people who had been killed in previous battles. To give you an idea on the layout of the house, I have to admit that it was a strange one and probably already meant to bring bad luck. The front door was on the west side of the house with a set of 13 steps leading to the upper floor that had two windows on the landing, one facing the east and the other north. On the right side of the landing were a set of double doors leading to what might be considered the upstairs living room, with two bedrooms on the east side and my grandmother's room on the west side. There were two concrete steps on the right side of the main door that led to the living room, and on the south side of the house stood a pair of sliding windows and on the side door. The kitchen, which doubled as the dining room, was at the rear end of the house with an outdoor cooking area as well as an indoor cooking area, a sink, and the toilet was outside, as was the norm for many provincial houses in the Philippines. At the fact, there was a electry just outside the back door from the kitchen and a huge mango tree on the west side of the main gate to the house, along with an old grotto in the main yard, 
with an equally old statue of what was supposed to be the Virgin Mary to complete the creepy, depressing look of the place. Not even flowers that I planted during my stay could cheer up the place. These details were important later. I hated the place as soon as I set my eyes on it, from the first time I was 12. The house was never filled with joy and laughter, but misery, jealousy, and negative energies. The wooden concrete walls practically oozed them, and I always felt like the life and strength were being drained from me when I was there. Looking back now, I don't know how I survived in that place for my first three years in high school, while having to endure the constant bullying I was subject to at the hands of my older sister and cousins along with several schoolmates. There were also two separate years when I was unemployed and had to put up with my control freak father and delusional grandmother. Many strange occurrences took place in that house before and after those residing there decided to leave. I should mention that the people on both sides of my parents' family have had some connection with the paranormal. My older sister is able to see spirits, while I can only see them through my peripheral vision. But anyway, on to the story. This took place in early 2013 after I was forced to resign from my job due to my health. In mid-2014 when I was able to finally leave that house and work in the city six hours away. By then the house was falling into disrepair, and it was only my father and myself living there since my grandfather passed in 2005 and grandmother in 2012. Since I was, and still am, mostly a loner, I was only close to a few people, but the cats and dogs in the area, whether stray or belonged to someone, or even some farm animals who liked to wander around, had a habit of coming over and later becoming close to me. No matter the time of day, I would always notice figures from the corner of my eye watching me, sometimes just standing there, even if there were no sounds accompanying their movements. The figures weren't only human, they'd also be animals as well. My cousin's dog Sheena was considered by many a pretty wild and unpredictable animal because of the way she walked, leant slightly to the side, and she had an accident while she was a puppy. As a result, her bones never set properly. Sheena had initially watched me from afar following my arrival, but warmed up to me about a week after. She often came to the house and would dive a few feet away from me until I was done with my task before strolling over, lying down, and I'd give her a scratch behind her ears or give her a belly rub while I was reading. And my bond with her and the other animals who came to the house was something that made living in that place a little bit more bearable. After the news about her being butchered reached me, I was heartbroken and couldn't stop crying as I loved her very much. A few days later after the news, I was in the living room sweeping the floor while my father was at a friend's house when I saw Sheena from the corner of my eye, standing a few feet away watching me. I dared not look in case she vanished and called her name softly, and I saw her wag her tail, and knew that she was saying goodbye. Not long after that, I noticed a little boy, who seemed to be between two to four years, always following me around, just standing a few feet away, watching. Once at around 6pm, I was upstairs folding clothes. I had taken them from the clothesline, and I noticed him standing in the doorway. I didn't feel threatened by him and spoke to him gently before I felt him leave. Later that night, I was jolted awake by my father yelling in surprise and fear. Annoyed, tired and still very sleepy, I asked him why he was shouting at 2am, which I saw was the time on the wall clock. He told me he'd gone to take a leak and he returned to the bedroom that we were sharing and he saw a little toddler laying beside me under my blanket on the bed when he had clearly seen that I was the only one there a few minutes prior. This troubled me, for up till then, I had never told him of the little phantom child that followed me around. The next day I told my cousins Susan, Layla and Amy, who were among the few people I am close to. Amy was clearly freaked out, but she, Susan and Layla told me that it had been an open secret that Vanessa, one of my estranged cousins, 
often went to the ancestral house to abort her children, who were the results of extramarital affairs she was engaged in. They weren't sure how many abortions she's had over the years, but the child I encountered, along with some of the others I have seen, may have just been them. I felt a wave of sorrow and anger for the children whose lives had been ended before they'd even begun, and told my father what I'd learned when I got back to the house. From that time on, I lit a candle and prayed for the young boy, along with the others who had passed. My father had a priest come to bless the house so that the spirits may find rest. But the boy stayed with me until the day Leela, Amy and I left that place to make lives for ourselves elsewhere. My father passed in 2016, and when I went to the house the day after the funeral, I found that it was falling apart. The plants I had painstakingly raised during my time there had withered in my absence. I didn't see the little boy or any of the other spirits in the house, and I pray that they have found peace. The house that drained the life from me and was filled with bad memories is now in ruins, with only the walls standing. But there's... Nothing left anymore. To start the story off, for context, I absolutely despise bugs of all kind. Oh, of course, I loved them as a child, but over the years from being bitten by every local bug imaginable, I began to despise them. Since I was raised in the South, I had fallen victim to fire ants and I seem to give off a certain scent that attracts every mosquito and flea from miles around. But what did I hate the most? Roaches. Such disgusting creatures, the way they look, the way they move. Safe to say I had an intense phobia of them. I inherited a house from my dead grandmother in my late teens, and since it had been abandoned for about a year. That's right, you guessed it. It had become infested with large water bugs. Sleeping in the house was a nightmare, since occasionally the bugs found their way onto my bed. I could even hear them crawling in the walls at night. To cut a long story short, I went to extreme measures to eliminate them from my new home, and the war lasted a few years at least. One night after spraying and fighting with these pests, I retired for the night thoroughly creeped out. That night I went to bed, and had one of the most vivid and disturbing nightmares of my entire life. I remember that me and my family were traveling, and we couldn't find a motel. This was a common occurrence with my family anyway, and they usually would wait until late at night, only to find run-down cheap motels. After arguing what to do, we came across an abandoned looking building, and my family decided that this was where we were going to stay. I guess because it was free? I voiced my complaints, but their decision was adamant. As we walked inside, it ended up being my old apartment building from childhood. Except the entire place was in ruins, as if hundreds of years had passed and the building was barely left standing. Deep cracks could be seen all over the walls, as well as large holes in the flooring. Dirt was everywhere, and both small patches of grass and vines were beginning to invade the building through these holes. I remember wondering, just what in the hell happened to this place, since it did carry sentimental value after all? An overall feeling of depression and dread could be felt in every room as I explored, like some sort of curse had taken over these walls. When I went into what was my old bedroom, I saw the haunting image of my original bed as a child still there, except it was just as dirty as the rest of the apartment. The rest of the apartment is empty, but what is my bed still doing here, I wondered. I did my best to shake the dust from the sheets since we were apparently stuck sleeping here. I complained a few more times, but my father shouted and insisted that I lay down and close my eyes, so I did. I don't remember any form of electricity being in the apartment, but suddenly everything went dark. Only a dim glow could be seen emanating from moonlight shining through the holes and cracks in the walls. Suddenly, small bugs could be felt crawling on me. I wasn't surprised by this at all, considering the environment, so I just shook them off and tried to ignore it. This kept happening, and eventually, I had had enough. I jumped out of bed, only to discover a far worse situation than I can imagine. Bugs everywhere, 
Green caterpillars all over the floor, spiders, and of course, roaches everywhere too. I lost my mind. I ran into the other room with my parents, screaming that I wanted to leave now. At first, they ignored me, but as these large bugs that I had never seen before began emerging from the cracks emitted a screeching sound, they finally jumped up and decided it was time to leave as well. We packed our things as fast as we could, but when we went to the exit, a large group of screaming roaches approached our way. We weren't able to get through them. They moved with lightning speed as they ran all over the room, in and out of the cracks. One of the strange bugs I couldn't identify earlier bit me, and I let out a scream as I stomped on it, turning it into a pile of goo. Several more approached us, and all I can say is that they appeared like praying mantises, but different. We had no other choice but to fight. We went around stomping on whatever got close to us while fighting off some of the flying bugs with our hands and still occasionally getting bitten in the process. A swarm of flying bugs surrounded my face and I fell backwards while trying to fight them off. That was when I saw what I can truly say was the most horrifying image I'd ever seen. I sat up and saw a large roundish centipede like creature emerging from a large hole. The creature was red, and not nearly as long as any normal centipede, but still had many legs. The creature crawled onto a large rock, and as its backside was visible, I saw the human face of an old man on its back. The human face was actually part of the creature, centered with dozens of legs attached to the side of its face. The face looked right at me, and its expression was contorted in pain as it made a light screeching sound. The same sound that someone makes when they're being choked, as if it had been human at one point and was left doomed to spend the rest of its life and existence in agony on this creature's back. Thankfully, I immediately woke up after this, but felt very disturbed. I couldn't get the image out of my mind for weeks. And since I'm an artist, I feel the need to paint that image onto canvases. I think it's a way of me confronting my fear. Even as I painted this, I felt the image come into place. A true deja vu feeling. The picture hangs on my bedroom, and as time passed, I am no longer afraid of it. It has become my favorite of all my art creations, and the one I am most proud of. Something that truly came out of my head, and mine alone. My aunt, my brother, my cousin, and I were visiting our grandparents' house in Washington. They lived in a pretty remote area with only a handful of other houses around and a good chunk of forest between each of them. Keep in mind, it also is kind of an island, so they don't get many funky creatures there. My aunt and I went out while it was dark outside, just walking the path into the forest and trying to figure out what was making a loud noise. Anywho, we passed a pond area and made our way to a clearing. When we reached said clearing, I started immediately getting a bad feeling. I figure, you know, it's dark and I'm quite scared of the dark and I'm tired, but nothing's really going to happen. The path was a bit overgrown around there, so we decided to turn around. Right before we did, though, I caught a glimpse of what could have been a really big owl up in the trees just staring at us. Now, I'm an Arizona girl, so I don't know what creatures are normal in this forest, but this thing just didn't feel right to me. It gave me a weird vibe. But my aunt kept walking, and I caught up. Keep in mind the path was very short. It only takes about 10-ish minutes to get to the clearing, and tend to walk back. But when we approached the house, we heard my grandma yelling for us. We run back, and she is anxious, saying we've been gone for hours. We swear we'd only been there for half an hour at most. And when my brother and cousin come back, they tell us they'd been out looking for us. We check the time. They're right. Another interesting thing that could be connected a few days before that, we had heard some really funky noises coming from the woods while we were out there making s'mores. Even my grandparents, who had lived there longer than I've been alive, admit that it was unlike anything they had heard before. It continued getting closer and closer, 
and stopped any time someone tried to get a video of it. Eventually I had to go inside because it was freaking me out so bad. That loss of time though still gets to me, especially considering that I don't have an explanation. Was it the owl or the woods? I guess I'll never know. I went to high school in a small Minnesota town, mostly farmland intersected by wooded areas and of course dozens of small lakes. One side of my neighborhood was bordered by a relatively large marshland that you could access by a slope that wound down to a trail. This trail curved through the marsh into a big patch of woods about three quarters of a mile away. In the fall slash spring after heavy rains, the fog would often settle over the marsh as it was much lower than the surrounding area and it truly looked like something out of a Stephen King novel. After one of these rains, my brother and I, he was probably 13 and I 60, decided it would be a great idea to go explore the woods in the fog. Although the sun was setting fast, we knew that we could make it to the woods in about 10 minutes if we left immediately. We grabbed a couple of flashlights, knowing that it would be dark by the time we got home and headed for the trail. Once we were in the trail and moving, it just hit us how thick this fog was. We only had been walking for about a minute or two, but we had absolutely no visibility left behind us and five to 10 feet max in front of us. We continued walking for a few more minutes, chatting about hearing noises and seeing red eyes in the distance the whole time until we came to a curve in the trail. This curve signaled that we were only about 100 yards from the entrance to the woods. At this point, there's a small lake on the left side of the trail and miles of marshland on the right. It's important to note that we have moved further and further away from any house. Our house was the closest to the trail and the trail moved away from our neighborhood rather than bordering any backyards. We began walking past the lake and then we heard a splash, definitely larger than a fish jumping, but we had no idea what else would have made that noise. We stopped, waited, and upon hearing nothing else continued on our way. We couldn't have been gone for more than 15 seconds when we heard cracking and shuffling in the brush up ahead of us to our left. We stopped dead in our tracks and waited. At the end of our eyesight, which could have only been about 10 feet, a figure stepped out from the brush bordering the lake. The fog was too thick to make out many details, but it must have been at least six foot four and very broad shouldered. As the figure made its way into the middle of the trail, my brother gasped and it stopped. Its head shot over and looked right at us and just stared. It felt like an eternity but it couldn't have been more than a few seconds. I felt true horror at that moment, and I've never replicated that feeling. I began to take a small step backwards and suddenly, the figure took off running into the marshland. Again, there are no houses or buildings or anything for miles in the direction that it ran. Suffice to say, my brother and I sprinted back to the house faster than I've ever done before. I still don't know who or what I saw that day. I hope I never do. The events described here took place in a small country in Northern Europe, sometime between 2008 and 2009, during the middle of the summer. I was about 17 years old back then and spent a better part of the summer vacation helping my dad he was a logger and his workday, as well as mine, started very early in the morning. We would wake up just before 4am, have a quick breakfast with coffee, dress up, get our gear, and drive out to the forest, which was around 15 to 20 kilometers away. My family lived in a rather small town surrounded by crop fields and forestry, near the country's border, and the aforementioned trip meant you would get far enough from civilization. Poor, often disappearing cell signal, old overgrown roads and absolutely no one who lives there. No one for you to meet, 
on your way to the felling. That's what they call the territory where loggers cut trees. To get to it, we need to park our 4x4 truck on the side of a narrow road, walk two kilometers through thick overgrowth, and then climb down a steep hill. The route to this particular felling did stand out though. On our way there, we would pass an old, long abandoned house that got my attention the first time I made this trip with my father. Judging by the appearance of the house, it was built at least 80 years ago, definitely before Soviet occupation, which meant that it could have been nationalized with the original owners possibly being deported after 1940. All of the windows were gone, as well as the window frames. The roof was also gone, but you could still make out the individual rooms because the walls and the floor of this house were still somewhat structurally sound. You could also make out a yard that was hidden beneath the overgrowth. On one of our trips, I noticed some posters and magazines lying on the floor in one of the rooms. It was from around the 80s, so I figured that was the last time someone had lived there. It was quite unsettling to find this abandoned property in the middle of nowhere, but it was only after our fourth or fifth trip that I realized its probable importance. We got to Felling, worked for about three hours and decided to take lunch. It was a clear sunny morning with no one around. Me and my dad sat on one of the bigger trees that we cut down previously and proceeded to chow down on our sandwiches, taking occasional sips of coffee. Then it began. Suddenly we both heard a dog barking somewhere in the distance. This was already weird since we never heard anything other than the ambience of the forest the previous days here. What made this even stranger was the fact that the barking noise was coming from within the forest, the part we had yet to chop down and saw our way into. Me and my dad both stopped eating, looked at each other, and without saying a word agreed that we would keep listening and turned our heads towards the forest from where the occasional bark was coming. I eventually said, must be a stray dog or something, or maybe someone lives nearby. My dad nodded in affirmation. As we resumed our lunch, it became clear that the barking was nearing our position, and now it was accompanied by distinct human-like footsteps, breaking branches, shoving leaves, and so on. It unnerved me a bit, but I quickly realized that soon enough, somebody would definitely emerge from the forest probably someone else who was logging near us, although it would not explain the dog, as taking your pet to the felling would be very unusual, not to mention potentially dangerous for the animal. The barking continued, and the footsteps got louder and closer, close enough that both the person and the dog should be clearly visible. The sound stopped around 30 to 32 yards from where we sat, then resumed. Me and my dad kept looking in that direction and seeing absolutely nothing. The footsteps and the barking carried on. These sounds now came from a cleared out area where we should not have been able to see anyone or anything that stood or moved. We looked at each other in complete bewilderment and didn't speak. I could even hear the dog panting and sniffing around with an occasional step being taken by apparently no one. After 40 seconds, the sound indicated that this, whatever this was, was moving away from us. Not back where it came from, but to the left. Soon enough, the sounds got very faint and disappeared. Me and my dad exchanged a few quick theories, but it was clear that neither of us understood what we had just experienced. We resumed work and left the place around the time we usually did. And I passed the house described earlier and got chills thinking that maybe what we witnessed is somehow connected to this haunting abandoned property. I should state that we were both well rested that day and used to this type of work. This took place before I started using alcohol and my dad had been a non-drinker all his life. I should also mention that neither of us are a skeptic. I have an open mind to these type of things and they interest me. I've read up on it, but we certainly don't spend much time talking of it. This is one of the creepier things that has happened to me, and I often wonder 
if it was a ghost and his dog returning to their abandoned property. I was nine years old and camping out with three families other than my own. I was sleeping in a small tent with one of my close friends when something woke me up. I listened and heard nothing from outside at first. So I opened up the tent zipper enough to see the fire was out and knew the adults must be asleep. I closed the zipper and laid back down. Shortly after I lied down, I heard a high pitched voice from outside the tent telling me to come out and play. I would have thought it was a person, but it was repeating itself over and over and moving close to the tent that was then far away all the while circling. I opened the tent and looked out, but it was pitch black. At this point, I tried to wake the friend I was in the tent with, but he pushed me off. I tried again more violently this time and he woke up. I told him I heard something outside, but he must have not been fully awake yet because he just mumbled something and laid back down. After I spoke to my friend and tried to go to sleep, the same voice kept me up. Next morning, I told my friend who had been in the tent about it. And he said he remembered being annoyed that I woke up. So to me, that means I wasn't dreaming. I'm almost certain I was fully awake. So I doubt I hallucinated it. I know this doesn't have a satisfactory ending. But that is my real ghost story. This happened to me in 2004, but I still get chills thinking about it as I write it. My parents raised me to always pay close attention to my surroundings. And at least on this occasion, I'm pretty sure it saved my life. It was early to mid February, and I was visiting Boston, Massachusetts, to compete in an annual high school debate tournament. My team was staying at a hotel in Kendall Square near the Charles River. This particular area of Boston, where the hotel was located, wasn't very busy at night, mainly because the hotel was smack in the middle of an area dominated by offices. In fact, aside from the hotel itself, I remember there being nothing else to speak of on the street where this all happened. The tournament was held across the river, a very short subway ride away. Because of the way my day was scheduled, all of my debate rounds were held in different buildings than the rest of my team, and I finished my day later than everyone else. By the time I was finished, the rest of my team was back at the hotel. Having grown up in a big city, I had no problem taking the train by myself, so I caught the subway back to the hotel. I didn't really have any choice in the matter anyway. Now the exit of the subway station was across the street and around half a block down from the hotel entrance which was set back from the sidewalk by a huge courtyard. It wasn't a very long walk, but in the bitter cold darkness of a winter night, it certainly felt like it was. The sun had already set by the time I got to my stop. I remember noticing how empty the train was, how dark it seemed when I reached the top of the escalator stairs and stepped outside. I always find myself slightly disoriented when I get out of the subway, so I stopped and looked around for the hotel entrance. And that's when I saw him. Almost as soon as I stepped outside, a lone jogger ran past the subway entrance. He was dressed from head to toe in black, including gloves and a ski mask, wearing a black baseball cap on top of the ski mask, which I remember thinking was strange. Aside from the two of us, there was no one else on the street. He passed by me quickly and being the cautious city boy that I was, I watched him for a moment as he continued down the street. Realizing that the hotel was in the opposite direction, I turned away after a few seconds and crossed the street. I just made it across to the other side of the street when I heard them, coming from behind me, moving incredibly fast, footsteps. I turned to quickly look over my shoulder. At some point, the jogger had turned around and he was sprinting diagonally towards me from across the street. By the time I saw him, he had crossed most of the street and was maybe 10 feet away. I'm not ashamed to admit 
that the fight or flight response took over and I immediately noped out of there, taking off running for the hotel as fast as I could. A while back, I read that looking over your shoulder as you run slows you down. Even though I could still hear his footsteps behind me, I didn't dare to see where he was. I just ran as fast and as hard as I could, down the street and through the hotel courtyard. I was still sprinting when I hit the revolving doors, and it was only when the door swung into the lobby that I looked behind me again. The courtyard was empty. I don't know at that point if he stopped chasing me, but I do know that no one takes a diagonal beeline sprint towards a young stranger across an empty street at night unless they mean to do you some kind of harm. Thankfully, I never found out what his intentions were. For all I know, it could have just been a straightforward mugging. But since 2004, over 20 young men have been found drowned in Boston's underways under bizarre circumstances. Sometimes, when I think back on the jogger ski mask and baseball cap obscuring his face, his arms pumping as he ran at me, I wonder if I almost became one of them. When I was 11, I lived very close to one of my friends called Anne. She had a little brother named Matt. During summer vacation, me, Anne and Matt would always hang out pretty much every day. Anne lived right across next to this little bridge that went over the train tracks next to her house. Right over the bridge, there was a road that went down to this facility and then connected to the main road. I'm not entirely sure what this building's purpose was exactly, but it was some sort of financial advisement building. Since we were curious kids, we would sometimes go snoop around there and we found this shed right behind it. This was an epic find for us as it became our clubhouse. There was pretty much nothing in there but rusty nails and it was always unlocked for some reason, but we thought it was cool and we would meet there almost every day and just hang out, even if there was nothing special to see there. Now one day, I had come to Anne's house and we were heading down to our clubhouse as usual. And out of the blue, this random man comes out of nowhere and starts walking towards us. It's obvious we were going inside the shed. Matt's hand is on the doorknob. I'm the eldest of us, Sam being a year younger than me, and Matt three years younger than I. So I was sort of the leader. What are you doing? He asks. He seemed mad for some reason. Of course we had no explanation. We were kids that didn't understand private property and had just found this cool shed to hang out in. Nothing is the only thing I could utter. He starts lecturing us about it not being okay and kept talking about the important things in there and that we weren't allowed to go in. He made it seem as though he worked there even though he'd just come from the opposite direction of the facility. I now realize he was rambling but it seemed very justified to us because we were scared as hell. It was just weird because I knew that the building was closed. It was Sunday afternoon and all the lights were off but he spoke with such authority we just listened straight up fear. He then started demanding we come with him and starts walking further down the street, saying he's going to call the cops. If we don't come with him right now, we're scared out of our minds and just follow this grown up, thinking we've committed some sort of serious crime. He leads us to his house and we kind of stop outside because we've been lectured about going with a stranger and all that since we learned to talk. So it felt wrong and we were hesitating outside and holding her brother's shoulder warily. Our savior then comes, she's walking her dog. She doesn't even say anything. I don't even think she saw him, but he just closed the door when he saw someone coming. I remember his face so well when he saw this random woman. We were so scared we just ran home immediately after he shut that door and never cross the bridge again. I was never really a believer in the paranormal and I'm not scared easily as I was a professional MMA fighter for over 12 years. After this experience, I believe there are things we cannot explain. I may have opened the door and invited these things in, 
when I was in a bad spot in my life with severe depression and listening to these stories. I'm in a much better place in my life now and have had no instances of anything since moving out of that house. It started off rather small, coming home with all my pictures off the wall. Crazy things would be that none of them would be broken as they were all made of glass, oddly enough. There was another time when I had a jug of water in the middle of the bed and when I shut the cabinet in the bathroom next door, I heard a bang. I shut the cabinet a few times to make sure that I wasn't imagining things and proceeded to go into my bedroom only to find the jug of water in the middle of the floor. It got bad enough when my dog, a Siberian Husky called Blizzard, refused to enter my room. She would whine and cry when she was in the room, no matter what time of day. It came to a head, and this is immediately what I wrote after the instance to my mother. Little backstory. I had just gone through a really tough breakup. 9.5 years to be exact. I moved in with two Filipinos and have been here for three weeks. So the guy who owns the house, the brother used to live in the room. Apparently he's always been followed by an evil entity since he was a kid. Apparently an evil witch doctor put a curse on the family because he was upset with the uncle. The best way to get to someone is through their family. So he put an evil entity on the nephew. So the one night I'm drifting away and listening to my stories that I used to fall asleep to, and I think I'm about to sleep or whatever, but can still hear my story perfectly. And I notice my door is open and I'm almost sure I shut it because Blizzard always sleeps in the hallway now. I get up to check. Mind you, I'm asleep or almost there thinking it was like an almost out of body experience. So I look out into the hall and see nothing. No blizzy. Even when she leaves my room, she usually sleeps in the hall. Here I am trying to shut the door and it won't latch and is almost bending out into the hall. Finally, I'm like, whatever. When I turn around, I notice blizzy is sleeping on her spot on my floor by the hamper but a blank entity is hovering over my bed. It doesn't really have a shape, but more looks like a dark black cloud. I kind of stare at it and I'm in shock. Instead of cowering, I make the decision to charge it. I really wanted to get a hold of it. As soon as I get to it, I'm back in my body, but I can't move. Mind you, I can still hear the stories word for word. It's at this point I can only wiggle my toes and fingers. Sleep paralysis, I tell myself. And try to wake up, which I do immediately. I'm not drowsy and I'm completely coherent. I look down and Blizzy is in the exact same spot from where I saw her before I charged the entity. This happened last week and I told one person. Somehow we got on the subject last night about ghosts and I told them the story. Mouths drop open and they tell me about the owner's brother. Apparently my roommate had a similar experience when he had sleep paralysis and the same object was hovering over him and he had to tell himself to wake up. I'm pretty pissed they never told me about this when I moved in there as there were two rooms to move into potentially. My theory is the entity got lost and is trying to reattach itself to the brother, but can't find him in Hawaii. The good thing is by not cowering and coming ahead on towards it, I showed it I wasn't afraid. Everything I know is that an evil entity attaches itself to people when they think they're weak or vulnerable. My mother spoke to her priest and warned her of what I was expecting. He told me to sage the room, say the Lord's prayer and leave. I did that, and since then I had one experience. Around 3 a.m., I woke up to my entertainment center collapsing. Wouldn't you know who comes running up the steps? 
the brother the spirit was looking for. Unbeknownst to me, he was on leave from Hawaii and was staying with us for the night. I've had no instances since then and have recently moved to North Carolina, where since life has returned to normal. When I was a little kid, about six, I started having this recurring nightmare that follows me still to this day. I'm 17 now for reference. The nightmare took place in a dark castle, the type that you'd see in a horror movie and know instantly it was haunted. I was walking down a corridor of the castle with my mum and sister when we were passing a painting of a tea party. One of the people in the painting, a tall, pale man dressed in all black, stood up and turned to us, beckoning for my mother to follow him. My sister and I tried to stop her, tried to hold her back, but she didn't even seem to notice us. My mother entered the painting and walked further into it, arm in arm with the strange man. My sister and I decided that we needed to find her, but as we searched through the castle, we got separated. I don't know how long I was looking, but I do know that I found my mum, as well as the most traumatizing part of this dream. I stumbled onto the castle's throne room, and it was the most disturbing thing I'd ever seen. The whole room was bathed in red, fiery light that was emanating from a huge fireplace behind the throne that a man from the painting was sitting on, as well as from a gaping hole in the wall that was closing and opening in intervals. There was a huge crowd of people in the throne room. I knew that if they saw me, they would hurt me. So I crept through the shadows on the edge of the throne room until I was just under the hole in the wall. I could hear bits and pieces of conversation from the people gathered around, but nothing made sense. The worst part is that going into the hole in the wall was a conveyor belt style operation with large metal hooks going down from it, like in a meat processing plant. While that might not be terribly scary, the really messed up part was that hanging from these hooks were all of my loved ones, and they were all alive. To make matters worse, I knew that my family and friends were being drained of their blood and then burnt in that hole. My best friend at the time was just about to go into the fiery hole when he looked directly down at me and gasped, you caused this, with a look of betrayal and accusation. I was so shocked I couldn't move. As he was being drawn into the hole, I overheard a group of older women laughing and talking about how what a shame it was they couldn't get the full set before one of them caught sight of me and grabbed me. It was at that moment I awoke. When I was working, as a backpacking guide in Western North Carolina. My schedule dictated a full eight day shift with six days off. During those six days, myself and other coworkers would play in the woods. In the summer, you couldn't beat a mountain swimming hole. One of my favorites was called Paradise Falls, alternatively named Wolf Creek Falls. This is a cliff jumping spot with a huge swimming area, a tiny slot canyon, and an inner pool. Most will venture to do the small jump into the inner pool. Even though it's the smallest jump, it's arguably the least accessible. Even though the jump is nine feet at most, you must work through a 10 minute rock scramble to get to the top of it. We were all venturing in, and from inside the tiny canyon, you can't see the main pool. Well, we got to the jump and coaxed the first person off. A fellow guide who had never been to the spot before. She jumped successfully and swam out into the main pool and beach area, and then she screamed. Because she was now out of sight, myself and another guide jumped in together and swam the short distance to her with the others in tow. Of course, we figured she was somehow injured. She was treading water and just staring wide-eyed at the riverbank. When I looked to the shore, there stood a man. He was massively large, easily six foot six with a little change. He wore beat up overalls and no shirt, and there didn't appear to be a hair on him. Perhaps the most disturbing thing was that he had folds of skin all over his body. Imagine the Michelin man, but made of flesh. 
His face, his arms, chest, everything had a uniformed layer of shingled fat rolls, and he was brandishing a fire. The area around Wolf Creek is just holler after holler, but there are a few residences, and those few have been there for generations, propagated by the same families. These people don't like outsiders, and so they keep relations within the family. I could only surmise that this individual was the product of inbreeding over decades. He just stood there and watched as we scrambled to grab anything important and shoved it in the bag. He just stood there and watched as we hightailed it out of that basin and back towards the parking area. The whole time, he never said a word. Bear in mind, it's public land. This whole thing probably happened around six or seven years ago. I lived in the middle of nowhere in Ohio and had to make my own fun growing up. I was around 16 at the time and my friends and I decided to start ghost hunting on the weekends. We've experienced small stuff here and there, nothing too insane until we went to Rogue's Hollow. Now, Rogue's Hollow was this old mining town where there were fires, diseases, etc., that eventually made the town cease to exist. It's now a national or state park, I'm not sure, one of the two. But, anywho, we decided it's worth exploring. First off, this place is in the middle of absolutely nowhere. I drove a 98 Chrysler Concord in those days, and when it was an absolute chore getting there. The gang shows up, there's a total of four of us and it's getting pretty late and we notice the house slash lodge where the park ranger stays. So we park a bit off to avoid getting caught. The gang shows up. There's a total of four of us. It's getting pretty late and we notice the house slash lodge where the park ranger stays. So we park a bit off to avoid getting caught. Didn't work out too well. Five minutes later, we're being questioned by an old guy who was the lone park ranger. He ended up being pretty cool and telling us some of his personal experiences. He said we could continue if we promised not to do any witchcraft or satanic rituals. Apparently that was a big problem that he was dealing with. At this point, we ventured back into the woods where the town previously was and stuff started getting weird. We could hear what sounded like pickaxes, men working and voices in many different directions. Needless to say, we were getting a bit on edge and decided to start recording our own little EVP device to see if we could find any stuff. We were getting words like fire, death, devil, and collapse. Eventually, we stumbled on an old house. It definitely wasn't inhabitable and was about 50% burnt down, while the others stayed back. As we approached the door, we turned back to our friends to give the old wish us luck, and they were sheet white looking at the second story building. Directly above us, looking out the window down at us, was a man from the shoulders up and slightly transparent. Then he disappeared. Not leaning back into the house, he was simply gone. Usain Bolt would have been proud of my sprint time leaving that place. Fast forward to the next day and we're deciding to go back and explore in broad daylight. We were walking around in two groups, about 10 yards apart from one another. I was in the back too, about 100 yards in from the wood line, and all of a sudden, my friend and I both get grabbed on our shoulders simultaneously, hearing a very soft but distinctive, hello. At this time, we turned and booked it out of there, and I haven't been back since. So me, my boyfriend, his best friend and his girlfriend drove up to Big Bear. Then, a day later, another friend of ours drove up and he was supposed to sleep downstairs and couples sleep upstairs since there are only two bedrooms in the Airbnb. The first night we stayed there, it was kind of creepy because the cabin was pretty remote and of course, there's absolutely no light outside. 
It's in the woods with coyotes, howling and bears, but nonetheless completely normal activity. The next night at midnight, my boyfriend and I are in bed, when suddenly, our friend sleeping downstairs comes banging on the door freaking out, saying he saw shadows in the woods, and that the motion lights came on and there was thumping outside. We got a little freaked out, but my boyfriend gets out of bed and checks the entire cabin, and even goes outside. There's nothing. We go up to the other couple's room, where there's a porch with a sliding glass door that looks out into the woods. It's important to note that I'm naturally very anxious and scared, while my boyfriend is a rock. He's calm and logical while I tend to jump to the worst scenario. My boyfriend goes over to check the last place in the cabin. So he pulls the curtain and jumps and yells, Oh my god. At this point I'm terrified. My boyfriend is 180 pounds and a CrossFit coach. And to see a big guy like that scared is nauseating. He locked the door and started backing away slowly. There's a large man standing outside staring at us. He's just standing in the woods staring. At this point, I think he's messing with me. Go lock the door, he says to me. That's when I knew he was serious. Everyone is freaking out. I run and lock the door behind us, and we all decide to stay in the room to keep an eye out. It's the middle of summer, and it's really hot, but we refuse to open a window. I'm so scared but trying not to show it as everyone else seemed to have calmed down. Half hour goes by and nothing happened. I get annoyed with the heat and the fact that there are five people in a tiny room and three of them are men, so my boyfriend and I go back to our room. I'm still pretty spooked, so my boyfriend tries to cheer me up. At this point, it's about 1.30 and I told him I was too scared to sleep with the lights off. He tells me that's totally fine and he understands, so we just lay with the lights completely on. Finally, I start drifting to sleep when I hear a thud. I sit up and look at my boyfriend, and then he looks at me, and the power cuts. I immediately start sobbing. I'm trembling. I can't see anything because it's pitch black. I try to get out of bed and run, but my legs get tangled in the sheets and I fall. My boyfriend picks me up. We grab our phone, run to the other room where everyone else was staying, and I'm hysterical at this point. I try to contact our host, but nothing will go through. I try to call my dad, but all of our phones say no service. We are there alone. Thank God the friend who drove up after us had a different carrier because his phone had one bar. So he calls the local sheriff, He's on the phone with him and they transfer us to the utilities company. We give the address and they tell us that we're too far in the woods and they don't cover that area. At this point, we're wondering if the entire area has no power or if the man outside had just cut our power. I cry more and we call 911 to report suspicious activity and power outage and they send in the fire department. A few hours go by and it's 3 a.m. and suddenly the power comes back on. We fall asleep, and the next day we spoke to some of the locals in the area. We told them our power went out, and he said that was strange and shouldn't have happened. He told us the only reason that happens out here is because of a snowstorm, and he couldn't explain it. I'm pretty sure it was the creepy man in the woods. In any case, I really would rather never meet again. I went hiking out in the wilderness on the outskirts of Yuma, and walked about five miles from my car to my campsite. I brought my usual hiking gear along with my AR-15 for protection against wild animals like coyotes or snakes. My firewood supply burned up just after the sun went down, so I went to bed at around 6.30. Messed around on my phone till 7.30, passed out, and was awoken at 8.30 by a call from our mutual friend, and fell asleep again. The next time I woke up, I couldn't move. I could hear rocks moving outside. 
and soft footfalls in the sand right outside my tent. I heard coyotes howling earlier, so I knew that's what these were. I was sleeping with my back to the wall of the tent, and one of them pressed their nose into my back and sniffed for a good minute. I had sleep paralysis again, and I couldn't even grab my rifle to shoot them. The second thing happened a few hours later. There are two sections of my tent that can be seen through. It had to be a dream, but I woke up and peered through the window and I saw a young woman and a child sitting outside my tent on a small rise, not more than six feet away. I asked them who they were and the child was silent. But the woman declared, leave this place. They made a horrifying face. And as I went to grab my rifle, I tried to pull the trigger, but it dawned on me that something was terribly wrong and the trigger wouldn't budge. And then the child stood at once, walked away into the shrub trees behind my tent. And the woman walked on until I couldn't see her anymore. But the child passed out from under the moonlight into the shadow of the shrub tree. And because there was moonlight falling on the other side, I could watch her silhouette change shape. She became a gangly, bony freak, almost like a tall monkey, absolutely silent. And she rushed to my tent. I squeezed the trigger for all it's worth. And then she collided with my tent. In that instant, I woke up screaming and throwing a wild punch at the wall of the tent. I think whatever it was followed me. I've never been hiking to that spot again, and maybe never will try again. I grew up around the world. My parents were divorced, and they had joint custody. So I lived every other year with the other parents but their jobs required them to move every one to three years to a whole new country. So I'd usually only stay in one place for a year or two. I moved to India in 1995 as a freshman. This was the largest school I'd ever been to. I was fat, pimply and scared of the new school. I'd always been good at making friends, but this school was harder. Most of them lived here their whole life. So it's hard to break into those circle of friends. But a large portion was similar to me. Kids that moved often, although not as frequent. So they weren't as receptive to new kids either. Every fall, we did something at the school called a mini course, where everyone in high school had to sign up for a five day field trip. There were tons. It was a big school and seniors got priority of course. Some trips were like sailing the Ganges, or hiking some mountain, or riding trains to Agra. I can't remember, except the two I went on. In freshman year, I went rafting the Ganges. It's exactly what it sounds like. Six kids in a raft, with an experienced rafter, and we went down different portions of the Ganges, and camped in tents. There were two sophomores, RJ and Steve, and they were snooty rich kids, pompous and arrogant. They seemed to take a real liking to picking on me. I'd been picked on before, but this was rough. One morning, they tied my clothes together and threw it in the water, tied it to a branch and stuff like that. The chaperone was kind of a jerk too. He asked me who did it and I said, well, if I can't prove it, what does it matter? And he said, that's what I want to hear. I mean, he had heard and witnessed the harassment and never intervened. I was never one to tattle. That's just not something I was raised to do. Anyway, it sucked. The rest of the year, I didn't have any problems, but every time I saw these two, they always did or said something that just upset me. Were just general bullies. Slapping my lunch out my hand, unzipping my bag so my books would fall out, that kind of stuff. Over the summer, I hit a growth spurt, went on diet and shot up five inches in six months. And with good food and exercise, I was looking pretty good. I even made the basketball team as a sophomore. The coach was the chaperone from the previous mini course, funnily enough, and I had some more friends. RJ and Steve were always into weed, but now I think 
They were into some other stuff. They looked different next year, acted differently, meaner, generally irritable. They still tried to pick on me, but when I used to walk away, I could feel like they thought they had won. And now I could tell that walking away annoyed them and made them angrier. The mini course came around and coach wanted me on cycling some mountain ranges or something like that. And he thought it would be good for my condition. So I went. And sure enough, RJ and Steve were on the trip as well. I had the room next to them at the hotel and it reeked of weed the entire time. Then we'd go and ride some portions of the hills, then back again and they'd be smoking. At dinner and stuff, they would make jokes about me and I kept ignoring them until one of the seniors berated them for being bullies. They loved it. They laugh and really I think they just loved the attention. Going up to my room, I saw them in the hallway and they threatened me that if I told the chaperone that they were smoking weed, they'd stab me. And I said, haven't told them yet. Why would I do it now? Next morning, I was going to hang back and pick up stragglers since I was riding pretty well. Usually it was some freshman or less athletic kid in the back. This time it was RJ and Steve. I slowed down for them and told them we only had 10 minutes to get to the stop. Steve, in response, threw a stick at my wheel, then they both sped off laughing. It didn't do anything, but they were laughing as they went around the corner and out of sight. Then I heard, oh, sh and stop. As I came around, I saw them both falling off the mountain and into the trees. I slowed down, looked over the edge, and I could see a branch poking through RJ's arm. He was looking up at me, then down, then up, very confused, and I couldn't see Steve. For a reason not known to me today, I didn't do anything. I kept riding. I don't know why. I was raised to always do the right thing and help people, but at that moment, I felt like they deserved it. I know they didn't, but I thought they did for some reason. It was a real battle in my head. I got to the top of the mountain and the chaperone asked if everyone was okay. I said, I think so, but I didn't see Steve or RJ. I was still unsure why I lied. It was a strange sensation. It was so natural to me. I didn't even feel like I was seeing it. The chaperone rode back down the mountain to find them. The other chaperone guided us back to the route we were doing. When we got back to the hotel, they were loading RJ and Steve into a van. This was about two hours later. It wasn't an ambulance. I guess the van was faster. They were bloodied and black in some spots. Steve, whose whole head was wrapped, and when he leaned forward, blood would pour onto his nose like a faucet. Then the Indian guy would push his head back, and I looked right at RJ and didn't say a word. He was on morphine or something was completely out of it. There was so much blood on his pants and shirt. They both came back after Christmas break. RJ before Steve. RJ's arm was still in a cast and his foot was in a boot. Steve had a scar between his eyes where he fractured his skull. It was pretty bad. Something you don't forget. His skull didn't look like it sat right. Like it had shifted. But it wasn't as noticeable as his scar. I heard them talking to girls sometimes saying how the morphine felt so good and that they should switch over to that. In general, they didn't seem to act all that different. Anyway, a number of years later, now in my adult life, one of these pair actually wound up getting a job at a company that our company had just acquired. When I was talking to my VP, they told me that one of the pair had actually wanted to talk to me, as when they went down, they were expecting to see me. Anyway, I obviously didn't have any intention of going over and seeing what he wanted. And I, for the most part, tried to put it to the back of my mind. Then in 2015, I had to go over to the acquired business for some work. And the thought hit me. And I thought that maybe I'd just pop in to see what it was that he wanted to ask me three years ago. But when I spoke to the project manager, 
They told me that he had a plan not to get fired, and that he'd made a real mess over at the company. I mean, his firing was inevitable, and once he did, he went off the rails, got back into drugs, and ended his own life. I tracked him down on LinkedIn and Facebook, and it was true, he had passed. I do wonder though, what his plan to not get fired was. Was it perhaps trying to apologize to me? Who knows? A couple of summers ago, myself and some friends from university went to visit one of our friend's houses, since we were going to a festival nearby and had been offered to stay over. Long story short, her family are extremely rich, with a huge old mansion in the English countryside. As with any home this big, we had a bit of a tour around it and were shown our guest rooms. Her dad began to tell us the place was haunted in a joking tone and mentioned that when they first moved in, there was a dresser that had been left behind in one of the guest rooms, the one I was staying in. This was one of the only things left behind and they'd found a lock of hair of one of the drawers. I'm not really a believer in ghost stories. So at the time I just shrugged it off as a joke, although it's still a bit weird, admittedly. That night I got into bed and began to notice that the air felt strangely cold around me, but there wasn't a particular breeze. The rest of the house had been a perfectly normal temperature just before this too. As I slept, I kept having the most surreal dreams, nothing like when I'd sleep normally. I'd constantly awaken feeling cold. It was like when you're very unwell and you find yourself somewhat hallucinating in bed while you dip in and out of sleep. The other weird thing was that this is in the middle of August and in the UK, we don't typically have air conditioning unless you're in an office or something. I woke up next morning and on one side of the room, there are two hanging rails for clothes. Several of the clothes items were on the floor the hangers had completely come off the rails and I could have sworn they were all hung up the night before. Like I said, I'm not a believer of paranormal, but that night has spooked me ever since. I've never experienced anything quite as strange and I do wonder if her dad's stories of it being haunted had planted a placebo in my head. When I was 16, my best friend and next door neighbor ended her life on January 21st, 2006. Every night after that, I would either dream of her entirely or she would intrude in my other dreams. I remember a dream about a dance recital once where everyone was dancing. She was in the back dancing with a rope around her neck. The dream wasn't about her, but she was there nonetheless, very unpleasant stuff. It made my grief so much harder to get through. However, it was pretty clear those dreams were just that, dreams. I wasn't frightened, nor was I in any way denying that it was my obvious subconscious thoughts that I dreamed her every single night. On December 31st, 2006, I went to bed. I remember that I dreamed that night that my friend and I were in a field of wildflowers. There was so much sunlight that everything was white and we were holding hands and she was smiling. We laid down next to each other and I was looking at her. We were silent for a while and very serenely I asked her, were you in pain? The sound of the field was replaced by this progressive loud ringing until it was so loud my teeth hurt. She answered silently. I watched her face go from smiling to clenching her teeth, turning red and her face changing until she looked like she was in so much pain. She grasped my hand in hers so hard her fingernails dug into it. And I woke up a few minutes later, turned on the light to see if there was a mark and of course there wasn't. But that dream felt incredibly different than the others I'd ever had. So vivid, so raw. Point is, I never dreamed of her again after that. I got over her death and put my grief to rest. I'm 27 now and it's been 12 years. Here's one of my stories from when I lived off the grid in the forest of Western North Carolina. Some friends and I lived in these small shacks, essentially a shed with a loft that were very close together. 
living in such primal and close conditions breeds a kind of deep trusting friendship that you can't get from living anywhere else. So naturally we did almost everything together. By our little semicircle of houses, there was a railroad track that if you followed it south would lead to a waterfall. This waterfall in particular is where everyone would go to get high. It was a normal night, humid sometime in early July, and a group of about six friends and I, Laura, Andy, Nick, and some of Andy's friends that I didn't know that well but recognized, decided to walk out to this waterfall in the dark. I was the only sober one in the group, so I felt a higher sense of responsibility for everyone and was therefore on edge and hyper aware of our surroundings. Others would walk faster or slower or stop altogether in the group, so it was natural and expected that we wouldn't be able to see everyone at the same time. Andy was in rare form though. When Laura had to stop to pee, he came out of the bushes and scared her and then ran off ahead behind the rest of the group. This annoyed both me and Laura since it was such a clear invasion of privacy and unnecessarily spooked in the already spooky night. Laura and I eventually got into where we could see Andy again, but he was walking by himself and then slipped back into the bushes without even looking at us. Dismissing him as just being high, we kept moving forwards, still not back with the whole group yet and we realize that Andy has followed in behind us, just far enough away that we can only see his silhouette. Finally, we catch up with the rest of the group and see that all of us are accounted for, even Andy. We asked him how he got ahead of us and beat us to the group when he had last been seen 15 yards behind us just a minute ago. Everyone was dead silent and Laura and I realized that whoever scared her when she peed and followed us wasn't Andy or anyone from our group. We never did make it to that waterfall. When I lived in rural Maine, my boyfriend at the time took me on a drive in his truck. He wanted to show me something he said he learned about from one of his college professors. We already kind of lived in the middle of nowhere, but we drove even further into literally nowhere. We were on this road that was five to eight miles of just forest on both sides. No houses, no signs, no driveways, nothing. Then he pulls over near a slight break in the trees. There was a very overgrown old driveway chained off at the road with an old dilapidated sign that said private property. We parked on the road and walked in about a half mile and there was this old abandoned lock cabin house. I didn't know when it was built, but it was old enough to not have any connection to the electric grid and no electrical outlets inside. It was a bit odd, but my boyfriend said he had been there before and led me to a door in the back where we could break in. He mentioned that the last property owner said in their will that no changes could be made to the property after they died, like no agriculture or major renovations. So I guessed that's why the land was never resold, since nobody could do anything with it. I don't remember if we entered through the second floor somehow or climbed upstairs, but I remember being on this loft that overlooked the interior of the house with no railing definitely a 15 plus foot drop right at the edge of the loft. Maybe there weren't stairs inside at all, or a ladder. It was back in the fall of 2011, when I was a freshman in college, so it's all a little bit fuzzy. I remember seeing an old wood stove made of iron downstairs and a countertop, but otherwise I think the place was pretty sparse and made entirely of wood. There was also no sink in the kitchen area, and no bathroom, so no plumbing either. The loft we were on had literally thousands of dead flies all over the floor. It was both gross and creepy. I know they could have just gotten stuck in there over the years, but the sheer volume and number of them on every surface and not being decayed or turned to dust was just unnerving. My boyfriend for some reason decides 
This is a nice place to smoke weed. I didn't want to stay, but he laid a blanket over the flies and he sat and rolled the joint. I did take a few puffs, but started getting an uneasy feeling, so I stopped. I'm a regular smoker, but this was just a crazy situation. Then suddenly I realized that the sun was setting and we were losing light fast. The house very quickly got this terrifying impending doom feeling and I knew I needed to get the hell out of there. I expressed my concerns to my boyfriend multiple times, each time seeming more desperate to leave, but he wasn't worried and took his sweet ass time hand rolling himself a cigarette and taking all the unnecessary stuff out of his pockets, laying them out on the blanket and slowly putting them away. It was pissing me off that he wasn't taking me seriously and I had such a sense of urgency to get out. I ended up getting out of the house and started hauling ass down that half mile long dirt driveway to get out and away. My boyfriend shuffled behind me, fumbling with things in his hand. He was practically a prepper and carried all sorts of things with him in his pockets, cargo pants, backpack, all the time, like flashlights, lighters, weed pipes, rolling paper, weed, rolling tobacco, and probably 20 other things he thought were useful. I got out of the woods when we were just losing that last light before the true darkness set in. Mind you, this country road has no street lights the whole way. He had flashlights, but I didn't feel like the flashlights meant safety. I felt like we were being watched and whatever it was was super negative. I don't know if I overreacted or my boyfriend was literally just doped up and clueless, but I never really trusted him after that. I don't know why the heck I let myself get into that situation. Needless to say, he's not in my life anymore. This took place a few years ago with my best friend. We decided to go camping in Flagstaff, a place called Locket Meadow. We'd taken our dogs, and after a day of hiking and exploration, we played around a fire and eventually went to sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night to find this deep figure outside our tent, burying itself into our tent. It had a weird way of hovering back and forth over my body, and my dog who had curled up awake and was not moving or making a sound at the bottom of my feet. I looked over and seen my best friend passing out and his dog, which I'm sure if it was awake, but clearly I'm the only one between my friend and I'm expecting this terrifying encounter. I eventually cover my head and thought about anything to make me fall asleep. The next day I asked my friend if he had somehow been awake throughout it all. And he said no and thought I was lying. I told him maybe it was a bear, so we looked around our campsite and couldn't find anything, no trails, no prints, nothing. We also had our food out on a table near our tents and a trash bag hung up on a broken branch. So even if it was a bear, I'm surprised it didn't get any of our stuff. Either way, I remember how scared I was seeing this dark weird object observing our tent. Could have been the wind, a deer, a bear, who knows? But this is just one encounter of the whole camping trip. The next night, we decide to camp at Beaver Creek. Mind you, we're in Arizona, if you wish to know. However, before we were settled in, we explored Sedona, and we drove to Oak Creek and parked our car near a trail down to the water. We took our dogs and hiked the creek, after we finished jumping in and swimming and drying off, we were about to head out. And the next thing you know, we see from the corner of our eye, a big rock being thrown near us, making a big splash in the water. We look up and can't see anything. So we run over the stones to get a clear view and see no one. We yell out foul words and hear no one running off or anything. When we got to our next campsite, at Beaver Creek and set up. My friend told me throughout the trip since we started in Flagstaff, he'd had rocks being thrown at him up until that large rock 
at Oak Creek. We looked at each other and thought maybe someone was following and messing with us. We sort of laughed it off and said that it was impossible and that we were going to try and connect the dots. Well, I'm glad nothing else happened. And the next day we packed up and went home with nothing but a memory to be justified. A few years ago, I went to a motel with a few friends. There was a restaurant right in front of the hotel. It was literally in the same parking lot. My friend and I, us both being girls, went to the resto bar around 2 a.m. It was open 24 seven, and some of our guy friends waited for us a bit further in the parking lot. We couldn't see them from the inside though. We get to the resto bar and I feel a creepy vibe right away. There was only one employee, a girl in her mid twenties, and us 18 year old girls and a creepy dude sitting at the bar. The guy looked up at us, up and down with a smirk. The girl was just standing there, stiff as hell. At some point she said, that's it, I'm calling the police. My friend and I looked at each other, confused. The guy got up and got closer to her. He was about to follow her to the back store, but she put her phone up to her ear and he backed off. My friend and I started walking to the door. I wanted to scream to my guy friends to come and help, but we didn't get the chance because the creepy dude ran after us. Long story short, we found ourselves in between the resto doors and the exit doors. The girl still on the phone ran and locked us out of her restaurant. The guy locked the exit door with his body. He started saying stuff like, you girls are so hot, makes me want to do stuff and things like that. After what felt like hours, the police got there and arrested the guy. We got out of there and they asked us a few questions and that was that. We went back to our guy friends who had no clue what happened. My old house was basically a haunted house. Not even talking about weird stuff like opening for no reason, but actual ghosts that lived there. When I was young, about eight, I was asleep and woke up to take a leak. I was on my way to the toilet when there was this weird pulse of light at the corner of my eye. I looked to my left and less than 20 feet away from me was this lady in white sitting under our mango tree. She turned to me and to this day, I swear on my life, she didn't have a face. So I noped the hell out of there and back to bed, still not really understanding what was going on just thought that it was just a weird lady. I ended up waking my brother to ask him what was going on and asked, you see that too, right? To this day, my brother hates the fact that I ended up dragging him into his only ghost encounter in his life. From then on, the event must have triggered something for me because I'm a bit sensitive to that kind of stuff. And I've seen even more stuff in the house that still shakes me to this day. Our school also had an exchange program with Korea. I got along pretty well with the dude and he became one of my best mates for quite a while. So I invited him to hang over to my place and play some video games. And I remember when he entered my room, he kind of paced around for a bit and just stopped. He looked at me and gestured with his hands a bit and said, spirits. I was grateful that someone understood at least partially. And I just kind of gave him a resigned nod and said, yes, yeah, spirits. After knowing and dealing with quite a lot, it was just nice to have a kindred spirit. It was getting late. The sun had been down for quite a while and he was going to stay over the night. We're just chilling when I get this feeling that washed over me. Nothing cold or anything like the stories you read, but a feeling of wrongness, like your gut is telling you this is a bad idea and to get out at like amped up to 10. So when my senses were blaring red alert, I felt my bed shift like someone just sat on it. I froze up and my dog that has basically been so lazy all day that's by my PS1 stands up and starts growling and barking at something behind me and my friend. I didn't look back, neither did my friend. 
My dog finally stopped five minutes later and was still agitated. Needless to say, me and my friend ended up playing Tekken 3 all the way to a morning and literally never looked back. He never came round again. When my son was about six months old, I had a dream that I was at my grandparents' house with him. My grandfather was holding my son and crying while I spoke with my grandmother. I told her that I wished her and my grandfather were still alive to see my son and she said, don't worry, we see him. I didn't think anything else until five years later, I was talking to my sister and I mentioned that I'd had a dream about my grandparents. She said, was Papa Joe, that's what we called our grandfather, holding your son while he rocked in his chair? And did grandma tell you they were watching you? Yes, I said. How did you know that? I had the same dream when my son was six months old. And more recently, my son, he was 20 at the time, was driving home from work late one night. As he drove, he said he very clearly heard my mother, who had been dead for two years, say, Jonathan, stop the car. Out of reflex, he did. And as soon as he stopped, three deer ran out in front of him. Had he not stopped the car, he'd have hit them. I was backpacking through Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina with my dog, just the two of us, and we were exploring the woods around Little Lost Cove, open orienteering style, so we were not on an established trail. We'd been hiking through the day following a creek, and towards the evening I noticed my dog was acting abnormally. She was very much caught in the scent of something and wouldn't ease up. This continued for about two hours before we made camp. That night in camp, she remained on edge and stared off into the wood line. I went about camp business as usual. Then at around midnight, I got this prick like I was being watched intently. I let the feeling ride for a bit and kept tinkering with the fire. Then I heard the brush rustle. I got up from the fire and shone my flashlight in the hillside. A figure on all fours just managed to escape the beam all but the tail. It was a tail I knew that was not supposed to still exist in the Southern Appalachians. I cast my light across the hillside and this time caught its eyes. Two glowing yellow orbs, just watching and waiting. At that point, I went into a fury, grabbed my tomahawk and charged up the hill after the beast, screaming curses all the while. The watcher ran off, but neither I or the dog slept that night. The following morning, we left camp at first light and began hiking up the mountain to the ridge line, which would lead us out. Atop the ridge line in the fresh mud were a series of tracks left by an animal that officially no longer exists in the eastern US. They were catamount tracks. They commonly go by cougars in the east, but we'd been stalked by mountain lions just the same. Those tracks ran across the ridge revealing it had been watching us and stalking us throughout the previous day as we hiked through the creek bed below. They weren't bobcat trails, I know that. They were way too big, as were those eyes I saw. I truly believe that if my dog hadn't been there to give me red flags, I would have been mauled that night. And it remains one of my personal scariest experiences ever. I used to wander the old abandoned mines, cabins, and grounds of Montana, areas people hadn't been in at least three decades. I knew every cabin too. I knew people who'd been there decades prior, when there were still crazy old gold panning loony types who'd never give up the hope to find big. I remember one story my father has with one of those people. My father and his brother were looking into this one area and a shot went over their heads. My father and uncle froze and said they were just hiking. The old man said they were trying to steal, and my father said who his grandma was, who had lived in the mountains since the early 60s. The old man then stopped, said to thank their mother for feeding him when he was starving one winter, but that he wasn't taking visitors that day and to get lost. 
About a decade ago, my father and I found the dilapidated cabin that the man was in by chance, wandering randomly through the woods. It was really hard to find, and we had just barely come across it. Everything the old man had was still there. The roof was partially caved in, pots and pans were still on the stove, like he had passed in there or nearby. There was no body though, just everything was there, covered in decades of normal decay, frozen in time, tools and all. It was a museum, a hundred years in the past, but only my father and I knew how to visit it. The old man must have passed at least 30 years ago, since he was so old when my father saw him. That cabin was bulldozed to build millionaire cabins eight or so years ago, along with dozens of other secret museums of the gold rush past. I used to know every secret path of that woods for miles in every direction, to every secret cabin, game trail, and serene, natural rest stop. It is all now an empty cul-de-sac with no cabins, because the money stream ran dry. I think that is the scariest and saddest part, frankly. I consider myself open-minded, and I'm extremely skeptical and rational. I grew up in a hippie household, and my parents always tried to convince me of some alleged New Age shocking truth. But since my teens, I, with respect and determination, decided to embrace a more scientific mindset. I really like literature and gothic, dark stories, though. And whenever the ghost topic comes up, I'm always happy to share the following. In the summer of 2006, I was 16, and, as every year, was spending the holidays in camping in southern Italy. A huge piece of Hector Ridge and hectares of pine trees and Mediterranean scrub with a nice sandy beach nearby. I was having a good time doing the things teenagers always do in such places. Swimming, cycling, kissing boys next to the bonfire and just hanging out. One night I was returning to my place, prepared to silently sneak into my tent when I decided to stop by the bathroom before bed. It was four o'clock. I remember the hour exactly, as that's the time that the public lights were turned down. Street lights just went off when I arrived to the bathroom. It was a big building on the side adjacent to the street and the men's shower and bathroom was on the opposite side to the ladies. Approaching the building, I noticed a blonde girl outside the men's showers, turning her back to me. The sight was a tad unusual. I thought she could have just been waiting for her father or brother to come out the restroom. I had had to come close to her as I needed to turn the corner to reach the ladies. I kept feeling like something was off, and just as I was turning the corner, I looked back at her, unsure if asking her if she needed something. In a split second, I saw her face changing. From the moment I noticed this girl, to maybe a minute later, the change had happened considerably. I saw her jawbone protrude in an unnatural manner, giving her a beastly appearance. It's hard to explain what I saw, as it was just a glimpse of a few seconds. I felt like a bucket of cold ice had been poured over me, and I went ahead too scared to look behind my back. I kept walking on the side of the building and soon reached the other corner and the ladies bathroom. I was terrified. Now not a chance I was going to actually enter and lock myself inside a bathroom with God knows what. This side of the building was next to another street that allowed me to return to my place for a longer path. I reached my tent and waited for the sunrise, trying to calm down. To this day, this is the experience that comes to mind when people talk about the paranormal. I believe it is absolutely possible that I just imagined the whole thing with the complicity of darkness and me being tired. But it was just such a strange sense and really gave me chills. The second experience happened years before this one. It's not as striking. In any case, I was about 13 and going back after school. I grew up in a very rural area of Tuscany, and my house is three kilometers from the nearest village, where the school bus stopped. 
My mother was a few minutes late to catching me, but I didn't mind as it was a beautiful spring day and I was expecting her to arrive soon. I walked away from the main road towards my house direction, looking at the fields on the other side and towards the hill where my mother's car should have descended, when I felt something wasn't okay. A mild sensation actually, just as something was out of place. I noticed movement from the corner of my eye as I turned and realized there was a tall blonde dog with his front paws on my backpack. I screamed more because of the surprise other than the dog, and he quickly walked away with his tail and ears low, as dogs usually do when people yell at them. I didn't think much of this, and it's not strange to meet a dog without an owner. I carried on walking, and after a short time felt again that weird sensation and immediately turned my head. I saw the dog sitting on top of my backpack. I yelled and was scared and threw the backpack on the floor. I don't remember what happened next. I guess my mother arrived shortly after and I went ahead with her for the day. It sounds absolutely so weird. I was just in Cuba with my family and we took a tour of the city. There were people asking for things which was completely fine, but there was one man who was quite clearly drunk off his arse, swinging and carrying around a beer. He was being very aggressive and standing right up close to us, poking us for things. It escalated to the point he started grabbing at my sister's baby when he was feeding him. So I got in the way and stopped him. There was an extremely kind Cuban lady who stayed with us and told the guy off extremely kind, considering our tour guide was nowhere in sight. The man proceeded to yell at her and then began ripping wiring out of a garden and was trying to hotwire two 220 volt wires, which was our cue to get the hell away from him. I'm extremely grateful for that lady and watching over my family and making sure that he stayed away. He even got pictures with her and made sure to give her a large sum of pesos as a thanks. I've only had sleep paralysis once in my life, and it was terrifying. I had woken from a deep sleep and was completely aware of everything. I could feel the blanket laying on me and the exact position I was laying in. What scared me was the presence I felt hanging over me at the foot of my bed. It was heavy and dark. I was panicking and trying my hardest to move. I kept thinking, I need to move, over and over, and I passed out. I didn't immediately remember what happened in the morning. The memory came back later that day, and I discussed it with some of my work friends, and their opinions ranged from normal to paranormal. I was little on the fence to which it was, but I was scared to sleep for a while. A few weeks later, I was drifting off to sleep when I felt the presence again. This time it was beside my bed. I was facing away from it and went stiff, hoping it would go away. It took me a few minutes to get the courage to flip around. When I did, I caught a very clear view of it before it vanished. It was a dark shape that almost resembled a human, but wasn't solid enough in shape. I didn't sleep well the rest of the night. I told my best friend about it. That's when I learnt what it was. Shades feed off your energy. They're drawn to negative emotions like stress and anxiety, which mine were very high at the time. She's a witch and brought me a bottle that contained Himalayan sea salt, rose petal and a few other things. I only saw it once after that. I was trying to sleep but still very awake. I opened my eyes and saw it, as clear as the other time before it vanished again. I hadn't felt its presence and I believe it was my friend's concoction that kept it away. It's been about a year since that happened and I think it actually got rid of it. Red River Gorge is a beautiful and huge park filled with wildlife, rock climbing, waterfalls, dense forest, gorges and beautiful views. This is a place that feels truly isolated, disconnected from the rest of the world. One evening in the fall, my boyfriend Duncan and I decided to go camping at the gorge. We found a campground that was as backwards as possible. Sites were spread far from each other, 
and our site was on the edge of a very steep drop-off. We arrived at sunset, and quickly got to setting up camp. By the time we were fully set up, the sun had set, and we began to make a fire. About 20 minutes into relaxing by the fire, we began to hear howling that didn't sound too far away. We were both freaked out by the realization there were wolves nearby, but we tried not to overreact and continued to sit by our fire. 10 minutes later, I started to hear a faint yelling about 15 feet away past the cliff edges. I told Duncan to be quiet and listen, and we both froze out of fear. A woman was screaming now. I couldn't make out any words at that point, but it was a deep, guttural shriek, a noise that I had never heard a person make in real life. Then I heard it. She was screaming, someone help me please, oh my god, and repeating this over and over, howling it at the top of her lungs. I was terrified. She could have been turned around in the dark and fallen off a cliff or attacked by an animal. At this point, we both sprinted to my car, frantically climbed inside and locked the doors. I tried to call for police, but there was no service. I threw the car in reverse and sped down the dirt road to find anyone that could help, and the shrieks continued. I didn't make it far before coming across a group of three young men standing on the edge of the forest. I slowed down and cracked my window, still hearing the woman begging for help, and asked if they could hear that. How could they not? I told them I heard a woman crying for help in the forest, and two of them went sprinting into the darkness without questioning me any further. The other one just stood by my car, with no idea of what was happening. While the two men were somewhere in the forest, I drove further down into the dirt road until I found a spot to turn around. When I came back, the screaming had stopped, and the men were back by the side of the road. I slowed down and asked them where the woman was, and one of the men that had run into the woods answered, don't worry, it's funny actually. It was just a little kid at a campsite further down the trail. He was having a nightmare. I just said okay and drove away as quickly as possible. We left the campsite and went straight home. Once out the woods, we called the local police station multiple times with no answer. I know it wasn't a child. I've never heard such a primal fearful scream in my life. It makes my skin crawl and my heart race just thinking about it. What did those men get away with that night? And what was I a witness to? I searched the local news for weeks, searching for something reporting details and what it could have been, and came across nothing. I also think it's important to note that this happened in early November of last year, after the camping season was mostly over. We saw very few people there during our time, and I think it is assumed by most people that there won't be many people around this time of year. So for my birthday this year, my adoring boyfriend decides to rent us a little A-line cabin in the woods of the White Mountains. Originally, we had plans to stay Friday and Saturday night, but only ended up staying Friday, for reasons I will explain later. We get there Friday around 2 o'clock. We bring our things in and both of us get a weird vibe from the jump, but neither of us say anything to one another because we really wanted to have a good time. First things first, and my boyfriend starts to make a fire for the fireplace. He does so by taking a large knife and shaving pieces of wood off the logs for the kindling. The tip of the knife breaks and he says to me, this will be much harder to stab you with later tonight. I look at him like, what the hell is he saying to me? And why would he ever say that? We sit by the fire until the evening, barely saying anything to each other. The TV is right in front of a giant window with no curtains. We end the night by watching a movie in front of said scary window. We go upstairs to sleep and my boyfriend barricades us in our room. I ask him why, and he says he has a bad feeling. I wake up in the middle of the night because I have to pee, but I'm too afraid to go alone. So I wake my boyfriend up and he accompanies me to the restaurant. I text my best friend before I fall asleep, saying that I don't feel right in the house. We wake up, 
and I thanked my boyfriend for coming with me to the restroom when I was scared last night. And he informs me he took me to the bathroom after we did it. I assure him we never did, and he swears we did. Anyway, moving on, we wake up and drive through the White Mountains. We get home around one, and he says he's tired and goes upstairs to take a nap. During this time, he's taking a nap. I have zero recollection of what I did during this time. He wakes up from the nap, and we both decide that we need to leave and something's not right. We pack all our stuff in five minutes and dipped quickly after. I've always had vivid dreams, but these few I remember when I was a kid are more weird. I was six to eight when these started. I do have very vivid dreams, but none of these have ever felt the same. As I was young, I don't remember all the details, but the jest is that I would dream about a woman in a white dress in her mid twenties, I'd say. She was younger and had smooth arms. I could never see her face, but there was a man with her every time. He had blonde brown hair, a full beard, and I could see his face. He was dressed in white too, pretty much normal humans. And we would be in the woods sometimes behind my house. After the first dream, I started having weird things happen in my sleep. Like one time I woke up, well, I thought I was, but I couldn't move. But I knew I was being moved and somehow I was under my bed, which wasn't that high off the ground and had containers in front of me that had to move in order to get under my bed. Something was moving me and I had no control. The dreams would continue for a year or more. I was still very young, but the last one happened. I remember being in the woods and the woman and the man were there and they were standing on the deck of a ship about to walk aboard and there were lights very bright I think other people were on that ship. And I felt a presence, but don't remember seeing anything this time. My whole family was there and the neighbors, which we were related to, meeting, and they were telling us thanks and goodbye. I have no idea why they seemed very grateful and never dreamed of them again. I'm just really curious if anyone has had these types of dreams or even seen these two in their sleep. I've always been curious, but never found an answer. This happened around August of this year. I'm not sure what we experienced, but whatever it was, it terrified us. So this was a hike up to Half Dome. We had a campground around 20 minutes drive away from the trailhead, and the group was composed of 18 year old me, my uncle, 32 year old male, and my uncle's friend D. There were two girls with us, but they aren't relevant to the story. My uncle and his friend are both Christians, so there were no substances consumed that could be used to induce feelings. We get to our campsite, set up the camp and go to sleep after eating. We were planning to wake up at four to start our hike by 4.30. I randomly awoke at 3.30, like completely widely awake and looked out my hammock. And I remember feeling this odd feeling as if I were woken up by something. And remember looking out at this moonlit scene and thinking to myself, it's just like a dream. I lay back in the hammock, but couldn't go to sleep and ended up waking up my uncle and friend around 3.50. My uncle asks, why are you walking around at night? And I say, I'm not doing that. He says, he woke me up for some reason and could hear someone walking around, not like an animal, but a person. I say that it's quite weird and try and brush it off. We get to the trailhead around 4.30 and it's as everyone is unloading from their car that D says he needs to use the restroom, which there are a couple of before the trailhead. I walked behind him and saw the car falling behind me and waiting for my uncle who had forgotten something in his own car. The short straight road from the little parking lot runs directly into a T section with the road of the trailhead 
and the bathroom which runs directly across from the intersection throughout the little field. Do you have been there? Know what I'm talking about. We get to the intersection and wait for Dee to escape the bathroom. We wait 10 minutes before going in to check and he's not there. I go back to my uncle and tell him, that's weird. Maybe he went back to the car to get something he's missed. By 5.10, we're starting to worry. My uncle goes to check the car while I wait at the intersection to make sure we didn't miss him. And he went down the road from the trailhead. My uncle says he isn't there either. We decided maybe he went up to the trailhead without us for some reason and walked up 10 minutes and he wasn't there either. We're kind of baffled now because there are no other logical explanations for where he could have gone and waited at the intersection for over half an hour and checked at the car, bathroom and trailhead. And you weren't there, he says. I went to the bathroom. He then asks me where my uncle is and I say it was at the trailhead and he asks me again. Note that it's weird as he's asked me twice and as we're crossing the bridge to the trailhead, he sees a lights off in the riverbank and exclaims that yes, that must be him. And I just look at him and keep walking. I thought his behavior was very strange, like he wasn't thinking straight. We finally get to the hike and it goes by as normal, except that we seem to be keep losing things such as my uncle's small red flashlight, one of the girl's gloves, a water bottle, etc. And it was just like we'd simply forgotten about them and couldn't remember where we'd left them. On the way back, it got dark and we turned on our flashlights. And as we neared the end of the hike, after the two waterfalls, it began to seem as if we'd been walking for too long. My uncle also confirms this, asking me, doesn't it seem like it's taking way longer to get back? I say, yeah. And I was just thinking that we kept walking, but it still seems we aren't making any progress. I've been on that trail many times, and as I was walking, I couldn't help but spot how weird those events felt. After we got home, my aunt asks my uncle if we were camping and he says, how'd you know? As we didn't tell them that we were going since it was a very last minute decision. She says that he had an odd dream where she sees my uncle in a tent of a forest and someone is outside of his tent. She said she couldn't see who it was, but knew there was a presence there. She said she woke up around three and had the strong urge to pray for him, and it worked. I don't know what you make of all of this, but I really would like your opinions. Get off me. I woke up saying those exact words after a few seconds, and I instantly remembered why I'd said that. I was having sleep paralysis. There was a woman in the corner of my room and she was simply standing there. I tried to move, to turn on my light, but she was weighing me down. I struggled until I finally saw her move. She started walking towards me and I tried calling out my sister's name. I felt like I was suffocating and just wanted it all to stop. The woman was one step away and I could finally see her. Her face, or lack of. No eyes, no nose, no mouth, just long hair and sharp nails. She's climbing on top of me and began tearing away my skin. I tried screaming for help. I tried moving to push her off me, but nothing worked. But the weird thing is she started molesting me. She put her hands inside me and I couldn't take it anymore and I wanted it all to stop. I slowly started regaining a little bit of movement as well as my ability to speak. Although I'm sure it didn't take me too long to wake up, it felt like centuries. As soon as I woke up, I looked to my right, which was where my window was, and there she was. She stood outside of my window until she suddenly vanished. This happened in 2017, and the next time I saw her was in 2018, except I moved to a different house. This was a few years ago. I was 11. Me and my other four friends went on a camping trip. Everyone was happy to be doing something different, but I wasn't. You see, when I was younger, I loved horror movies and videos, so I felt off. I then eased into them a bit. 
and realized that if anyone tried to rob us, or worse, me and our friends, we could fight them or something. While my friend's mum, Tom's mum, had booked us a small hut to stay in during the week, but at night we would sleep in our tents. It was 8pm when we left the hut, which was to the right of our campsite, and Tom's mum was a bit paranoid, so we did the typical songs and ate marshmallows, and at 9.30, we were told it was time to sleep. I got a tent with Trent, who was a good friend of mine, and started saying funny things that made me laugh. Outside was completely silent, and the only sound heard was Trent's laugh. I really wanted to go for a pee, but had watched enough horror movies that I held it in. I guess eventually I didn't want to go anymore. I turned my head around to see Trent with his eyes wide open. Dude, aren't you going to sleep or something? It's like 11. That was the first time I felt off. Can't you hear the crunch of leaves? I stood there shaking. I didn't know what to do, pretend to be asleep and take my chances. I decided to take that option. And I told Trent, we'll charge them. I'll go first, you wake up the others. I got up and quickly unzipped the tent lid. Ran out my tent screaming, tent behind me to find no one. Tom's mum, who slept in the hut, came out running, and she asked what the hell we were doing, and me and Trent told her what we'd heard. She said that was off because she heard footsteps in her room and hadn't slept for the last two hours. We heard a loud cry from a little girl like you hear in the movies. Everyone spun their head around and we heard whispers from every location. We turned to the two cars and ran towards them. Cody's mum had also volunteered for the whole trip as she came running out the hut. Before we explained, Tom's mum grabbed her and shoved her in one of the cars and told us to get in. But Ryan noticed one of the wheels had a puncture. It looked burnt and it was as if it had scratches. We hurried to Cody's mum's car and the other was fine and we climbed in and hurried off. The mums reported this to the police, and all that they had to say is that it's very common in this area. Anyone with any advice, it would be greatly appreciated. My grandmother had passed away about a week prior, and I was sleeping in bed when I suddenly woke up. My grandma was standing at the door, I know it couldn't be because she was obviously deceased. I didn't move, and she slowly began to glide towards me. She reached down, touched my feet, and said, Everything's gonna be okay, mijo. It was strangely calm, and she just glided back. Knowing this was impossible, I assumed that it was a dream. So, in an attempt to check reality, I reached over and unplugged my alarm clock, plugged it back in, and went back to sleep. The next morning, my mum woke me up, and when I checked the time, it was flashing 3.17. It was actually 7.30. I was strangely okay with the anomaly, and accepted the fact that my dead grandma stopped in to say, What's up? I was walking along the sidewalk one day, and a guy with a windowless van pulls up beside me, and said he could give me a bottle of water if I got into his van as this was summer and a rather hot day. I declined and continued walking, and the guy started shouting and screaming and beating his steering wheel, yelling over and over again, It's free! How can you say no to free? I got to where I was going, which was only a few blocks further, and was a gas station, and had a lovely drink there while talking to the cashier, who was a friend, and reported having the exact same situation happen to her. By chance, I was still there, late that evening, when the shift changed and the incoming cashier reported strange windowless vans idling in the back corner of the lot out of the light. Call the police, was what I felt like saying, but as it happened, a rather sizable dude was in the area. He overheard us swapping stories and announced he was going to take care of it. I don't know what happened, none of us three ever saw the van again or the big guy, for that matter. I once woke up at night, and there was this figure standing next to my bed. 
It looked like a small boy, maybe five years old, wearing one of those old-timey sailor suits that children used to get dressed up in in the late 19th to early 20th century. The boy was semi-transparent and asked for help. If you think it sounded creepy so far, it got worse. I suddenly saw myself from another angle, with my eyes open, staring at the boy ghost, and my body rose up, and I said in a deep, unnatural voice, your soul is mine. And my mouth opened, wider than a human mouth should, more like a snake's mouth, and I swallowed the ghost. Then I woke up, thinking, wow, that was a rather creepy dream. Strangely enough, my stomach felt full, just as if I had eaten a good meal mere minutes before. It was 5am though, and I probably hadn't eaten since 1am, like my post-midnight snack. That was a few years ago. Never experienced anything like it again. I do have to say I rarely have traditional nightmares. Was something chasing me? Usually I'm the ones chasing something. This happened about three to four years ago. I live in Utah and have been camping my whole life. When I was roughly 12, I was in the Boy Scouts and went on a lot of camping trips with my troop. Every year, my troop went on an overnight camping trip to a lake in the Uinta Mountains called Wall Lake, where we'd backpack in a mile or so and camp around said lake. When I was old enough to join Boy Scouts, my troop had already been the year before but one of the boys claimed to have seen a naked man running around the woods. No one really took him seriously, but it became a running joke that we would see this so-called naked man when we went to Wall Lake. The first year, it was pretty unremarkable until our hike back. When we were hiking back to our cars, we spotted the naked man about a hundred feet away in the woods. After that, none of us doubted the kid who reported seeing him the year before. The next year I was 13, we went again. And of course we were all joking about the naked man. Again, nothing out of the ordinary happened until we were packing down our camps to get ready to go home. While we were taking down our tents, one of the boys yells, hey look, it's the naked man. He was pointing at the top of a nearby cliff. And sure enough, there he was, completely naked, except for a cloth wrapped around his face like a turban and a satchel over his shoulder. We all just stood there for a while and a few of the older boys were yelling questions and the like. He stayed quiet for the whole thing, but eventually he pointed at us, put his hand to his hips and pushed down in a pull your pants down motion. At this point, we were thoroughly creeped out and he vanished from the cliff top. We all packed down faster than we've ever packed down a camp before and sped back to our cars. I've still gone on trips to Wall Lake since, but I haven't seen any signs of the guy. He was apparently seen by enough people that he was reported in the news. At the time of these events, I wasn't too scared, but looking back, I have no idea what this guy wanted or what he could have done. And that is what scares me about this whole thing. Several months ago, my wife and I went to bed as we normally do. I have untreated sleep apnea, which means that I never really get a good night's sleep and I'm always tired. I can lie down and be asleep in the middle of a sentence. As I was in that extremely short period of not awake but not really asleep, I could feel myself sinking deeper into sleep. As I approached true sleep, I had a brief impression of being in another location, with a nurse nearby saying, Doctor, he's starting to wake up. I knew somehow that I had been in a coma and that I was starting to get out of it. Then I started flipping back into the coma there while waking up here and hearing the nurse say, 
Never mind, false alarm, he's still in a coma. It was just like an old fashioned balance scale, as on one side it rose and the other fell. It happened again a second time, but I'm not sure if it was that night or the next. I had a bad disassociative episode recently and the memory of this fed into it. After all, if everything here is a coma dream, I may have loved ones there waiting for me to wake up.